and in 1959 after Chinese People's Liberation Army troops invaded Lhasa. Since then, the Dalai Lama, one of the best known faces in the world, has made India his home, preaching ahimsa and oneness of humanity, making Buddhist philosophy popular across the globe. Despite his advancing age, the Dalai Lama retains an impish sense of humor and a realistic approach to Tibet's struggle for identity. In this interview with Strat News Global, he talks about the importance of the Nalanda philosophy of Buddhism being India's longest serving guest and approach to Tibet's struggle for identity. Thank you very much for your time, His Holiness. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor and uh, always uh, good to come and uh, listen to you and your wisdom. You have spread uh, compassion and uh, oneness of the world for so long. Uh, do you think uh, the world needs more of it uh, from oh, more certainly. different people? Certainly. You are born. You see, children. Uh, you see, never ask what is your faith, what is your nationality. Children, as a human brothers, sisters, play together. So, uh, that is the beginning of our life. Then, I think the uh, problem is existing education. Uh, it's a too much emphasis on differences, nationality, religious faith. And in this country, different caste, like that. So that is the source of problem. Now today, entire human being, actually we are same human being, part of human community, mm -hmm. or seven billion human beings are one human community. True. Uh, we have to live side by side. The different faith, different nationality is secondary. So therefore, now in education. He was forced to flee his homeland in 1959 after Chinese People's Liberation Army troops invaded Lhasa. Since then, the Dalai Lama, one of the best known faces in the world, has made India his home, preaching ahimsa and oneness of humanity, making Buddhist philosophy popular across the globe. Despite his advancing age, the Dalai Lama retains an impish sense of humor and a realistic approach to Tibet's struggle for identity. In this interview with Strat News Global, he talks about the importance of the Nalanda philosophy of Buddhism being India's longest serving guest and approach to Tibet's struggle for identity. Thank you very much for your time, His Holiness. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor and uh, always uh, good to come and uh, listen to you and your wisdom. You have spread uh, compassion and uh, oneness of the world for so long. Uh, do you think uh, the world needs more of it uh, from oh, more certainly. different people? Certainly. When you're born, you see children, uh, you see, never ask what is your faith, what is your nationality. Children, as a human brothers, sisters, play together. So, uh, that is the beginning of our life. Then I think the uh, problem is existing education. Uh, it's a too much emphasis on differences, nationality, religious faith. And in this country, different caste, like that. So that is the source of problem. Now today, 
entire human being. So actually, we are same human being, part of human community, mm-hmm. or seven billion human being, are one human community. True. Uh, we have to live side by side. The different faith, different nationality is secondary. So therefore, now in education, we should pay more attention about you see, basic human value, mm. or India's tradition, ahimsa and karuna. When we talk about karuna, not only human being, but also animals, ahimsa, don't harm. And a more compassionate attitude towards uh, animal. And then also now today, India's uh, ahimsa also include uh, respect uh, environment. Right. Not destroy. Uh-huh. So India's over 3,000 years old ahimsa and karuna. That is uh, individual level in order to be happy, calm human being, this message very important, very relevant. True. And then global level, in order to bring happy humanity uh, and peaceful world, these things are very relevant. Exactly. And you have done Now, this for too much than... sort of was the emphasis differences. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, when we were born, seven billion human beings, same way born, at the same way die. So between there, we too much emphasis on uh, different differences, and then create strong concept of we and they, and the fight, kill. Right. But you have spread compassion for so long now, six decades, 61 years in India. Mm. And uh, do you think this institution of Dalai Lama uh, needs to be uh, perpetuated, needs to continue in the uh, coming decades also? I think uh, 69, I already sort of expressed whether this institution of Dalai Lama should continue or not up to Tibetan people. Right. And now I can say, Tibetan and Himalayan people, Mm -hmm. and Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Uh, The institution, uh, at one period, it developed, at one period, will go. Not important. Mm -hmm. Important is knowledge. Uh, Now here, in our case, the knowledge of Buddhism in general and particularly Nalanda tradition, mm-hmm. Sanskrit tradition, or oh, that is very scientific. And I always is telling people, you know, we can make distinction, uh, certain sort of as a prayer to Buddha. That is a religious side. Right? Then in Nalanda tradition, a lot of explanation about the human psychology, human mind, and and philosophy, like quantum physics, very clear in Sanskrit tradition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then logic. Uh, so analyze, everything analyze, not just the faith. Right. And easily ex- accept no. Uh, Buddha himself is telling us, you should not accept my teaching out of faith, out of devotion, but rather thorough investigation right. and experiment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's very scientific. Exactly. So now the knowledge, Buddha Dharma, uh, we can continue. So that is important. The institution, including Dharma institution, uh, uh, that's related with individual, not important. Mm-hmm. I do not think uh, uh, very, very important about Buddha Dharma. No. In case 15 Dalai Lama come, <laughs> you see, a very naughty person, <laughs> then they, you say, no, no use. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I think last, the 13 Dalai Lama, some are quite naughty. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For example, 6th Dalai Lama, very naughty. Very naughty. <laughs> Correct. 
but you yourself have a streak of uh, you know happiness and you are you are always smiling you know that's the thing that people are looking forward to but so when people say that there could be a reincarnation and how does reincarnation work uh, do you think that uh, the reincarnation should be in uh, with the chinese people or uh, do you think the reincarnation will happen automatically according to your teachings like uh, first dalai lama mm-hmm. uh, when he become old mm-hmm. is some of then he occasionally express now i'm too old then some of his uh, disciple great scholars mm-hmm. you see they express to him now you already certain sort of clear indication you go to heaven hmm? uh kasa hindi kya sukhabadi sukhabadi sukh oh okay hmm? mm-hmm. then he answered mm. i have no desire to born sukhabadi okay my desire is mm. born uh, area where more suffering there mm-hmm. and i can use something to serve the concerned people that is his wish so my also my own case i'm buddhist monk mm-hmm. buddhist practitioner I never contend. I have the name of Dalai Lama. I never contended. I consider I am a simple Buddhist monk, mm-hmm. and a daily basis practice. So my sort of determination, my prayer, as so one Shanta Deva sort of prayer mentioned, so long space remain, so long sentient being remain. I will remain in order to serve. Right. That's a source of determination. Mm. I practice that. so i i i have not much so therefore uh, my is quite 100% sure my next life where oh uh, uh my because of the what is it i can i can be some useful to the concerned sort of community mm-hmm. so that's my wish right i i don't want, uh, i don't care this uh, institution institution some For example, firstly, Buddhist institution, not their Buddhist institution. <laughs> All those Nalanda masters, right. no one have institution. Right. So institution, some connection with the political matter. Ah. Uh, so since two thousand one, correct? Two thousand one. I totally retired. Right. From political responsibility. Yes. And I also say. uh made clear i decided in future in case dalai lama come the dalai lama no political power now political uh now modern time we must have democratically uh, elected political leadership right so i already sort of retired and we already achieved at least among refugee community we have elected political leadership so in the future also that way if chinese allowed chinese don't will not allow <laughs> <laughs> their own sort of leader mm. not through free election <laughs> mm. 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 i think as far as sort of democratic practice is concerned mm. we handful tibetan we more advanced right. freely elected leader political mm. leadership yes in china totalitarian system mm. Mm. like that so therefore i am not much concerned about the institution mm-hmm. of dalai lama but when the chinese say that we will choose the next dalai lama what is your reaction to that that is you say uh, look now pension lama uh, i recognize one uh, one boy mm-hmm. through traditional way investigation right and then chinese official he said recognize uh, another so pension lama pension lama mm-hmm. now for officially there is pension lama mm. but the chinese among chinese uh, among chinese also they usually describe a false pension lama cha pension lama kar false false false, false. 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 A fake, fake, fake pension. Fake pension. Mm-hmm. Among Chinese themselves, mm. <laughs> and Tibet, among Tibetan, you see, uh, not much sort of faith. 
That's right. So if uh, in case that Dalam institution you see suppose remain and the next 15 Dalai Lama you see uh, decide by Chinese then Tibetan I think I do not believe that. Exactly. They'll not accept uh, uh, yes. the Chinese huh? uh, choice. But uh, coming to uh, the Chinese uh, dealings with you and the way they describe you sometimes they describe you as a separatist or splitist and you've been hearing this for a long time. But do you think there is any chance, uh, do you earn, first of all, do you desire to ever go back to Potala Palace or to Lhasa? Since 79, you see, we develop direct contact with Chinese government. Uh, uh, that also, you see, Pandit Nehru advised me, uh, America will not fight with China, uh, with Chinese in order to liberate Tibet. Mm. Oh, he told me. He told you? Hmm? Yes. Okay. Say, sooner or later, you have to deal with China, Chinese directly. Right. Very practical. Mm. So then, in early uh, 50s, I know, uh, early 60s, right. you see, we raised Tibetan issue at the UN. Mm -hmm. Few years, uh, Pandit Nehru said, that's uh, not much useful. Hmm? Mm. Mm. Then, 74, we decided not to raise Tibetan issue at the UN. Mm -hmm. We tried to uh, direct contact with Chinese government uh, in case you see, some uh, possibility happen. Right. So, seven, 74, we decided not seeking separation, mm -hmm. independence. Uh, so we usually call middle way, right? Or not, not accept the existing sort of uh, or say the political situation. Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, then another one, complete independence. Mm -hmm. Between there, meaningful autonomy. Right. And that also not only is, uh, about two million Tibetan in autonomous region. But those area, Chinese constitution recognized as a Tibetan area. Yes. Uh, all together, all together, then population around six to seven million. Chinese constitution, you see, provided all these uh, small Tibetan area, considered as a Tibetan area. So, autonomous region, mm -hmm. autonomous district, autonomous prefecture, so on. County. Oh, yeah. County like that. That's right. Yes. So we should have, since the constitution recognized as a Tibetan, uh, Tibetan group, so we should have same right to preserve our own culture, uh, including our own language. And then most important is Tibetan knowledge. Originally come from Nalanda. So now, uh, very, I think, marvelous sort of knowledge mm. in Nalanda, uh, like psychology, uh, philosophy, like quantum physics. You see, the Nalanda institution, not just Buddhist sort of institution, but truly uh, learning center. Mm. And Buddhist, uh, then, you see, logic, all these uh, academic subjects. Right. These days, I made sort of distinction, between religion and, uh, and academic. Subject. Yes. Oh, uh, correct. The certain sort of what's the uh, Buddhist practice? That is for Buddhist. Mm. But the psychology uh, and then physics, then uh, praman, also the logic. These are academic subjects. Right. So now. So this really marvelous sort of uh, knowledge, which developed in Nalanda institution, that this uh, knowledge, eighth century mm. uh, Tibetan emperor right. invited uh, the eighth century at that time the top master of Nalanda, his name Shantarakshita, or oh, he invited to Tibet. In spite 
you see seventh century Tibetan king marry with Chinese princess. Very close link. Right. Sometimes I sort of uh, little joke. You <laughs> see, the seventh century Tibetan, Tibetan emperor mm -hmm. uh, certainly he loves Chinese princess <laughs> and and Chinese food. Mm. But Chinese letter mm. he found too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, he decided to right. uh, copy from Devanagari. Oh, I see. India's. Okay. And uh, alphabet. The script, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes. So, 7th century, mm. the Tibetan king, mm -hmm. you see, developed Tibetan uh, Karsadimini. Uh, script. 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 Mm. And then, 8th century, uh, Tibetan emperor, he himself, I think, son of one Chinese princess, I think, but uh, and very close link with Chinese. But he determined, as far as Buddhism is concerned, not through Chinese language, but directly from Nalanda. So he advised the Nalanda master Shandarakshita. So when he reached Tibet, he advised. Tibetan king, since you have your own uh, script writing, uh, so therefore, now instead of study Sanskrit, Pali, you should translate. Into Tibetan. To Tibetan. Mm. So how do you deal with the Chinese directly, except uh, uh, despite dealing with them directly, they have not really uh, you know, looked at... No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Mm. So then, uh, then the translation started. So... Eventually, 300 volumes translation, mainly Sanskrit and Pali and some Nepalese, like that. So we always kept 300 volumes. Then these are the sources of the, our Buddhist knowledge. So now, now China. Mm -hmm. uh, Since some publication, which I mean, also the, for example, the Buddhist science and the modern science, mm -hmm. uh, we already sort of translated in Chinese language and some other more uh, foreign language and the Hindi translation also there. So uh, these publication, public Chinese China public level control everything. But some university, they have the sort of opportunity to receive such books. So then some Chinese professor, you see, mentioned, expressed that Tibetan Buddhism is true Nalanda tradition. I see. And that a Nalanda tradition, very scientific religion, right. they say. Mm. So now China, mm -hmm. uh, Buddhist population, Few few years ago, I think three years ago, one Chinese university in Peking mm -hmm. survey how many Buddhists. Then they say uh, over three hundred millions. Very big number. Oh. Mm. Now since then, mm. is a year by year uh, rapidly increase Buddhist population. Right. Now today in China, Buddhist population around I think uh, six hundred millions. No. Very big number. Mm, big, big number. number. Yes. I think China, communist, mm. uh, actually, because of tradition, mm -hmm. China, Buddhist country, right? The, the Buddhism, uh, or should they, uh, brought to China by one Chinese uh, scholar. He came to India and joined Nalanda and study. And he, some, some, some historians say, he even met the top so to say, the student, mm -hmm. uh, scholar student uh, of Nagarjuna, Nagabuti, mm -hmm. his top sort of disciple, right. great scholar. Mm -hmm. So Chinese monk Tangsen, he came to, when he came to uh, uh, Nalanda, mm -hmm. that Top great scholar, very old, still there. So he met and he received some teaching. Mm -hmm. So 
Tibetan Buddhism, as I mentioned earlier, 8th century, hmm? Nalanda Master introduced. The Chinese Buddhists also, you see, Tang Sen, who studied Nalanda. So, same source. So, now today, uh, many Chinese now follow Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And whenever sort of opportunity come, Chinese from mainland China come to see me. Come to see you, yeah. Uh, they do, yeah. So, so therefore, uh, uh, now regarding now political matter, now among the top leader Chinese, they already develop some kind of awareness. Uh, they are past over 60, 70 years, their policy regarding Tibet is unrealistic. Okay. Uh, now, now they thinking seriously, mm -hmm. try to follow more realistic approach okay. about Tibetan okay. a court case. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, uh, now since last few years, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, seven, uh, seventeen seven, nine you oh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. So since then, now continuously, uh, for official or formal sort of delegation went there. Now that ceased, but individual Chinese, some officials also come here, right? Meet me. Mm -hmm. uh, that continuously. I see. So they very much sort of, uh, or say they eager my return. I always telling them. Uh, Visit China. Yes, I'm very much sort of willing and meet those Chinese Buddhists, I mean, Buddhist, and also some scholars. Mm -hmm. But return uh, too early to, to decide. Okay. I love India's freedom. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, now over 60 years, I enjoy India's freedom. Right. As a result, you see, meeting with different people, uh, uh, and now today, one, one Chinese also, you see, uh, told me one my old friend, mm -hmm. one Chinese, right? Mm, uh, visit China, mm. very important, mm -hmm. but the, the resident, permanent so residence yeah. must be India. Oh, okay. That's and then, then also, you see, that person, you see, expressed to me the Dalai Lama's big name, mm. you see, created by Westerner, mm -hmm. so I must go to Western countries. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. I believe you used to know uh, uh, Xi Jinping's father in the 1950s. Uh, how, how was it? I mean, why, how did you know him? Oh, he, I think the, she thought, what is the position? Uh, Secretary or something, Zhou mm -hmm. uh, So, when 54, I went to China, uh, I developed very good relation, firstly, Chairman Mao Zedong. And I really admire him as a uh, revolutionary okay. and Marxist. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, I, uh, the particularly the uh, last day, uh, say, uh, I'm leaving the next day uh, from Peking. The Mao Zedong called me, meet. We already, official very well, already sort of uh, done. But all the certain, I received one message mm. from Ch Mao Zedong's sort of office. Okay. Mao Zedong waiting there, mm. uh, want to meet me. Mm -hmm. Then I went. At that time, I was in a meeting. Uh, I, you see, one sort of the deputy, uh, my office was at the Liu Shaoqi, mm -hmm. is the boss. Right. And one, uh, one of the vice sort of the leader, mm -hmm. I'm one of them. Right. So at meeting, all the certain, one messenger come and Chairman Mao Zedong waiting there and want uh, to see me. Okay. Then 
I asked him or told Liu Shaoqi, mm. uh, he my boss. <laughs> so then he mentioned, then Liu Shaoqi immediately said, go, 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 go. Okay. And then I went to Chairman Mo's place mm -hmm. and he waiting there. Right. And he gave me very useful advice mm -hmm. after return to Tibet and how to, uh, how say they, how to how to develop relation with the public and listen public's view all sort of thing he advised me okay uh, then he want to keep uh, my contact with him directly mm -hmm. uh, and then at last mm. he mentioned to me your mind is very scientific minded uh -huh. uh, mm. uh, so religion is opium oh I see. <laughs> you said that? Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So, and, uh, that, that shows, uh, say, I, uh, sort of my intelligence, <laughs> and sort of a clever, Chairman Mo's eye, he felt I'm non-believer. <laughs> <laughs> I deceived him. <laughs> so he told me, uh, your mind, very scientific minded, mm. so religion is poison. Oh, okay. Uh, then that moment, mm. I a little bit sort of shocked. Mm. And then in order to hide my face, mm. oh, I look down my cause notebook, notebook and make note mm -hmm. uh, in order to hide my certain expression. <laughs> <laughs> like you that. Were, you were shocked. <laughs> oh. So in any way, mm. and then at that time, I really very much impressed about Marxism. Oh, I see. So I expressed, I want to join Chinese Communist Party. Really? <laughs> really. <laughs> okay. In uh, 1954? Yes, 54. Okay. Uh, 54, 55. Yeah. So then Chinese uh, concerned officials say, uh, uh, no hurry, <laughs> no hurry. And after I came to India, mm -hmm. the Jodi Bosu, Indian communist. Yes. Mm. He was the West Bengal chief minister oh, later. Yes. yes. Mm. And then uh, I met few occasion. And then because you see, I have some impression uh, Marxism that they dedicate I mean they dedicated the socialism mm -hmm. and equal distribution and emphasis right of working class people. So that's very right. That's right. Very right. Uh, the India uh, now, not only India, now everywhere, the huge gap rich and poor. True. That's source of suffering. Yes. Mm. So what would you advocate for India? Uh, mm. Coming back to India, mm. uh, you've lived here, you've uh, yes. uh, taught yes. here. You now, now wait. Mm. Oh. Now, when I uh, come to India, mm -hmm. cancer money, the Indian border. Yes, in Tawang. Oh, mm -hmm. Tawang. Mm -hmm. oh, see, we felt India is our spiritual home. Okay. We always look India as a sacred land. Right. Arya Bhumi, Arya Bhumi. Yes. Uh, so one way, refugee. One way, our uh, original sort of, I'll say the sacred country, all our knowledge come from. So we are very happy. To be here. <laughs> uh, then, uh, I'm longest guest of Indian government. <laughs> they don't mind, I'm sure. That nobody minds in India that you're here. We, we really love you and we revere you when you're here. But you're not a guest. So some, sometimes I sort of express some Indian officials. Once government of India uh, say, now no longer a guest of Indian government, then I have to think where I should go. If they say, they, don't, they won't say. <laughs> they, they won't say. Quite, quite sure. Yes. So, so, mm -hmm. so now in India, now as a result of meeting with different people, mm -hmm. uh, and then I have now four commitments. Okay. Number one commitment, I am one of the seven billion human beings. Right. Human being, 
by nature. Now scientists say uh, we are social animal. Yeah. Therefore, basic human nature is more compassionate. True. Mm -hmm. And more compassionate uh, sort of mind their physical condition better. Constant anger, mm -hmm. constant hatred is very bad for immune system. Right. That's how scientists say. Exactly. Uh, so my number one commitment is try to promote basic human value, human nature on the basis of human nature, compassion. Uh, again, according in Indian sort of tradition, secular way, not religion, secular way, mainly based on scientists, science. That's my number one commitment. Uh, I think the number of my friend mm. in different uh, country mm -hmm. now really showing uh, some interest about basic human value. That's that's good to know. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Then my second commitment is religious harmony. Mm -hmm. uh, now I fully convinced religious harmony is possible. Look, India. Exactly. All major world religious tradition live together. Absolutely. And mutual respect. Right. Wonderful. Absolutely. So world need mm. that India's tradition, religious harmony. Mm. Uh, when I saw a uh, television, oh Shia in the Sunni, mm. or in unfortunately in uh, uh Burma, mm -hmm. Buddhist Islam. Right. Very sad. Mm. Religion, all religion, carry message of love. And then that tradition itself now causing division, killing. True. Very sad. Mm. So we need special effort mm. uh, promote religious harmony. Mm. India is example. So that's my number two commitment. Right. Number three commitment regarding Tibet. Mm -hmm. Now Tibet's Political matter, as I already mentioned, I retired. Now my main sort of concern is Tibetan environment. Okay. Or high altitude, dry climate. Mm. Some Indian friend, they say, under such sort of condition, the damage environment, or you see, the revival, because the revival, because of high altitude and dry climate, take longer time. So ecology in such condition is quite delicate. So we should pay more attention, preserve uh, ecology. Ecology and in the Tibet. environment, yes, huh? right. Mm. There's, and then uh, Tibetan knowledge, as I already mentioned. Must be preserved. Uh, all Indian ancient Nalanda knowledge we kept. Now whole world, I think Nalanda uh, knowledge available only among Tibetan uh, tradition. Mm. The Burma, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, these Pali tradition. Okay. And China, as I mentioned earlier, communist. is a Nalini tradition, but a communist country. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then Mongolia, also difficult. So uh, Tibet also, actually, you see, we also lost our own country, but a handful of Tibetan here, we kept Nalanda tradition intact. Yeah. Uh, we study uh, these sort of uh, Nalanda tradition, psychology uh, and philosophy or so on. Right. This at least 20, 30 years study. Mm, that's true. We still kept these traditions. So uh, that I feel very important. Uh, Although we Tibetan carry these things, this subject actually, you see, the great potential mm -hmm. to bring uh, peace or, among the also the humanity, whole world. Correct. Uh, as an academic subject, mm -hmm. secular way, right. not religion. Mm -hmm. That's your third commitment, you say. Oh, That's your third. Then now, mm -hmm. uh, third commitment, mm -hmm. and then fourth commitment. Now. Uh, I feel India is the only nation who can combine modern education and ancient Indian knowledge how to 
sort of uh, keep peace of mind through practice of ahimsa and uh, karuna. Mm -hmm. And over 3,000 years, already developed this country, practice of shamatha, practice of vivasana. So now this mm, really India sort of rich tradition over 3,000 years. And through that way, Sanjay philosophy, Sanjay tradition, mm -hmm. and then uh, the Karsa, Jain, Jain tradition, Jain. Mm -hmm. then Buddhist tradition mm -hmm. on the basis of Ahimsa and the Karuna. Right. So these are Indian tradition. Uh, so now India should combine modern education and the ancient Indian knowledge combined. Then modern education bring material development. Uh, uh, ancient Indian knowledge bring inner peace, uh, secular way. That is important. Uh, mm. So now India have great potential mm -hmm. uh, to offer world how to keep peace of mind. Uh, in order to do that, first, firstly, within India, you see, uh, should sort of start through education, not through prayer, right. not through ritual, mm -hmm. but through education. Mm -hmm. The combination, modern okay. education and ancient Indian knowledge. So now for that, my so now fourth commitment is ancient Indian knowledge we kept. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, through education must revive in this country. That's a very big commitment mm -hmm. and I think you will be able to lead that. Mm -hmm. uh, but as somebody who is respected the world over, how do you see the next generation of Tibetans uh, taking forward the uh, struggle for more autonomy, more… Oh. Uh, Tibetan determination, mm -hmm. uh, very firm. Mm -hmm. Generation since 50s, generation past, but new generation. Uh, their determination as strong as the previous generation, very strong. Uh, so physical level, Chinese occupied, mm -hmm. but Tibetan spirit or mental level, they never control. So, so it's a Tibetan uh, spirit combination with Buddhism, mm -hmm. Buddha Dharma, Nalan tradition, right. very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, the China mm. invader, they themselves uh, more and more, I'll say the uh, number, follow Tibetan tradition, <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism. Mm. So, the Chinese control Tibet by weapon. We influence their mind. <laughs> So long run, mm -hmm. the, the, our sort of influence is more stronger than their weapon. That's true. Quite clear. Absolutely. 100% I think, I show, 100% sure. Mm -hmm. So, see, in early 70s, we decide not seeking separation, remain within the people's world of China. Right. Now, same, you see, uh, uh, firstly, as Pandit Nehru's sort of advice, uh, that is a realistic, realistic approach. Mm -hmm. Not only that, I think immense help to Chinese Buddhists. Mm. Okay. By not being in, going into confrontation. Mm. Yes. There is no confrontation no. there. So, uh, one final question, sir. I, I know your time is very precious and I am grateful for your time. But uh, one final question. Uh, India has been your home for 61 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. now. What advice would you give uh, to Indians and Indian government? Uh, Indian government, I think the most populated democratic country, wonderful. And the Prime Minister mentioned at the UN, India, land of Buddha, he mentioned. Uh, so now, mm, uh, In education, India you see, should revive the assignment earlier, ancient these things. Now, mm, uh, in the past, you see, we consider you Indian as our 
guru mm-hmm. or teacher we consider chela <laughs> india's <laughs> india gurus chela mm-hmm. i usually to describe we are uh, re- reliable chela <laughs> reliable chela because you see we kept all ancient indian knowledge we kept so that quite sufficient to prove we are reliable chela <laughs> so now mm. oh, the reality traditionally you are our guru mm-hmm. now you too much modernized <laughs> <laughs> so you lost this knowledge has come to you so now the reality mm. the traditional chela now become guru guru <laughs> <laughs> that's true. traditional guru yes. now become chela <laughs> new chela <laughs> new chela yes <laughs> that's true very much sir. thank so you so that's very my yes. commitment right india mm. secular way mm. must revive this ancient indian knowledge right. how to keep peace of mind that's right. world need these things right and that's where so you, do you ever feel uh, let down by india have you ever felt no 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 disappointed no never never mm-hmm. i think now perhaps i think frankly speaking the dalal lama become more popular whole world so india also need that person <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> exactly thank you very much sir thank you for your time and your blessings thank, thank you. Ladakh, the land of high mountain passes, is also the land of monasteries. And a day earlier, having been advised 24 hours of acclimatization, despite driving on the Darcha Padam Nimu Leh road over two days, we couldn't miss the opportunity to visit the Thikse Monastery. It's about 20 kilometers from Leh. Lama Gyatse is waiting for us and greets us warmly. on the approach to the gompa the narrow road leading to it captured surreally on camera on a turn the monastery appears peeping out even while towering majestically above a hill bathed in sunlight an example of ladakhi architecture gyatse explains it is a smaller version of the potala palace in lhasa tibet the monastery belongs to the gelugpa or the yellow hat order climbing a series of stairs turning past weathered wooden doors along the shadow of an old style lamp post on the wall The monastery stands out in its flaming red, ochre and white color. The buildings are arranged in ascending order of importance from the living quarters at the foot of the hill to the top and the potang, the official residence of the chief lama. Once on the roof, We have a bird's eye view of the immediate Indus Valley among clumps of needle-like trees that have shed their leaves in winter. 
Gyatse engages us in a mystical conversation about his learnings as a monk. He then takes us to one of the main points of interest. The Maitreya temple, erected to commemorate the visit of the 14th Dalai Lama to this monastery in 1970. The sanctum is a mesmerizing 49 foot high statue of Maitreya Buddha, the largest in Ladakh. It took four years to complete. The statue encompasses two stories of the building. The Buddha is portrayed sitting in the lotus position. The seat of the Dalai Lama here has a life size cutout of him placed on it next to the seat of the Chief Lama. We leave the monastery with the sun shining like a diamond above it to head to the library and wellness center while we discuss what a monk's life is with Gyatse. The most importantly you have to study about Buddha Dhammas. Yeah. Dalai Lama did the groundbreaking in 2018. The library has old manuscripts that monks smuggled out of China-occupied Tibet to protect the wisdom in them and Tibetan religious culture. He also shows us exquisite Tibetan tankas, again brought out to preserve them from the Chinese regime. Broadly speaking, they are divided into two categories, those that are painted and those made of silk either by applique or embroidery. The minute work in them sometimes can only be seen through a magnifying glass or a camera zoom lens. With light fading fast, we drive to and make a whistle stop at the Shanti Stupa. At a height of 13,999 feet, it is visible from all over Leh city. The white domed stupa was built in 1991 by Japanese Buddhist bhikshu Gyomu Nakamura. It holds the relics of the Buddha at its base, enshrined by the 14th Dalai Lama himself. It's built on two levels. Stairs lead to the first level where a Dharma Chakra with two deer on each side features a central image of Buddha in golden color sitting on a platform turning the Dharma Chakra wheel. The second level depicts the birth of Buddha, the defeating of devils in meditation and his death along with many small images of a meditating Buddha, all in vibrant colors. Sunrise and sunset have the best views. That's perfectly exemplified as twilight turns to night. A sliver of the moon is visible as Leh's twinkling lights are turned on in a bowl of the valley, shielded by the silhouetted mountain ranges.
final episode of Along the China Front in Western Arunachal Pradesh, we travel to Yangtze and take you to the Tawang War Memorial. The deadly June 2020 Galwan clashes between the Indian and Chinese armies have changed the rules of the strategic game in terms of India's foreign policy and military posture. Post Galwan, China's PLA failed in two more incursion attempts in Yangtze, Tawang sector in western Arunachal Pradesh at the other extremity of the LAC. Both times, they were literally and figuratively beaten back. This unofficially publicized footage from October 2021 shows a Chinese attempt to alter facts on the ground, like in Ladakh, that was repulsed too. In December 2022, another attempt to seize the higher ground was also foiled. I think but the only way to deal with Chinese is from a position of strength and that is what makes them feel sad and bad that the, the Indians, whatever hard and however hard they might want to try, the Yangtze is something which we hold. When we occupy that particular height, they always feel that they are being looked down upon and you know everything is right under our nose. So they don't like that. Strat News Global drives to and through the Yangtze area to take you on this visual virtual trip to this little-known and less-traveled-to area. We are headed to the Chumi Gyatse or Holy Waterfalls. Chumik means water holes and Gyatse or Gyatsar is rosary. This is where Padma Sambhava or Guru Rinpoche is believed to have flung his rosary against a rock and created 108 streams that gushed out of the mountain. There are two routes from Tawang to the Chumi Gyatse. One is about 95 kilometers and takes approximately five hours via Rojangra on a built-up road. We take the road less traveled on close to Bumla. It's a distance of about 70 kilometers that will take a little over three hours. We follow a couple of SUVs with tourists with the undulating mountains, some with a thin layer of snow, others barren with black soil beckoning us. The overnight snow has turned parts of the road muddy and Ravi, our driver, needs some deft maneuvering to get us through as we pass army encampments and a medical truck. The sound of silence is figuratively deafening at a quick stop at one of the lakes dotting the area, the Tso Takpai, except from the slight flutter of the Tibetan prayer flags in the breeze. At about 14,200 feet above sea level, we soak in the sun and the silence at this still semi-frozen lake with prayer flags casting larger-than-life shadows on the pristine snow. We then move onwards. Work is constantly on in these higher reaches to improve the roads. Sichu is a small quaint village in Damteng and we cross the footbridge with prayer flags to the other bank of the river. Sichu, which translates to hot water, is famous in these parts for its natural springs. The water is too hot to touch and needs to be mixed with cold river water in this open-air jacuzzi. The Tibetan prayer flags reflecting in the steamy water are the perfect advertisement for more tourism in this little visited area. Ravenous after a few hours of travel in the mountains, we've ordered some Maggi noodles for breakfast and a local lady who runs a small shop and a spotless kitchen has made a spicy breakfast which we wolf down. We enjoy a few moments with a rosy-cheeked child 
even babysitting for a bit. While mom does the dishes and some washing. A walk across another bridge takes us to a familiar site in this sector. A border roads organization crew improving connectivity on the other bank of the river. Road work, construction and maintenance is one of the few livelihoods for locals. The figurines on our dashboard which depict the famous hear no evil, see no evil and speak no evil triumvirate are a perfect precursor to the short trip from Sechu to Chumi Gyatse, the holy waterfalls. The last part of our journey is a trek for about a kilometer to the Cascades, which are about 250 meters from the LAC. The wind factor makes the weather even more crisp. As we take short, sure steps, trying not to overexert at this altitude. Our Indian Army host enjoys orienting us about the Yangtze axis as he paints the picture for us. Crossing another bridge over troubled waters, finally we are at the spectacular, breathtaking Cascades. What's believed to be unique about these falls is that they don't originate from melting snow but from a source within the mountain. There are several narratives about the waterfalls. One of the many legends that dominate is connected to the Buddhist mystic Guru Rinpoche. The story goes that Padmasambhava, who is revered by the followers of Tibetan Buddhists as the second Buddha, flung his Rudraksha rosary containing 108 beads. They hit the rocks, resulting in 108 waterfalls. He is said to have done this after a challenge from a bone lama or monk. Another story has it that he created the falls after fervent prayers from local residents to cure them of a plague that had spread through the area. Drinking the water is believed to have curative properties. The Chinese have an observation tower, surveillance cameras, a reported projector and a large screen overlooking the falls for live images for devotees and for its forces. Locals say an original temple which is believed to be almost 500 years old was destroyed during the Chinese invasion of Tibet in 1950. Ironic considering the communist atheistic state is still trying to use religion as a tool to woo Tibetans while constantly oppressing them.
It is very ironic. The Chinese regime will um, repress religion most of the time, but it will try to weaponize religion when it when it suits it. Um, and I think uh, the the threats to India are, are um, is something that uh, not only India itself but the rest of the world should take very seriously. The foiled Yangtze intrusion attempts in October 2021 and December 2022 are reminders of why the Chinese claim parts of the area. One is to usurp the religious import of the Holy Falls and two, to try and alter facts on the ground like the attempts in Ladakh. That would give them a bird's eye view directly to Damteng and other areas in the Tamang sector. They want to change the, the, their line of patrolling and the, the, the way they, they can control like something like happened in Galwan, that if you advance one or two kilometers, in many places in Arunachal, the ridge is not as clear that as a cartographer would like to be. Sometimes it's not easy to fix a ridge and you need to be to, to agree on, on this and this exercise has never been done. I think China is happy that is vague so that they, they can uh, bother India from time to time when, they, when it's convenient for them or when they want to make a point. We spend a few moments in the prayer hall Gompa, a serene, silent island with high-speed wind whistling all around us. There are a few other narratives associated with the waterfalls and its creation. Tibetan books document a guru named Lavapa, considered to be an avatar of the Manjushri, the embodiment of all of Buddha's wisdom as the creator of the waterfalls. The legend is that three gurus, Lavapa, Nakpopa and Matipa, who came from Tibet to this area to meditate, lived in three caves on different sides of the mountains. One of them is said to have run out of ink while writing in between meditating. He is believed to have thrown his pen, which landed upside down near the cave, giving rise to an upside down bamboo grove, which locals are still searching for. While both sides closely observe activities on the other side, we are told the Chinese have often taken control of Chinese-made DJI drones if they are anywhere close to the LAC, illustrating the need for both individuals and state institutions to avoid using Chinese drones. India has also upgraded its Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance ISR, in the region by several notches, we are told in off-the-record briefings, details of which Strat News is not publicizing for operational security reasons. Indian forces look directly down into the many valleys on the Tibetan side of the LAC. In fact, Yangtze is the only disputed area in Arunachal Pradesh that is firmly and physically under Indian control. A fact proven by both recent major attempts at incursion being beaten back. The army has been able to counter the PLA's every move because it has been much better prepared since October 2021 with a close watch being kept from the heights and countermeasures employed at every key point. Pre-warned is pre-armed, so it is essential that we use all our means of surveillance, whether it be our drones or satellites or surveillance or even uh, with any kind of, uh, you know, uh, you could say an arrangement with countries that is absolutely essential. We just wanted your comments on reports suggesting that there is a US real-time intelligence that was given in that incident which helped India. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, if you read this, some books have been written uh, about Tibet that uh, the CIA and the Americans have done everything. So I think similarly what's happening now in Yangtze, uh, uh, I think it's more exaggerated in India. I'm sure, I know that India has the capacity to uh, see. 
the need to ramp up civilian tourist footfall to buttress India's holding of the strategically critical area has been recognized but needs to be implemented fully. India commands these heights which give forces a strategic view to any Chinese activity across the LAC, its many PLA garrisons and the Xiaokang or dual-use border villages. India woke up very late to this um, threat of the, these villages. They have done nearly 650 villages on the border. Turned to be more PLA uh, army, Chinese army garrison than the, that uh, relocation uh, villages. India is countering with its own vibrant villages program. The Sona Chu at about 10,000 feet flows from Tibet into Tawang district. It is joined by another river called Nyukcharong, which rises from within the Yangtze plateau. Tsechu village, from where we arrived, lies near the confluence of the two rivers, marking the terminus of the Yangtze region. The Yangtze plateau at about 15,000 feet is where most of the clashes have happened. In fact, there are two ways to get to Yangtze, straight uphill and a second road along the river, giving India the advantage of a loop when it needs for troop reinforcements and logistic supplies. The December 2022 clash is reported to have been the largest skirmish in the area for over 20 years since the Kargil War when similar incidents were witnessed in the Tawang sector as well. While incursion attempts happen almost every year, what's unique now is the increasing number of PLA soldiers engaged in them. One big disadvantage for the Chinese in this area is that the Indian Army occupies all the heights, including establishments at about 17,000 feet, which give a full view of the Chinese positions. The Indian Army has also layers of troops now closer to the LAC as part of the new deployment plans introduced since tensions first erupted in eastern Ladakh in 2020. So the Chinese are known to put pressure. They wouldn't let that pressure off because uh, that's the way they believe in. You know, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without a fight. So that is what they are at it. And therefore, we must be uh, doubly careful. We mustn't give in at all. And we have to be able to deal with them from a position of strength. And that position of strength is to hold and to be able to not get surprised. They should get surprised, as what happened in Yangtze. We are dog tired as we make our way back to Tawang with the sun setting and painting a pretty golden picture in the sky. After catching 40 winks, we take one last look on this trip at this starkly beautiful land. The perfect cap to our series is spending time at the Tawang War Memorial, a stupa built in memory of the 2,420 soldiers who died in the Kameng district in the 1962 India-China War. Surrounding the stupa are the national flag, the Army and Air Force flags, as well as flags of the 27 regiments that fought in the war. The memorial is divided into two major halls. One is a museum that houses the belongings of those killed and the other is used as an auditorium where a sound and light show reminds the audience of the war. Strat News Global documented the strategic significance of the Tawang sector in this series along the China front. Click on the icon on the top right of this video or the links in the descriptor if you missed our other episodes, crossing the Sela and Neshibu tunnels, interviewing a senior army officer, traveling along the LAC to the Assam Hill and Kiafo posts, PTSO and Bumla.
of course, we have to look at only from the Tibetan angle yeah. and see how it affects or not affect and what what could be the uh, consequences of uh, global dynamism in international politics. Uh, but then there are also other angles where the global scenario, particularly economy and military, how would that impact the Chinese government's reaction? Uh, because uh, uh, how China responds to domestic issues will also resonate uh, in the international politics they play. And how international politics evolves also have its resonation on the domestic politics uh, of China. Hello and welcome to The Gist on Strategies Global. I'm Surya Vingadran and I'm in Dhanshala, where I'm sitting down for an interview with the Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration, Mr. Ben Sering. So it's not too long since we had our last interview. I was glad we had that interview because you are a very senior uh, journalist. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just a few questions. Um, um, I understand there's been some moves towards some kind of a dialogue again with the Chinese after a long time. Is they can tell us anything about it? All I can say at this point of time is that we do have back channels. Uh, so the first step is to re-establish contacts. And uh, uh, yeah, that's all I can say uh, as of now. Any idea as to what level? Um, what could you tell us? No, those are informal uh, back channels. So it's not uh, uh, formal government-to-government uh, uh, -government, uh, channels. So we'll keep it at that. Right now. And it's coming from there, um, from the other side? I don't think Solness has also said that before. Uh, I understand that there is a move to uh, bring other nationalities in China, like the Uyghurs, for instance, uh, to bring them on a common platform along with the Tibetans. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, for many years, uh, some of our senior leaders like Gary Rinpoche, uh, Ludi Gary Rinpoche, uh, there have been uh, meeting with Uyghurs, uh, including Erkin Aptekan, who was a very senior yeah. leader amongst the Uyghur people who used to live in Germany for a very long time. Now he's no more. But even during his time, uh, at that time, there were the Uyghur issue was not a big issue, and uh, uh, the, there were not too many Uyghurs outside also. So the leadership was uh, also limited. At that time, uh, they also started this Allied Committee of Uyghurs, Tibetans, Mongolians together and uh, they worked together. Then later the uh, UNPO was established, uh, the Unrepresented Nations People's Organization, those people who are under sovereign countries right now but don't have access to United Nations. Uh, it's a platform for them to meet together but that became too large and also cumbersome in some areas for us to function but that still exists. Yeah, we're still there, but uh, still not very sure about the activities and outcome of the organization. So, and we have been having these meetings with the Uyghurs, with the Mongols, with the Manchus, and with the Hong Kongers and Taiwanese uh, for a very long time. Uh, but it has not concretized into any uh, 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 objective program. So. Mm -hmm. These are some things that we may have to look into the possibilities of uh, whether we, we can work together because everybody has a different historical background and different ask and different methods of uh, reaching their goal. So we always look at common grounds, uh, not the issues of differences uh, that involves uh, different nationalities within within China. So these meetings have been held in India or overseas? In June, we had one meeting here in Dharamsala itself, uh, where we had uh, uh, representatives from the Uyghur community, from the Taiwanese community, from Hong Kong, from Mongol, Mongolia, and for the first time, the Manchus. Uh, that's why I was a little bit surprised as to uh, whether there is a huge shift in policy of the South Korean government, because the Manchus are mostly located there. Yeah and they claim support of uh, South Koreans uh, in their struggle. So even Manchurians are now coming out with that and 
that is also changing the equation between South Korea and China, not only because of the Manchus, but there are the larger issues of North Korea and the threats that are coming from uh, North Korea and China. And because of North Korea, also uh, the relations between South Korea and China is also getting affected. So you see this uh, as a positive development going forward, even though it's taken time. Yeah, well, I think it's an interesting uh, development in the sense that South Koreans have been quite conservative in their approach and also because of their broader proximity with North Korea and uh, being very close to China, they have uh, been more um, cautious uh, about their approach towards China. But then now you have the AP4, uh, or Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand being invited to G7 meetings. They are also being invited for NATO conferences. So that's also raising the uh, hackers of Chinese against uh, NATO-like formation in the Asia-Pacific or Indochina. And then you also have the Quad, which is also seen as another NATO-like formation in the uh, South China Sea. So now you see, of course, a lot of equations uh, changing. You have so many multilaterals happening with so many varied interests. Uh, and uh, I think India's role globally, in the, whether it's the SEO or BRICS or uh, G20, uh, to take it to an international order whereby everybody uh, abides by rules and regulations. So I think that's a very important uh, step forward, uh, particularly with India's leadership globally. Uh, but does it specifically help your case? Does it help you push your case with China? Mm, we, uh, of course, we have to look at only from the Tibetan angle yeah. and see how it affects or not affect and what what could be the uh, consequences of uh, global dynamism in international politics. Uh, but then there are also other angles where the global scenario, particularly economy and military, how would that impact the Chinese government's reaction? Uh, because uh, how China responds to domestic issues will also resonate uh, in the international politics they play, and how international politics re evolves also have its resonation on the domestic politics uh, of China, uh, because that involves uh, the Chinese government's capacity yeah. to, to, to reach out internationally and domestically. But unfortunately, uh, Chinese uh, uh, they say something and always do something different. Uh, that has been the case with China so far. So that is, as Prime Minister rightly put it during the G20, I think uh, the, the the insinuations were more against uh, China and Pakistan because there is a lot of trust deficit in the relationships. Unless there is trust, it's very difficult to move the relationship forward. And uh, China is always very suspicious with every single country in this world, including mm -hmm. its own people. So now how this trust can be bridged or whether countries will continue to follow the economic gains, leaving aside human rights and other things, whether they will do that. But now we get this sense that all the countries around the world are more conscious about human rights and climate change issues that's confronting this world. Now, earlier, um, there was an audience with the Dalai Lama where he spoke of total autonomy that they want, assuming he makes a decision at some point to go to China. Have the Chinese ever spelled out what their ideas on autonomy are? With Chinese, uh, they like to believe that Tibetans already have autonomy. <laughs> Because the Tibetan regions are called Tibet Autonomous Region, Tibet Autonomous Prefectures, Tibet Autonomous Counties. So all those areas in the map yeah. where Tibetans have traditionally occupied these places and habitated these places and which are of contiguous in nature are one. So Tibet's size is almost 75% yeah. of China. Or, or no, 25% of China. But 75% of India, hmm. you know, so it's very big yeah. in that sense. So, uh, yeah, there are definitely challenges, but uh, if everybody is committed 
uh, to to resolve this, then uh, the Sino-Tibet conflict is the most easy one yeah. to resolve because we have uh, we will concede sovereignty if there is a resolution through the middle way approach. But till such a time, the historical status of Tibet is history. We cannot change that. Conceding sovereignty, those are big words, you know. Yes. How will it go down with young Tibetans? Uh, that uh, is also there. But then uh, again, uh, you have to look at the choices. Do you have a better choice than middle way approach or the middle way policy? If you have a better choice about how to achieve that, how it can be done, then we can definitely go for another uh, option. But that doesn't lo- leave any room for any other option right now. We've had some curious developments in China of late. Uh, two senior ministers disappearing, yes. no explanation at all. I mean, what is your sense of what's going on there? It's very difficult to accept the explanation that uh, corruption lies at the heart of Li Shangfo, mm. the foreign defense minister's uh, vanishing. But then again, the question is, Li Shangfu was appointed only after the last plenary yeah. by Xi Jinping yeah. himself. Now, not even one year going into this, you know, after the plenary, or maybe after the March session. Few months after that, he had to be removed. And Xi Jinping has been conducting this anti-corruption um, uh, effort for several years now, since he assumed office from 2014 onwards, maybe not so much for the first one, two years, but then after that, anti-corruption was a big move that he copied from Mao to of course, handle corruption, anti-corruption also, but at the same time, destroy all his opponents, which is exactly what Mao did. Again, Mao is very well known for destroying his opponents. <clears throat> if you read Jan Halliday's uh, book, yeah. it's very, very clear in there. So I don't think it's only anti-corruption. There may be other matters related to that. Uh, then the uh, Qinggang, they say it's because of his now. The Chinese government is saying it's because of his relationship with the TV host and mm-hmm. had a had a child in mm-hmm. Washington mm-hmm. in New, in US. But that again is very uh, flimsy ground. Even though Chinese communists are very clear about extramarital affair and all that, but that cannot be a, a reason for his removal because he was there as ambassador to the US. And Chinese government already knew about yeah. what was happening. They cannot, uh, you know, independently do anything. So those facts should have been known to the Chinese leadership when he was appointed as the yeah. you know, foreign minister. Then again, you are talking about the rocket forces. The two, three leaders in rocket forces. So apart from the eastern, northern, southern, western, and central uh, theaters, then you also have the rocket forces, which Xi Jinping himself considered it of utmost importance and he appointed these people and those were his appointees. Again, they are talking about corruption. But then nothing that is come nothing that is coming out as an explanation from the Chinese government can be true. That much we can understand. You know, so if there is an explanation after so long here, you know, since July to now and you have an explanation coming, so that's molded in the manner that they want people to perceive this news. But that cannot be true. So everything we say, anything I say also would be speculation because the system is so opaque. And uh, yeah, uh, I think through the Chinese system, it's very easy to understand the policies, but very difficult to understand the placements. Apparently there were some reports about uh, some senior leaders in the party obviously not serving, yeah. who, who who have told Xi Jinping that he's on the mm. wrong track and all kinds of stuff. Is it, is it um, given your understanding of how the Chinese mm. system operates, is this something which can happen? I mean, a set of retired leaders telling the guy in charge that, you know? That norm was very much there. When, you know, from maybe Teng Xiaoping's time uh, to Chang Zemin, to Hu Jintao, to now Xi Jinping, the norm is that if you are Chang Zemin, 
there has to be one or two person from your side in the Politburo to protect you. Because under communism, they can do anything. Yeah. They can send somebody to arrest you tomorrow. We all saw what happened to Hu Jintao. Yeah. And the plenary itself, he was taken out and he was rarely seen after that. So disappearances are very, very uh, uh, frequent uh, in, in China. And uh, yeah, these are very, I think these are symptoms of a larger picture. Otherwise, uh, they won't, they don't normally, and it's very difficult to hide also. And we will know the truth only maybe after 10 years or 15 years when they are no longer with the government. So the norm is that every president, every former president will have to have one or two person in the new Politburo. Even after he's retired. Even after, no, that is more important. When you are there as head of the state or premier or president or whatever, you are protecting yourself. Yeah. Once you are not there, the incumbent or the successor might do something that might uh, affect your security interests. So for that, you need those. But this time, there's nobody in the Politburo. It's all she's uh, people. And the speculation before the Badahi uh, informal meeting was that this time there's nobody to reprimand Xi uh, Jinping. But only later, much later, after the Badahi happened, mm -hmm. because that's a secret meeting, then we got informed that a former vice president, uh, Mr. Tsang, who was also responsible for making Xi Jinping what he is today, uh, uh, it's assumed that they had a separate meeting before the Badahe meeting uh, where Li Keqiang is also uh, supposed to be present. And then they drafted their own thing and then Tsang went to inform uh, to, of course, the word you use, reprimand or, you know, scold or whatever. That used to be the role of the senior leaders to control or to maintain some balance with the incumbent leadership. But that has, many people thought that there will be nobody to reprimand uh, to the, the current leadership. But then later, uh, the Nikai reported that they were reprimand from the senior leaders. And it still works in that sense. And then I think he became livid and he went back to his team and said, oh, these are remnants of problems left by uh, Zhang Zemir Hu Jintao. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, these things still happen because one person... To rule 1.4 billion is yeah, not easy. easy. Not, not easy. easy. And then you have so many competing forces at every level. And to gain loyalty of all this by force, not by love, <laughs> you know, then it becomes more problematic. Because if there is an opening, then they can take yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah. So my last question is, what is the future of the Tibetan community in India? We believe that Indian government will be as generous to us as they have been before. And we can never forget uh, this because through the darkest hour of our history as a neighboring country and as somebody whom we regard as our guru, as our teacher, we believe that the uh, Indian government will continue to uh, grant us the support that they have been uh, doing. And, and I think it will also largely depend on the behavior of the Tibetans in India as to how we conduct ourselves. So, yeah, and I think also the fact that Indian government is very proud to tell the international community that they have been looking after the Tibetan uh, refugees' welfare is uh, well taken in, in Delhi. And I think nobody wants a change in that status quo of how the world perceives uh, India and in receiving uh, refugee community, including Tibetan, even though they are not signatory to the Re refugee convention. So our job is now more and more Tibetans are getting scattered. As yeah. I said, the dispersal of the younger generations from the compact communities is a huge challenge. So that we are looking at another solution to repopulate the uh, compact communities and then also work on the younger generations of Tibetans who are now becomes who have now become citizens of independent countries and they have uh, the right to vote and also the right to advocate with their representatives on the cause of Tibet and knowing the language also makes a lot of difference and that is what we are preparing for so also to make this administration strong because Tibetans never focus on databases. <laughs> if you ask Tibetans how many, they'll say many. Then how many, many, they don't know. 
Now we are focusing a lot on data mm. so that all our future policies could be driven by data, hard facts, and then it will become more reasonable. And that that's why we are developing database structure and system and changing some systems, even though we do have a good system. So these are some of the things that, and also to make sure that even if we have to struggle for another 30, 40, 50 years down the line, we have the younger generation to take the lead. Uh, that is what we are, we are preparing for. Ben Pasering, uh, thank you very much you. for again giving us time and for talking to us. And I wish you the very best in your endeavors ahead. And thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's all we have for you today on uh, Strategies Global. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social media. Thank you and good night. If there is one aggressor, it's going to be China. Yeah. Uh, so the 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 level of paranoia uh, with the Chinese leadership, because one thing the Chinese leadership lack is trust mm -hmm. within themselves and with others. <laughs> they don't trust anybody else, and others don't trust them. Yeah. So if there is no trust, it's very difficult to maintain relationship over longer time, because you always live in suspicion as yeah. who is going to do what. So that is why when I checked with Chinese scholars, they said that not more than three Politburo members can meet together without the uh, permission of the president. Mm. Uh, this convention was there, but it was reinforced more during Xi Jinping's time. And what does that say? That manifests that they are afraid of internal coup. Hello and welcome to The Gist on Strat News Global. Good evening, I'm Surya Vindadran and this evening we have with me the Sikyong of the Central Tibet Administration in India, Mr. Pempa Sering. Sir, welcome, glad to have you. Thank you for having me. So, uh, we've been reading some reports about um, a renewed Chinese efforts to uh, culturally assimilate um, or sinicize uh, young Tibetans. Uh, and I understand uh, that while uh, earlier there were reports of mass incarceration of uh, uh, Tibetans, uh, is this a new, more recent development? No, it has been happening over the years, but now it is becoming a more intensified under President Xi Jinping. Uh, at one time, we used to really fear demographic aggression because it's only six, seven million Tibetans yeah. on that 2.5 million square kilometers of land, and only only seven, six, seven Tibetan, uh, six, seven million Tibetans, and it's 1.4 billion. We I mean, and we thought that Tibet would be completely overwhelmed by the majority Han Chinese. But uh, maybe also uh, because China's population is also declining and it's not possible for every Chinese to live on the Tibetan plateau. You mm -hmm. need that lung. And they come only to those areas where uh, they, make, they can make money in towns and cities. They don't mm -hmm. go to rural areas where they have to do hard labor for a livelihood. So that has not happened as much as we feared. So the next assault from the Chinese government is now how do we turn every other nationality into a Chinese? Mm -hmm. So that is under Xi Jinping, one nation, one language, one culture kind of policy at the expense of all other nationalities. So you're striking at the very root of the identity of people. In the case of Tibetans, our language comes from India. Yeah. Our Buddhism also came from India. So we are an extension of Indian culture. We are proud to be repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom because we must have translated all the available Buddhist texts into Tibetan in 8th century uh, and thereby we are proud to be a custodian of one part of ancient Indian wisdom. Now China is striking at that, taking Tibetan children away from their families uh, put them into boarding school. So we are talking about a million children between the age of 6 to 18 in boarding school out of 7 million total population. 
And the last time we checked, below the age of six, between the age of three to six or so, it used to be several thousands in uh, boarding schools, mm -hmm. nearby boarding schools. Now it has gone up to 150,000. Mm -hmm. So the age limit is also coming down. And then the focus is more on Chinese language, Chinese version of history, Chinese communist ideology, and how to maintain their loyalty to the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. So thereby, you are completely brainwashing the younger generations of Tibetans. And that's why when I spoke at uh, the seminar yesterday also, I mentioned, of course, it is very detrimental for the Tibetan population if this continues for another several decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, this also has a security implications on India because yeah. Tibetans always looked up to India as the land of Aryavrath, the, the land of the Buddha. And we have this huge respect for uh, India and Indian people. And then, of course, the government and people of India have been very kind since we came into exile. So that equation will also change if people change. So tell me, in this situation where you are seeing so many of your young people being uh, culturally, you know, their Tibetan identity being, uh, uh, being wiped out, what would you expect from India to do, given the fact that Relations with China are not good. Mm. What would you expect from India? No, relations uh, with China being good or not depends on who is the more belligerent yeah. uh, party. Uh, in this case, uh, China is the belligerent party. India has always been a very defensive country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I always said, if there is something that we know about China having lived on that plateau for so many centuries as neighbor with China, China respects only strength, yeah. not weakness. So they have over the years tried to contain India through its uh, policies or support with or its relation with Pakistan over many decades. We live in India, we know how India's foreign policy have been so centric on Pakistan and Jammu Kashmir. Now, the whole equation has changed. India is a growing power. India has the strength to stand up on its position. And India is standing up to its position and its values, democratic values. So then only you command respect from the Chinese. Yeah. So that is a very important uh, development that has taken place uh, over the last few years. And uh, So do you expect that as India's strength and power grows, it will uh, influence the Chinese to uh, perhaps talk to India more and then indirectly perhaps influence their policy in Tibet? The, my analysis of why China's belligerence on the Indian border or saber rattling with Taiwan or assertiveness in the South China Sea or with Senkaku or Daewoo Islands with Japanese is that they keep these hotspots burning. Mm -hmm. Because you look at Ladakh, the place in Galwan area, except for the some greeneries or the banks of the rivers, nothing, nothing there. Or mountains. So what are you fighting for, actually? You know. So, of course, Indian analysts say these are ways to contain China, India, uh, that India does not grow beyond certain things. Uh, but at the same time, my uh, thinking is that China has become very insecure today. Mm -hmm. So everything that's coming out of the Chinese leader's mouth is security, security, yeah. security. And that also creates a sense of fear in the Chinese people's mind that, again, the foreigners are going to come and invade yeah. China, which is not really the truth. So they try to create that atmosphere. And if there is a threat to the survival of the Communist Party, Depending on the severity of that threat, they will attack one of these places. Mm -hmm. So till such, a, such, till such a time, I don't see any uh, uh, immediate danger from the Chinese side because their econo economy is in the doldrums, yeah. uh, for starting from the rural governments to the banking sector to the housing uh, collapse and uh, the, the, the debt economies that are not working, BRI programs that are not uh, going as they expected. Yeah and their foreign exchange reserves will also come down if the GDP growth is not as much as it used to be. And if they have don't have too much trade surplus with other countries, they don't, then they don't have the uh, reserve to splurge it on 
Belt and Road Initiative or space technology or artificial intelligence or military equipment. As I say China needs to be more introspective. We yeah. point fingers at everybody else and say they are trying. Everybody else is at fault. A problem for China, but whereas China is fueling military expense of all the other countries. Look at Japan. Prime Minister Kishida is now very strong on spending on defense, yeah. and Taiwan has to spend. There is no choice for them. Australia is investing in nuclear submarines, even though they are that far away. Now, India has to spend more. We all know how much India is spending on infrastructure development and uh, and, and the new uh, defense ties with France or Germany or U.S. But India is also in a very difficult position because yeah. of the growing pressure China relations, and if India, if China were to attack India today, I think India would be in a very difficult position with spare parts and you know, the militarized supplies not coming through from Russia. So it's a very new well, scenario that is developing a new dynamics and mm -hmm. equations uh, coming up. So it's very interesting times. So I'd like to touch upon the point you made that uh, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party appear insecure. Is this, um, what are they insecure about? Uh, I think the primary focus is internal, isn't it? Inflation. A mass public uprising against the Communist Party. We saw some evidence of that during the COVID time, sure. you know, uh, not too long ago, I think last year itself. Is that <coughs> the primary fear here? I think uh, if the, because nobody is going to attack China yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. India is not going to attack China. Yeah. NATO is not going to attack China. None of the neighboring states have the capacity or the will to uh, attack China. So if there is only if there is one aggressor, it's going to be China. Yeah. Uh, so the 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 level of paranoia uh, with the Chinese leadership because one thing the Chinese leadership lack is trust mm -hmm. within themselves and with others. <laughs> they don't trust anybody else and others don't trust them. Mm -hmm. So if there is no trust, it's very difficult to maintain relationship over longer time because you always live in suspicion and yeah. who is going to do what. So that is why when I checked with Chinese scholars, they said that not more than three Politburo members can meet together without the uh, permission of the president. Mm -hmm. Uh, this convention was there, but it was reinforced more during Xi Jinping's time. And what does that say? That manifests that they are afraid of internal coup. Mm -hmm. But then now the things have changed, uh, unlike the previous Politburo, where you have uh, normally they keep people from the former presidents, like Chiang Zemin's people, or Hu Jintao's people. Now that Chiang Zemin is no more, Hu Jintao's people should be there to protect him. Yeah. That is the system. That's how it <laughs> works. Now, this time, it's all his people, seven people. So it's one one hand, you have Xi Jinping and the six other people. And it's supposed to be all his own people. Mm. So if you listen to the Chinese people's reaction to the developments in Russia with Putin and Wagner, uh, Prigozhin, uh, there were some YouTubers in China who were we did a very good analysis of how people viewed that. And China showed that for only a few hours when it started. Mm. And when the story, the story started evolving around Prigozhin's relationship with Putin over 30 years, being an inmate, chef, this, that, and then a close ally of Putin rising up against the mm. Iron Man as Chinese people see, or even Xi Jinping sees Putin as a very strong man, Iron Man, and that image being shattered uh, has its implication on the minds of the Chinese people as to whether there would be a future precaution against Xi Jinping or not. So those questions are, and then suddenly they stopped the coverage mm -hmm. by the state media, and there are no other media that can cover that, or they showed it only after the the Prigozhin decided to leave to Belarus for uh, exile. So that is the level of control on information we are talking about, which is taken for granted in the free world. Uh, but tell me, this idea of a coup, yeah. this suspicion of a coup, is it uh, realistic given uh, you know, Xi Jinping's control over the system? And coup from where? From within the party or from the army? 
Oh, this could be varied, you know. That's so cool. The, the first thing I said about having to secure his permission for mm -hmm. more than three Politburo people, then it becomes a majority. Yeah. And the second level is during Xi Jinping's time, particularly in the last four years, he has been changing every general, just like what Mao used to do mm -hmm. when he changed the Eastern Theater General to the Western, yeah. you know, swap the job. Similarly, uh, Xi Jinping is also transferring all the generals every single year. He doesn't. He makes sure that the generals don't build strong relationship mm -hmm. with the cadres. So that also is a paranoia to mm -hmm. rule out military coup. So it could be from anywhere political. Uh, this uh, from the public also again. China is the only country that spends more money on internal security yeah. than external security, particularly on security apparatus and. Uh, the apps that they use, you know, like electronic identification, geolocation, now even DNA profiling, iris scanning, and all that. So that itself manifests a deep distrust between the rulers and the ruled. Mm -hmm. And now, according to this YouTuber, she was also talking about the large, the world's largest army in the world, you know, the, in terms of size. So these army people, the initial stage of the formation of Communist Party, the party used to dictate who they can marry and who they can date with. And later there was a little more freedom. People mm. could choose their life partners. But now this is being reimposed. Even marriage in now, as to who you should marry, you can marry or who you can date with. That is what the YouTuber was saying and she sounded very uh, factual about this. So what is their um, uh, definition or uh, meaning of when who is the who is most compatible with the other is it loyalty to the party is that what matters which means you say that of course they will ho even the spouses or the, uh, the pe people that you are dating they will have to undergo background checks <laughs> to be uh, eligible to marry an army man so that all these uh, uh, whatever secrets of the government does not go out so now with the counter espionage law also, everything is so contradictory. They want investment, but then you have the counter espionage mm -hmm. law. And just this morning, there was a report about a Chinese reporter just reporting about China's economy and comparing that with the depression of the 1930s. And then he is now out there. So what are your resources or the scholars you mentioned earlier? What are they telling you about the Chinese economy? Is it really going down? In a deep... Of course, there are a lot of uh, apprehensions on the uh, quality of Chinese data. Mm -hmm, yeah. so they always hide something. Uh, now they want to, in the free world, you can have access to all kinds of data and so you can make your analysis of what yeah. is happening. And China is clamping down more because now they make sure that all sensitive data that portray China as a weak economy or mm. economy not gaining traction or the contraction of economy and comparing uh, with other situations when there were bad things, all, everything could be a cause uh, for you to be arrested on the ground of national security and social stability. Mm -hmm. Because all the laws that Chinese government flames are very, very ambiguous. It's not well defined. So anybody can take decision at every level depending on whether you like that country or not, whether you like that company or not whether you like that person or not. So it all depends because on the one hand, they need the market. On the other hand, they put these restrictions. So everybody has to live in a kind of uncertainty. Even business people, they wonder, with the Japanese, they have already arrested some 17, 18 of yeah. their people already. And what does it say? How much, how longer will Japan be able to pursue with this policy of always have to confronting their people being arrested and seeking their release while running the business at the same time? Yeah. But that is why Japan has moon for plus one. Uh, China solution. plus one, yeah. China plus one solution, So, which many other countries might also follow because there are a lot of problems with decoupling, mm. too much investment. So that is why when people tell us, oh, the dragon is biting us, then we tell them who fed the dragon. That yeah. we, are, we were not able to tame the dragon. And then you say that the dragon is biting at you, and you're still feeding the dragon. You see so many European leaders from uh, Chancellor Scholz to President Macron, 
to Juan de Leon, to Babok, to Pistorius, to all, all Asian <laughs> leaders going to China. Yeah. Now New Zealand Prime Minister is there. Uh, President Lula also went. So you have the African Union participating in human rights discussions in Tibet with SCO members. Yeah. So all these are happening, aligning, realigning, uh, alignment, and all these developments are happening. But then what is the message for Russia, for, for China, for Europe? The main concern is Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. And then you have this very deep relationship between Ukraine, Russia and China, mm -hmm. uh, whereas China needs European market because most of the European countries have trade deficit with China, including India. Yeah, but true. India has a huge trade deficit with China, particularly in the last one, two years, it has gone up from, the business volume has gone up from 79 to 118 billion or so. So as long as China have this excess of foreign exchange reserve, they will splurge it and they will use it against you. So you cannot complain that the dragon is yeah. biting at you because you are feeding the same dragon. Yeah. You think it's realistic a military coup in China? You think it's uh... no, do anything can no, I think anything can spark anything because right now the the paranoia from the government is forcing the government to take certain steps which again. Uh, constricts the freedom of the people. So the more you constrict people's freedom, the more people are going to be wary of the government, mm -hmm. not trust the government. And then add to that the economic woes of the government, where you have, we already mentioned about rural banking, housing and all that. And then the falling uh, contraction in the economy. Uh, so that is going to fuel when it comes to livelihood, when it comes to the stomach. You're talking already yeah. talking about eleven point six million young Chinese between the age of seventeen to twenty four who are unemployed. Mm -hmm. And they find for one, some of them have even gone to foreign countries, paid huge mm -hmm. fees to study and come back. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you are asked to go to the rural areas and work on the farm. It's just like what Maudit. Is that true? They're being asked to go to the rural areas? There has been a lot of reports on that. Mm -hmm. They have not been, because the, the, the cities are not able to provide them with employment. Mm -hmm. So then the only alternative is go to the villages to work on the farms. And then having paid so much money, having spent so much time mm -hmm. to study mm -hmm. and try to seek a white collar job, mm -hmm. that is the Chinese dream. And then their dream is completely smashed now. And then 11.6 million, maybe small out of 1.4 billion, but when you take 11.4 six million as a force to reckon with, they can create chaos. So if there is anything, economy is something that can really bring the Chinese back on their knees. So let's get back to Tibet. Given China's economic situation, do you see um, perhaps going forward um, a certain relaxation of the strict rules that are following in Tibet? Do you see kind of pulling back of the Chinese state from you know, in the lives of ordinary Tibetans? That looks very unlikely. If you look at the incremental uh, repressive measures of the Chinese government, particularly during Xi Jinping's time, every amendment to available laws, prevailing laws, are being made more stricter, not mm -hmm. looser. The indication could only come from those policies and programs. Uh, so what we see uh, now, whether it's on con control of the use of religious areas, or whether it's on control of the use of internet, uh, so everything is becoming more and more stringent. Mm -hmm. That makes it more difficult for people to exercise their freedom. Um, so it doesn't look very uh, likely that, uh, that uh, under the present circumstances, things are going to change, because Xi Jinping also have been saying that there's no need for us to change our system. Mm -hmm. because we have proven over the last two, three decades that we can have economic development under Communist Party. So that being a fact, they forget to look at, at every other aspect of human aspiration. Like what are people longing to, are they only looking for wealth or material wealth? Because for Chinese government, every problem, the solution is development, development, yeah. development, development, nothing else. So it's nothing to do with the religious aspirations of the people. Well, people have been deprived of this spirituality for the last so many decades, and now materially they are much more better than before. They're, 
But then again, you have this spiritual vacuum. Mm -hmm. When Tibetan lamas go to Beijing, some of their patrons are communist leaders, mm. military leaders. They do uh, meet with them uh, secretly. So even they have to wonder whether there is life after death or not, uh, whether mm. you believe in it or not, or whether you are religious or not. Ultimately, it boils down to that. Even Tao Ziyang, when he was dethroned and, and he had problems, when he died, he sent his son to, for his holiness to pray for his father's soul. So you have all these contradictions in mm -hmm. it's not as ironed out as, you know, as we tend to see from the outside. And this thing about the Dalai Lama's reincarnation, the party is heavily involved in trying to uh, get a solution. No, they are not a solution. They are more into creating future problems. Mm -hmm. So they know that Tibetan people are very religious, deeply devout Buddhists. So if they can control the Dalai Lama, then they can control the Tibetan population. Mm -hmm. So they are not bothered about the living 14th Dalai Lama, but they are more bothered about the yet to come yeah. 15th Dalai Lama. Do you think they've already identified somebody, some little boy? Not possible. They cannot. Mm -hmm. They cannot. That is why when I was asked by some foreign diplomats as to you don't seem to have a process in place mm -hmm. uh, regarding his holiness uh, selection and all that. That is for something for His Holiness to decide because it's His Holiness who is going to be reborn. Yep. I cannot decide as a CDA leader or any other government yep. for that matter. And this is a purely religious uh, uh, and ritualistic matter. So it is best uh, left to people whom His Holiness entrusts to carry on the uh, responsibility. So my message to the Chinese government is, have you not learned enough lesson from the Benchen Lama saga? Yeah. Mm. Because you have two three boys, out of the three boys, one was selected by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. and then he was abducted, and along with his family, we still don't know whether he's alive or not. Even if he's alive, whether he has been given the traditional education to carry on his responsibilities or not. And then you have the Chinese select pension Lama. When he was sent to Tibet, you have to pay the people to go and listen to him, meet yeah. him. You have to force the civil servants to make it compulsory for them to see uh, the Chinese selected pension lama. So you don't see this respect from the Tibetan people. Uh, they just call him another, he's a Tibetan boy, of course, he, they just call him another political leader, mm -hmm. not respected as pension lama. So you don't see pictures of the Chinese selected pension lama to be sold on the market, yeah. in the market you see only the 10th pension lama. So that is how Tibetans show their displeasure or not accepting the Chinese choice. It is a government that does not believe in religion or spirituality and interfering in the process of selection itself is quite, uh, I don't know, such a, <laughs> such a contradiction yeah. that, that it's, it's difficult to place it in a very realistic or uh, rational sense. But that is what Chinese government always does. And my response to this was uh, that uh, China cannot handle unpredictability, just like mm -hmm. with Trump. Uh, that's why His Holiness also saying it could be a rebirth, it mm -hmm. could be a emanation, it could be a woman when he's asked. So China is confused. So that's why right now the decision that His Holiness has taken is very wise. Because once His Holiness decide, then they will use. China has all the resources, mm -hmm. financial and human. But then they will try to influence the international community uh, to follow their... Uh, but they cannot just appoint one person. There has to be a time. So last question. You deal with the Indian government. What is it that you would ask of them or in your discussions with them, what is it that you seek? I mean... Um, uh, whether in terms of the Tibetan diaspora here, you know, mm. what is it that you uh, would wish for them to... Uh... The Indian government uh, and the people of India have been very kind to us. We have our historical relationship, as I mentioned before, our first king of yeah. Tibet came from India. So we have all this. We feel like an extension. And I tell our friends, so I look, I mean, look a little different because I'm a Tibetan, but our mind is all the same. Mm -hmm. It is shaped by Indian philosophy and thinking. So uh, humanitarian issues, is the, the, the Indian government has been very, very kind. Uh, when it comes to political issues concerning China, 
earlier when that question used to be posed to His Holiness, His Holiness always used to say, India is overcautious. Now I say we can remove the over, yeah. but still cautious. Yeah. And I think uh, in, in international politics and looking at the national interests of uh, government of India, uh, uh, there, there needs to be due diligence and uh, uh, discerning power to take the right decision, but then if they can be a little more assertive about their position on the on, on Tibet, uh, like the boundary issue, the, I say India is not saying it, yeah. but the fact that India still uses Indo-Tibetan border police and Indo-Tibetan border force, not changing it to Sino-Indian border yeah. police, yeah. Or that, that itself underlines or underscores what India really wishes it to be. So, but then His Holiness has uh, uh, taken on this uh, middle way policy because he thinks more about the common interest rather than individual interest. And if we can have a non-violent, negotiated, mutually beneficial, lasting solution to the Sino-Tibet conflict on that plateau through the middle way or genuine autonomy for Tibetans, then we are, I tend to like to believe that even the border issue should, should be resolved. So if that happens, then there will be much more peace and stability because we have played the role of a buffer historically yeah. between the two most populous nations in the world. There was never a world war between China and India because of Tibet. And Tibetans have so much respect for Indians that there's, there's never ever been a war. So we are willing to play the role of a bridge in future if there is a resolution to the Sino-Tibet conflict and promote more stability in the region. So on that hopeful note, Pepper Sering, uh, thank you very much for speaking to Spread News Global. Thank you. And I hope we can have many more such conversations in future. Thank you so much, Surya. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So that's all we have for you now on The Gist. Uh, do tune in for more such conversations going forward. Thank you very much. Good night. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. You're on Strat News Global. I'm Nitin Gokhale. This evening, we have a special program and a special guest on our program in the evening that we go live with. The program is just, of course, as all our viewers know. And I have uh, somebody uh, who is... Uh, just been elected the president of the uh, Tibetan government in exile, uh, Penpa Shering, who's joining me from Dharamshala uh, live. But uh, we will be taking questions uh, from the audience as we go along. But uh, let me welcome uh, uh, Penpa Shering uh, and congratulate him. Uh, but before that, uh, let me say this, that Strat News Global uh, has this evening program called The Gist, which we go live on. Penpa Sharing, good evening. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be part of your program. In fact, uh, let me congratulate you on the election as the uh, president, as they call Sikyong of the uh, Tibetan government in exile. And uh, also, uh, let me start by asking you uh, that uh, having been elected as the president uh, of uh, the Tibetan government in exile, uh, what is your uh, priority uh, as uh, you uh, take the charge of the government in exile, as far as the Tibetan affairs are concerned? There are two main responsibilities for the Central Tibetan Administration. One is to resolve the Sino-Tibet conflict because of which we are in exile. Because of China's occupation of Tibet, we are in exile. So we have to uh, work with the Chinese government to resolve this issue. Uh, with wholeheartedness from both sides, because nego negotiation and dialogue doesn't happen uh, only from one side. So uh, we'll make every effort to reach out to the Chinese government until a lasting solution is found. Uh, we will be uh, pointing out to the Chinese leaders as to what are the policies and programs they are implementing inside that are not beneficial, both for the Chinese government and the Tibetan people. And uh, the second responsibility 
uh, well, of course, uh, once the uh, Chinese government is more responsive um, and uh, work towards a lasting solution for the issue of Tibet, then there will be a change in course. And uh, uh, till such a time, we will be pushing our advocacy work forward uh, multi in, uh, in, in multiple terms by using all the potential that we have, uh, by optimizing all the potential that we have around the world. The second responsibility is to look after the welfare of the Tibetan people. So just like in any democracy, whenever we have elections, uh, there is division within the community. So my first job would be to bring together all the Tibetan community together, starting from the top. So yesterday I met with the Supreme Justice Commissioners. In a few days we'll be having the parliament in session, so I'll be talking to the parliament about the relationship that we need to maintain for uh, pure democratic polity. And then I'll be talking with the autonomous bodies and also the non-governmental organizations and the media. So these are some of the things that we need to attend to uh, immediately. Yes, indeed. Uh, very, uh, very detailed program you've chopped out for yourself uh, as you take the leadership. Uh, as someone who's uh, chosen or is in favor of a middle path uh, on the uh, Tibet, the Sino-Tibet issue, uh, how do you see uh, the approach towards uh, the Chinese government, which has not held formal talks for uh, over a decade now. Uh, do you think uh, they are amenable to any talks now? Because uh, given that Xi Jinping, uh, President Xi Jinping is a hardliner and has um, sort of uh, become a, a stronger nationalist, uh, if I may say so. Uh, do you think there is any uh, hope of uh, those talks being revived? Or you, uh, you have... Uh, uh, no hopes really. What What is your view? He always remained very confident uh, and positive about the outcome because uh, uh, as in Buddhist thinking, uh, we know uh, that everything is impermanent. Uh, change is the only constant. So the Chinese Communist Party, however strong they are right now, uh, cannot remain that strong forever. So there will be a time but uh, it's difficult to say what time or when these things will happen. Um, all I can say is I don't have a ma magic wand to uh, resolve this issue by myself. Uh, I, uh, we all believe in, the, in humanity, so I also like to believe that the, the present Chinese leadership, uh, who are supposedly quite hardliner, uh, just as in other countries also, you always also have soft liners. So we really hope that common sense prevails on the Chinese leadership and uh, they work towards resolving uh, national issues, not just the Tibetan issue, but also Uyghur issue and uh, Mongolian issue, so that uh, there is no, so that the China can command uh, moral power uh, on on top of the military and political and you know economic power they enjoy the only thing they lack is moral power so we would really expect the chinese leadership to be wise enough to uh, take the right course uh, not just with the tibetans but also with its immediate neighbors uh, and uh, other important countries around the world because right now what they are doing doesn't seem to be the right path Absolutely. In fact, uh, as, as we speak, there is this uh, comment which has come from one of the viewers and there he's liked this comment of yours that there is uh, impermanence. Uh, the Buddhist way is about uh, impermanence, you know, there is. Uh, so I think uh, you hit the, hit the right chord. It also reminds me of my uh, interview with um, His, uh, His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama in January 2020 uh, in Bodh Gaya, where he said that the Chinese may uh, even choose my successor. Uh, but uh, it will have no credibility. Uh, in fact, as you can see, that uh, visual is playing out. Uh, he said that uh, nobody will uh, take uh, that chosen successor by the Chinese uh, seriously, not the Tibetan people, not the people who uh, support the Tibetan cause. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, you are carrying forward that same philosophy. Uh, but there are uh, other critics and other people who are worried about uh, the situation in Tibet. They say time is running out for Tibet and uh, therefore it has to be, whatever has to be done has to be done immediately. Do you think uh, uh, 
you do you ever feel despaired about uh, time running out or you know that the chinese are so strong that it might take um, a lot of effort from the world but the world is not really stepping up to do what they should do uh, in in the measure that they should do is waking up now uh, so um when we say we uh, we don't have much time uh, the question revolves around uh, china's policies and programs particularly to do with uh, uh, demographic aggression through which uh, the a kind of uh, cultural genocide is taking place inside tibet so that is also one of the reason why we keep uh, following the middle way approach because i keep telling my people that uh, you know uh another 20 30 40 years down the line if we are not able to return back to tibet uh forget about independence even autonomy may not make sense when uh, tibet is completely overwhelmed by a han majority community uh, over uh, the uh, minority tibetan nationalities it's a very very uh, uh concerning situation for us indeed in fact uh, uh, there is a question from one of the audience and i am sort of uh, going to mix it up with my questions uh, ma tara uh, she is a lady uh, she is saying i am interested to know what the sikyong uh, views on the massive infrastructure development by china in tibet especially the dams of the himalayan rivers i think uh, you will have to uh, sort of uh, satisfy the viewer's question what do you think about the infrastructure development absolutely absolutely um we are not against development but development has to be sustainable uh that is the uh, reason why uh, we have been pointing out to not just uh, china but also the whole world that the environmental situation inside tibet does not concern only the tibetans it affects the whole region pakistan india bangladesh burma laos cambodia thailand vietnam including china uh from where uh, the rivers flow that is why tibet is also known as the fountain of asian rivers therefore uh building dams too many dams one or two dams may be acceptable but you are talking about several dozens of dams on one single river so that is a manipulation of uh, uh hydro resources and china also does not share hydrological data with the neighboring countries so the downstream countries don't have enough idea about what's going to happen to them when there is flood they are over flooded when there is no water come because of the damming uh today we are political refugees but because of china's uh, uh, damming projects inside tibet now we see many more environmental refugees in the downstream countries people lost their livelihood uh people have to change their lifestyle to you know make another living earlier they were dependent on the rivers that flow from tibet so these are very uh, uh important issues uh i think uh, the us has just woken up to that so they are looking at the mekong uh, tributaries the countries that mekong flows through that similarly uh i think uh, pakistan and india and uh, and other countries also should be concerned uh, there is some level of uh, understanding on this matter but it this needs lot more amplification and also understanding of the situation as to how this is going to affect the livelihood to people downstream then the downstream countries are not just small uh, small nations they are highly densely populated nations in the world so it's very very concerning particularly damming and the environmental situation the fragile environmental situation inside tibet i think very well put so in well so context i have one more question about the uh, the what i call the hanization of uh, tibet i think you have also spoken about it your other uh, tibetans have spoken about it uh, is it uh, only about uh, destroying culture it's also about subjugation uh, of uh, religion and despite the fact that as uh, his holiness said uh, again in the interview uh, in january 2020 that you would be surprised and i was really surprised he said there are more people adopting uh, buddhism amongst the han chinese so is there a, a way that uh, buddhist the inherent strength of buddhism will overcome the hanization uh, that's happening in tibet 
It depends again on the time factor as to when we can go back or not. Uh, you call it Hunization, uh, some call it Sinification, some call it Sinicization, uh, whatever term you use, uh, the policies and the programs of the Chinese government are aimed only, you know, whenever there's a problem, they talk about development, development, development. They believe that development can resolve all human miseries, which is not true, because that is only the physical aspect of it. What is more important is the mental aspect of human beings. So Tibetans have been practicing Buddhism for 1,000, more than 1,300 years, but Buddhism went to China much before it came to Tibet. Uh, we, of course, uh, got it directly from India, but then uh, uh, the Buddhism was much more prevalent in China. Therefore, in the vacuum that followed communist China and uh, the, the uh, you know, deprivation of people from practicing their uh, spirituality, uh, there, not, there is now a revival, uh, a sense of revival, uh, despite all the restrictions. And a lot more people are paying a lot more attention to Tibetan Buddhism, which is a lineage of the Mahayana Nalanda tradition of Buddhism. And uh, now people who have some sense, who have an understanding, uh, realize that Tibetan Buddhism is not what the Westerners earlier used to call as Lamaism. Uh, but that is uh, much more uh, to do with the scientific approach of living. It is a way of life, a uh, philosophy that uh, deals with psychology, um, and quantum physics and all that. So uh, it's, it's good that Chinese are showing interest in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the uh, nation tries to subjugate. So all the terms that use, whether it's subjugation or whatever, is uh, very much relevant in this case. But much more so, I uh, definitely feel that the policies and programs that reflects from the Chinese government side amounts to cultural genocide. Because then you are destroying Tibetan Buddhism, you are destroying Tibetan language, everything to do with Tibetan national identity. So if that happens, that is definitely cultural genocide. Indeed. In fact, one of the, one of the aspects of that uh, cultural genocide uh, that you spoke about could also be the Chinese insistence on the, on the fact that they want to uh, select the successor to uh, His Holiness. And in that sense, um, they are saying that uh, the Tibetans in exile have no right to choose or the, uh, His Holiness has no right to choose his successor. We will do it. Uh, how will you resolve that and what will happen? Uh, you know, the question that is in the minds of the, uh, the supporters of Tibetan cause and Buddhism is that what after His Holiness? And that question, I'm sure, is dogging everyone who's concerned with Tibet. What do you have to say to that? Have to say to that? I think uh, one, one thing that the, uh, uh, the uh, watchers should understand is that uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism uh, and uh, the uh, concept of reincarnation uh, is purely uh, Tibetan Buddhist in nature and it's a, a highly spiritual thing. The relationships that uh, historically we enjoyed with the Mongols was priest-patron relationship and we had very little to do with the Ming dynasty that is wholly Chinese. But then when the Manchus came in again, we enjoyed a certain level of uh, priest-patron relationship. But after 1959 or 51 from the 17 point agreement onwards, it is communist China. at least the Chinese emperors to, with whom we had relations were Buddhist. Uh, even then, their interference in the uh, Buddhist uh, uh, structure of Tibet, uh, in Tibet was very, very minimal. What China claims in the white paper about reincarnation is not wholly true. So uh, right now the situation is you have a communist government who does not believe in religion, who are atheist, uh, and trying to interfere in the reincarnation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And the 14th His Holiness the Dalai Lama is still very much living in India. Uh, we are striving to uh, ask or urge the Chinese government to invite him to visit China and Tibet. Uh, while they are not bothered about the well-being of the 14th Dalai Lama and his people, then why should, we, why should they be bothered about the 15th Dalai Lama? It's obvious that they want to use it as a political tool, 
uh, and I believe I, I I would like to believe that they have learned their lesson from selecting their own pension lama, who is not respected by Tibetans anywhere in the world, to live alone uh, inside Tibet. So those lessons uh, need to be learned. And uh, if the Chinese, uh, his, I, I, I'm sure you must have asked the same question to His Holiness when you interviewed him. And uh, I remember His Holiness saying in jest that uh, if the Chinese leadership is really concerned about the reincarnation issue, they should look for Mao Zedong's reincarnation first, <laughs> Deng Xiaoping's reincarnation second, and then maybe the Dalai Lama. So unless you believe in the system, uh, if you want to use it only as a political tool to subjugate the Tibetans or try to reinforce their power on the Tibetans, that is not definite. It's not going to be a lasting solution. The, if you want to find a solution, then it has to be lasting that meets the aspiration of the Tibetan people. Indeed. So in that context, uh, how do you see uh, the role of the Western nations, especially uh, the United States? Uh, there is an increasing... Um, uh, sort of despair amongst uh, the Tibet watchers that Western uh, leaders are now shying away from uh, meeting His Holiness uh, whenever he visits. Uh, his uh, space for uh, more uh, meetings is uh, getting uh, constricted. Uh, is there uh, any uh, expectations from the Western nations and, of course, uh, India? What would be your expectation? My question in two parts Western expectation, I mean, Western support and Indian support. Yeah, Shai Desi is also asking the same question. Uh, yes, yes, that's why uh, I thought that. Yeah. Now, uh, now compared to uh, the situation earlier and now, if uh, the pandemic is not happening right now, if his, whole, if his holiness had been a little younger right now, then I'm sure there would be many more people wanting to meet him uh, under the current circumstances when China's belligerence is creating a lot of problems with uh, almost every country in the world, not just in its immediate neighborhood, uh, but also in the South China Sea and the Europe, European Union and US, everywhere. So uh, there is a, a sense of realization that uh, uh, as uh, we, uh, uh, the the more the Western nations engage with the Chinese government, uh, they would be, the, the Chinese government uh, would become more responsible. Uh, that has not happened. Uh, the expectations were completely uh, uh, not as per uh, the Western nations wished. Uh, therefore, today uh, there is a definite realization if you base the uh, reaction from the U.S. government, uh, not just the immediate uh, past president, but even presidents before that. And now Biden's administration is also uh, quite strong on, on, on China. Uh, the very fact that uh, Secretary Blinken wished the Tibetans on Tibetan New Year, that's a first, uh, that has never happened before. And uh, Nick Price, uh, the spokesperson of the uh, State Department, uh, wishing us on our electoral success. Um, and uh, committing uh, future cooperation, uh, those are also a first. So uh, we are also, we are, in fact, uh, fortunately, since 1987, when His Holiness, the U.S. Congress, for the f first time in uh, to the Human Rights Caucus about the Five Point Peace Plan, uh, there has been a steady increase in the support for uh, Tibet in the United States, uh, both from the administration, the White House as well as the Congress. So uh, we are very fortunate to have bipartisan, bicameral support in the United States. And we are really looking forward to take this, um, uh, take some step forwards as to how to align uh, policies of uh, United States along with other allies uh, who enjoy the same uh, universal values of freedom, democracy, justice, and human rights. Uh, that will be one step that I'm really looking forward to work with the United States government. Uh, I think we are making headway there. Uh, there are a lot of signals, uh, pointers to that. And in India, uh, of course, India is uh, the nation who understands the Tibet issue from the beginning 
till now i don't know about what chinese call as time immemorial when that <laughs> began or when uh, when should we count from there but at least from the time that india and tibet had cultural religious relationship uh, we were mentally much more closer to china, uh, india than any other country therefore uh, the very reason that uh, his holiness decided to come to india not any other country to seek refuge and the tibetans being very well received by the tibet uh, by the indian people as well as the uh, uh, indian government uh, successive governments uh, now irrespective of how strong they were at one time or not now of course uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, columns not a lot of new writings expressing uh, people who were in power position expressing uh, their concern about uh, the uh, china's tibet, india's policy towards uh, tibet and china and uh, there is a deep down understanding be only because of china's belligerence and their action that uh, tibetan issue uh, cannot be just used as a leverage a political or diplomatic leverage but this needs to be resolved if there has to be peace in the region not just we are not just talking about tibet or central asia we are talking about the whole south asia and the whole geostrategic geopolitical region as you can see there's this question from anil haske he talks about uh, last year's crisis in ladakh the ongoing <clears throat> standoff if you want to call it or the uh, tension there in eastern ladakh so uh, he is asking whether uh, the aim is uh, something else uh, rather than uh, an aggression against india uh, what's your view on that i have been uh, whenever we have discussions about these issues i have been speaking to my friends that china will definitely create flash points around the world particularly around around its neighborhood so india is uh, that is also the reason why after so many rounds of dialogue china has not resolved this issue uh, border issue with tibet uh, with with india which was uh, india tibet border even now we have indian tibetan border yes. police force yes. so uh, these uh, only the only reason i can think of you know building villages in su such remote places uh, which are very difficult to be uh, accessible uh you know in in doklam we are talking about now in galwan all this aggression is just to create flash points during this pandemic if there are social unrest within china then they could say oh india is attacking us you know <laughs> instead it's of saying we attack very, india very, so that builds, builds nationalism in chinese yes, people yes. and uh, because of the nationalism the communists may not fall uh, that is the only reason i can think of uh, from my experience for china's belligerence on the Indeed, indian border uh, yes I, i agree fully with you and um, i can only see that uh, you have a task on hand uh, having taken over the leadership now and of course uh, his holiness is always there to guide uh, in uh, the larger framework really and uh, as i can see uh, there's the support that the tibetan cause and uh, buddhism enjoys across the world uh, is only increasing i think that should worry the chinese more than anything else uh, so on that note i want to thank you for uh, giving me the time and giving strat news global this opportunity to uh, have a discussion with you uh, rather than an interview and i think uh, hopefully we'll have uh, more occasions going forward but uh, we wish you all the best in your um, tell you uh, that you are now going to be the president of the central tibetan administration you are the president of the central tibetan administration and we wish a lot of uh, good things happen during your tenure uh, on that note let me thank you and all our viewers who asked so the asked questions, questions. Uh, we wish to uh, congratulate you once again and uh, hope to see you sometime soon thank you very much for your time thank you, for your time. Thank, you. thank you so much nitin for your Thanks. time for inviting me and to spread the word of tibet thank you so much thank you pleasure is mine pleasure is mine thank you so viewers thank you for joining in large numbers and asking the questions as you know uh, you know all our social media handles uh, you know uh, where to uh, go for subscription uh, in case you want uh, to subscribe to our channel and of course you know where to press the bell icon to uh, get all the alerts and all the information do keep sending feedback and comments 
uh, we will uh, continue to bring uh, such programs to you and of course uh, the important geo strategic geo political and geo economic uh, issues that we'll continue to discuss on strat news global until the next time it's good bye Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I am Surya Gangad. Many of you will be familiar with my guest, Dr. Lobsan Sange, the uh, Sikyon of the Central Tibetan Administration in India. Uh, he is a familiar figure to those of you who follow Tibetan affairs and uh, more so the affairs of uh, the Tibetans in India who are in exile from their homeland. And uh, Dr. Sange, welcome. Thank you, Surya ji. Sir, uh, let me get straight to the point. Uh, you've had a round of elections for the new uh, uh, Sikyong. Uh, can you update us on what uh, what is left now? What's left to happen now? Uh, Tibetans all over the world uh, voted um, in the first round, where they voted for nominees of the Sikyong or the president of CTA, and also the members of parliament. So the first round is done. Now the second round is on uh, April 11th. So we have two candidates for the uh, Sikyong position and you know many other candidates uh, for the members of parliament, and including uh, representatives of uh, uh, Tibetans in Europe, North America, and Australia, New Zealand. You know, so you know, so Tibetans in around 30 some countries uh, will be voting on single day. That's my uh, April 11th. Uh, to elect uh, our next president of CTA and members of parliament. And um, who are the um, likely candidates? Is it going to change very much the current policies uh, of, uh, that you have been following all these years? And both the candidates have you know, uh, declared their uh, pledge uh, to follow the middle way policy. So that means the policy of middle way approach will uh, remain. And I'm sure in the tactics and strategy, there might be differences and there might be differences in their approaches and their personalities. Otherwise, the middle way approach, which is our policy to seek genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people in Tibet, uh, will remain the same. So what are these um, elections designed to achieve? Is it to build up? The Tibetan uh, civil administration, the political structure, etc., for something in the future? Now, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama devolved his political authority in 2011, he wanted to separate the church and the state. So, I was elected in 2011 to take over the responsibilities of political and administrative matters because he would like to see the Tibetan freedom movement moving forward, elected and led by, you know. Uh, the person you know who uh, is voted by the Tibetan people, so that was his vision, um, and then accordingly uh, we are marching forward. Even though we are in exile, the Tibetans are scattered in you know, thirty plus countries, but we all come together as Tibetans to show our solidarity, to strengthen our organization, and to assert and participate. You know. Uh, in the democratic process. So we want to say that we are as democratic as India or Nepal or Europe or America. So we are one of the partners and a successful one uh, compared to, you know, uh, some countries. And what would you define as your major achievements, sir? Well, you know, every politician will say I fulfill all the promises I made. So I should not be saying uh, as such, you know, to normally, you know. But, uh, you know, I'm uh, pretty content uh, with where I am, you know. All the things actually I did, you know, say things I would do. I did, I think, 90% uh, of it. And then many more other things that I've not done. So fundraising, uh, you know, creating uh, awareness of Tibet at the global scale. And most importantly, the U.S. Congress passed the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, which was signed by the president. Uh, now it has become a law in America to support Tibet. So in that law, uh, Central Tibet Administration, which I had, is also acknowledged. And my position is also acknowledged. Now, when I got elected, there was no country 
acknowledged my position or the Tibetan administration. Now it's acknowledged by, you know, legally acknowledged by the U.S. government. So that's politically. And India also, you know, we have passed Tibetan Rehabilitation uh, Policy Act, which is very, very helpful to uh, Tibetans. So, so and so forth. The num- uh, and the number one priority uh, for me was education because I grew up as a refugee with a humble, you know, upbringing with nothing much uh, to uh, eat or share. Uh, with education, I, you know, managed to stand on my own feet. Now, in the last 10 years, education has, you know, improved leaps and bounds that everybody uh, agrees. So, you know, these are the few things I can share. Now, let's look at uh, developments in uh, China, in China, in the Tibetan occup- in uh, Chinese occupied Tibet. Uh, the um, Gyalsen Norbu, the Beijing appointed Panchen Lama, recently talked about the sinicization of uh, Buddhism in Tibet. Uh, what does it mean? This is a very dangerous signal because, you know, Buddhism is the heart and core or the, you know, basic foundation of Tibetan civilization and Tibetan identity. When you sinicize Buddhism, you are taking the Tibetan narrative out of Buddhism. For example, when we teach Tibetan Buddhism in Tibet, we say, you know, the lots of us, the great scholars, the translators brought Buddhism from India to Tibet in 7th and 8th centuries, and it has a lot of Tibetan elements, Tibetan stories, Tibetan struggle, Tibetan contribution, right? So when you synthesize it, they want to translate all the Tibetan Buddhist texts in Chinese and teach Buddhism in Chinese. So they want to simply teach, let's say, Four Noble Truths, you know, or Eightfold Path, or compassion and, you know, a kindness, uh, without the Tibetan context, without the Tibetan elements. So with that, you take the Tibetan feel, the Tibetan passion, Tibetan identity, and Tibetan nationalism, you know. So this is how they want to suck the air or the force of, uh, you know, uh, Tibetan civilization without the Tibetanness. Uh, so they want to, you know, make our uh, civilization shallow and make our identity, you know, um, a very, you know, un-Tibetan or so far away from Tibetan or rather sinicize or make Chinese. So this is mm-hmm. a very uh, dangerous uh, policy. So to hear him say that, whether he actually said it or not, but to have his quote, uh, is very uh, disappointing, uh, as well as, you know, uh, very uh, frightening. Is this an acknowledgement of the fact that uh, perhaps Buddhism is also growing among the Han Chinese, and therefore the uh, Communist Party sees a need to control the uh, growth and direction of this uh, religion? You know, I think it's a realization that in 1960s, 98% 98% of monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99% of monks and nuns were destroyed. And almost 90% of Tibetan scriptures were burned, tankas were burned, you know, statues were removed, stolen, right? So that after physical destruction of any element of Buddhism in Tibet, they thought communism prevailed, right? But after 60 years, they realized that, thanks to the government of India, We have rebuilt our monasteries and revived Buddhism and Buddhist civilization back in India and all over the world and back in Tibet. And also the largest Buddhist country, ironically, is China with three to four hundred culturally Buddhist Chinese. So Buddhism in China has more members than the Communist Party of China, you know, which has around 82 million members. Right. So. You know, by that account, His Holiness Dalai Lama has more members, you know, supporting him, spiritually speaking, than the Communist Party. Right? So now they want to sinicize Buddhism. They see that as a threat. So at the very get go, they destroyed our monasteries and nunneries because they saw this as a major threat. Even now, they see it as a threat. So actually, the Chinese leaders should realize that religion and spirituality is a matter of heart and mind. No bombs and guns can destroy spirituality, right? So rather you must, you must make amends and find a solution to live with the spirituality, which is at the core of Tibetans, Tibetan people, also the general Asian civilization, right? So 
yes, this is an acknowledgement that after 60 years, they have failed to change the hearts and minds of Tibetan people. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it possible that this could also be a positive development? Because uh, if much of China becomes uh, Buddhist in its outlook and its, uh, you know, uh, in its, uh, perhaps the politics could also change. The Communist Party could also change. Is that, is that something which you see as um, uh, possible? Now, if you go back to history, right, the greatest civilization of China and the longest dynasty was Tang Dynasty, a Buddhist dynasty, and the, yeah. that they consider the great civilization. And Tibet also, uh, the, the height of Tibetan empire coincides with the Tang Dynasty. You know? So Buddhism could bring that civilizational changes within China. And that, you know, brings, you know, hopefully peace and harmony in whole of Asia as well, primarily because if they become Buddhist, they look at India very respectfully because India is the land where, where Buddhism was born, right? So even the Tibetan scriptures, when the lamas and we all read our scriptures, we start with homage to the land of, you know, the holy land of India, you know, so that much respect is there. So for civilizational changes in China, Buddhism will be a crucial element. So yes, to have Buddhism spread all over China is a good thing, but they want to cut up the source or the most, uh, what do you call, most sophisticated, systematic Buddhist practice is in the Tibetan Buddhist world, not in China. You know, for example, what Buddha said and his closest disciples said are in 300 some volumes. It's only in Tibetan language. In Chinese, you have two dozen volumes, or in India, or Thailand, or Sri Lanka, you name any of the Buddhist countries, they have a dozen or two dozen volumes. Only in Tibetan language, we have 300 plus volumes, you know. Mm -hmm. So our civilization is very rich. Understanding of Buddhism is richest in the Tibetan world. So that's the treasure trove they want to, you know, undermine and, you know, dilute. Now, Tibet has uh, seen various uh, phases of uh, oppression and uh, cultural crackdowns in the past. Uh, given what's happening in Xinjiang to the Uyghurs, uh, do you, uh, is this, what, what are the reports you're getting from the current situation in Tibet? Is it getting worse? Is it better? What is the reports you have? It's getting worse because, you know, we were the patient number one. Because the party secretary of Xinjiang was the party secretary of Tibet Autonomous Region, where he executed all the policies of culture genocide, the labor camps, and all that, right? The technological surveillance and restrictions, all were imposed on Tibetans, which, you know, took him five plus years, which he executed in year or two in Xinjiang. So the glaring violation was more prominent, and international media caught hold of it, and that's why the genocide is taking place in Tibet. It, it, it's taking place in Xinjiang, and everybody knows it, right? So yes, what happened in Tibet was replicated in Xinjiang, and what is happening in Xinjiang is replicated back in Tibet. So situation is getting from bad to worse. That's why the Freedom House, which measures in the Freedom Index all over the world, listed Tibet as the least free region in the whole world, similar to Syria, for six years in a row. So our situation is very grim. So you would say the current uh, Xi Jinping administration is far more harsh on minorities than perhaps earlier administrations? Uh, clearly. Now, our situation is terribly bad. Okay, I mean, you, you know, you, it can't get worse. Uh, but yes, uh, presently, you know, it's much, you know, uh, worse than before. So when we think it can't get worse than this, so, you know, it's getting more worse. So yes, Situation has gone from bad to worse, for sure now. So what is the world doing about it? What is India doing about it? Do you see India taking a more proactive stance on this or is it hands off? Now, India has, you know, done the most for Tibetan people. I mean, by far, the largest number of Tibetans are in India. It's Solon is there, I in India. Tibetan administration based in India. So for sure. Now the U.S. government, as I said, has passed the Tibet Policy and Support Act. Now it's a law to support Tibet. So during the pandemic, when the Republicans, Democrats were not necessarily getting along, right, they came together and passed the bill, sending a clear signal to the whole world, including to Beijing, 
that Tibet is very important. Now, similarly, you know, the media coverage about Tibet, you know, uh, last summer and since then has been much more in India and the growing awareness about Tibet also is increasing in India. At least there's a public discourse, so which is, you know, welcome because we have been saying this for the last 60 years. What happened to Tibet would happen to you. That includes India. And yeah. people always thought, okay, what happened to Tibetans is a sad thing, but we can somehow get along with Chinese and we can somehow, you know, settle this border issue. But now the border incursion has only increased and the tension has only increased because we have all along said that. It has always been a border between Tibet and India and it was a peaceful border for centuries. Yeah. The day you said it's a border between India and China, you have essentially given an invitation to Chinese troops to come to the border because if you ask them, why are you here? They say, well, you say it's China's border. I'm here because you said so, right? Now, you know, the, all these disputes are happening. So now there's growing awareness that if you want to solve your challenges with China, you have to address the issue of Tibet. There is no way around it. You know, so when the Indian troops at the border, when they cross over, they're not going to China, they're going to Tibet. You yeah. meet Tibetan-speaking people. By learning, you know, Chinese uh, language and Chinese numbers is not going to help you when you cross the border because they are Tibetans, right? Yeah. So, you know, we all need to realize that, that what happened to Tibet is happening you know, at the border and with the neighbors of India as well. Mm -hmm. Is there any assessment you have made since we are talking about the clashes in the dark? Uh, any, any assessment you've made as to why China did this? You know, expansionism, uh, you know, has been centuries-old policy of imperial China to you know, nationalist China to uh, communist China. So, you know, when they occupied Tibet also, they said the same thing, you know. Oh, you know, uh, Tibetans are barbarians. I mean, Han Chinese, they're the, the, you know, the uh, center of the universe, Tungo, right? And all the people in the periphery are barbarians. They, honor, they ought to be civilized. That's how they occupy Tibet and Mongolia and Xinjiang. Now they are continuing the expansionist design because they have the uh, uh, military hardware and, uh, you know, uh, money to spend. Uh, so that's what's happening. And 60 years ago, they said the same thing. Let's occupy Tibet, is the palm, and then let's go after five fingers. So Ladakh, Nepal, uh, you know, Bhutan, Sikkim, and Arunachal are the five fingers, and Himachal and Uttarakhand are also uh, in the middle, right? So they are coming out of five fingers after the occupation of Tibet. And we have been saying it for the last 60 years, and no one, um, you know, uh, you know, gave us uh, much tra traction. But since the Galvan, you know, tragic incident, People are waking up and saying, actually, this is what's happening. But Dr. Sange, isn't it true that uh, the world has been curiously silent and inactive on Tibet, no matter what the Americans may have done now? Um, you know, uh, largely India and the world have been kind of hands-off on Tibet. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that the case? Um, yes, I think, you know, for, for some decades, you know, it was like, okay, what happened to Tibet was a sad thing, but we'll hands off and we will deal diplomatically and economically with China, somehow we'll get along. But the assertiveness of China with all the neighboring countries, right, and assertiveness, what they call wolf <laughs> diplomacy, you know, all that, yeah. right, the China dream, they want to dominate the world ideologically, right, economically, militarily and polit politically. So this growing realization at various capitals around the world have realized that, oh, perhaps we made a mistake by being hands-off on Tibet. So we should be hands-on with Tibetans, right? So it, I mean, it is happening. We hope that it's, you know, it, it happens much more assertively and strongly and much more vocally. The fact that it's happening uh, is a positive indication. So what is it that you would like to see the world do more? Or even India, what is the advice you would give India? You know, Tibet, you know, in the recent uh, U.S.-China uh, meeting at Alaska, uh, China said Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang are the core issues, right? Yeah. 
the India included in other countries should also say yes, Tibet is also a core issue for us and we should put it on the table and find a solution, a peaceful solution, a win-win solution for China and for Tibet. So that's how we should approach, right? So this is, you know, what we like to see, you know, countries all over the world to stand up with Tibetans for justice, for truth, for our basic human rights and freedom. Mm -hmm. Do you still have Tibetans coming over from there to India? Are they able to cross borders and make it make it here? Unfortunately, very few manage to come because they have clamped down, um, you know, on the border of Nepal. So from the Tibet side, Chinese troops are manning it, and from the Nepal side, Nepali troops are manning it. But they are trained, and you know, uh, what do you call? And uh, they have. Or the workforce to work together to chase away or you know arrest anyone crossing over from Tibet. Escape from Tibet to India is further down. So, in that sense, is your flow of information from Tibet uh, intelligence uh, contacts with the Tibetan uh, living there in Tibet? It has reduced. Yes, it has reduced. That's true. Uh, it's a challenge for us. But then now, you know, but there are Tibetans uh, in various countries around the world, you know, sometimes they get to talk to each other and we get, you know, some information. Still. Mm -hmm. Last question, Dr. Sange. What is it that you plan to do now since you are moving on? Uh, what are your uh, plans about, uh, you know, what you want to do? Uh, obviously, you want to be in the area of Tibet, but what do you want to do? Yeah, I think I'm not finalized as of now. When I was an academic before, at Harvard University, so I might go back, you know. Um, but then I will have some role in, in the Tibetan political world because given the experience that I have, I want to continue to serve the uh, Tibetan cause. But also as a, also as a father uh, to a young daughter, uh, I, I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be near her than being an absentee father for so long. So I have to play my father's role and also Tibetan patriots, so I'll combine the two, and I will be nomadic, so, you know, I will be you know, all yeah. over the world, including in India. So, uh, Dr. Sange, uh, good luck and good fortune in your endeavors ahead, and uh, thank you for speaking to Strike News Global. Uh, pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and uh, um, thank you for giving me this, you know, privilege. A pleasure, sir. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Parul Chandra and with me today is Dr. Lopsang Sange. Dr. Sange is the president of the Central Tibetan Administration, more commonly known as the Tibetan government in exile. Dr. Sange, before he became a president of the CTA, was the prime minister of uh, the Tibetan government in exile. He has been spearheading the Tibetan cause for uh, nearly a decade now. And uh, he is also the political successor of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Uh, welcome to Strat News Global, uh, Dr. Sange. Pleasure to have you with us. Good to see you again. Yes, we meet, I think, just about, say, we met about seven or eight months ago. But uh, currently we meet in very, uh, say, in, in, a, in a time when... Uh, ties between China and India are very tense. 20 Indian soldiers have been brutally killed by the PLA troops in uh, eastern Ladakh. And uh, ties seem to be spiraling downwards between uh, New Delhi and Beijing. Uh, what do you make of the current aggressive moves by China? Well, you know, China has been quite aggressive uh, yes. at the border for many years now, initially with border incursions of a few hundreds to four to five hundreds now. And Doklam in 2017 was the major flashpoint where Indian and Chinese troops came face to face, right? But there was no um, physical violence, and at least there was no casualties. But this time, 
So there is, you know, casualties of, you know, 20 Indian Jawans who died. So this is an escalation. You know, I just feel that one thing is leading to another, and I think this will escalate more and more. That's my worry. Uh, yes, there is certainly escalation uh, of uh, the tensions, uh, but uh, really, do you think that uh, this is part of uh, Beijing's uh, expansionist policies in, in the region? They have shown similar tendencies in the South China Sea, but what about these recent uh, face-offs, say, in Ladakh, in, in Sikkim also? What would you say to all this? You know, China is an empire and it has an expansionist policy. Yeah. So Tibet was occupied, Inner Mongolia was occupied, Xinjiang was occupied, part of the expansionist policy. Now they're expanding it further and then hence they're encroaching into Indian territories, Nepal, you know, Bhutan and South China Sea, East China Sea, with all the neighboring countries of China all of them have one issue, incursion and expansion from the Chinese side towards or in the territories of all these countries. So what you see in Ladakh is part of the greater game plan of expansionist policy. Yeah, uh, that, that's right. But given that China is indulging in all this, and uh, I did hear you speak about uh, what Chairman Mao Zedong had said many, many years ago, when he said that uh, China is, is the palm of the hand and uh, Ladakh, Nepal, uh, Bhutan, yes. uh, Arunachal, uh, and uh, all these, all these areas, Sikkim, yes, are all, uh, five you know, fingers. the five fingers. Yes. In the light of that statement, do you see this current uh, expansionism by China as part of the, the current Chinese uh, regime's uh, moves to really carry forward what Chairman Mao had said so many decades ago? Absolutely. I think, you know, um, if you study from 1949 onwards in 1960, 62 to 67, the flashpoint at this time, the Seichen Glacier under the occupation of China, which was, you know, uh, shared uh, or given away by Pakistan, it's part of that expansionist design, you know. So hence now 3,488 kilometers long border is there and they're encroaching, you know, on a daily basis uh, into Indian territories, and it's part of their expansion. So they got the palm, now they're coming up to five fingers. So they will persist. And hence, my worry is, you know, this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just the beginning. What do you think that India then needs to do to check or contain uh, China in its uh, expansionist moves? Now, you know, from military point of view, you can do certain things. You can, you know, strengthen the military hardware by, you know, strengthening military presence and building infrastructure in the whole uh, border areas, whole of the Himalayan region from Ladakh all the way to Arunachal Pradesh, right? And then you have to also strengthen the soft power, the culture, the civilization, the identity, the, uh, the uh, heritage of the Himalayan region should be respected and should be inculcated and cultivated and supported. That's very important, right? And then after all, you know, uh, till the issue of Tibet is resolved, mm -hmm. I think this will continue to happen. Because for thousands of years, it was a border between India and Tibet. Now it has become border, you know, of India and China because of occupied Tibet. And all these flashpoints, the tensions is happening. So hence, you know, till you address the issue of Tibet, it is going to, you know, remain as a flashpoint. You have said in the past uh, that uh, they first came for Tibet and now they're coming for India. Do you think that India needs to be more aggressive in terms of countering Chinese moves in the region? 
Um, well, India has no option because, you know, Chinese expansion is designed and incursion is not just at Ladakh, the whole of Himalayan belt. And if you look at all the neighboring countries, right, Nepal is under tremendous pressure, Bhutan is under pressure, Bangladesh is under pressure, Sri Lanka, Maldives and Pakistan is, you know, obviously is, uh, you know, what they call, uh, you know, all weather friends, right? Yes. So now India has to counter all these things, you know, to have the status and the respect of all the neighboring countries, immediate neighboring countries, and the, and, and the whole of Asia. Dr. Sanghi, now uh, another thing that I would like to ask you is uh, about uh, China's uh, One China policy. Now, India has always backed that policy. Given the current state of bilateral relations between New Delhi and Beijing, is it about time that India junked this policy? You know, one China policy was adopted by China for Taiwan issue, right? So um, now the representative of Taiwan, the ambassador of Taiwan to India is asking for a review and many people in Taiwan are asking for the review of one China policy, right? So Indian government should pay close heed to what the people of Taiwan are saying because they know the best and it mm -hmm. affects them the most, right? Yeah. So I think there has been several speeches being made by uh, Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen on this and their foreign ministers and the ambassadors. So yes, India should, you know, play, pay close attention to what Taiwan is saying on one China policy because mm -hmm. it affects them the most. Uh, and uh, uh, Indian government should consider what they're saying. And uh, another question that comes to mind is about the Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now, His Holiness has been in India for uh, nearly six decades and uh, India has been home to him as well as a very large Tibetan community. Now, it's often said that it's about time that India used the Dalai Lama card to good effect and in its favor against China. Is the time right, right now for India to do so? Well, you know, His Holiness doesn't need to be used by anyone. Yeah. His Holiness himself is a global figure, you know, yeah. and he's very wise and he's ahead of many global leaders around the world and he has his views and he shares it around the world, right? And mm -hmm. I think uh, he is one of the best ambassadors of India in advocating a Nalanda tradition, Indian secularism, right? And the greatness of India. So he has already been willingly and voluntarily uh, being uh, what he himself calls a proud, you know, son of India, right? So he has already done more than anyone can ask for. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, quite uh, uh, nicely spoken. Uh, Dr. Sange, now uh, let me bring you to the issue of Nepal. Uh, Nepal has been, uh, they have been increasing Chinese inroads into Nepal and also increasing reports about the persecution of the Tibetan community in Nepal, given that Nepal serves as a bridge between Tibet and India. What reports do you get about the, the condition of Tibetans in Nepal? No. Uh, Nepal and Tibet had very long relationship and very close relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, our cultural heritage with the people of the border of Nepal and Tibet are very similar. And historically, we enjoyed very good relationship. And, and on few occasions, there has been some uh, battles or war or invasions. But generally, for centuries, we have lived peacefully, you know, and with very cordial relationship. And if you listen to some of the old songs of Nepal, there are many mm -hmm. songs regarding Tibet. And people of Nepal know about Tibet, you know, more than many, country, many people around the world, right? Um, so that was the fact. And unfortunately, in recent times, under Chinese government pressure, uh, the yeah. Nepali government has to, you know, uh, 
adhere to or give concessions to on, uh, on the issue of Tibet and Tibetan people. So the Tibetan people in Nepal are facing uh, tremendous pressure, right? And mm -hmm. in fact, if you look at 1990s, maybe more than half have already left Nepal and gone out uh, to various countries around the world and some also to India, right? So they are uh, facing difficulties. Um, for example, Tibetans who, uh, who were born and brought up after 1990s are not even issued, you know, a residency card. So their identity also uh, is, you know, um, made uh, unnecessarily illegal and that their uh, livelihood and living condition difficult, which is mm -hmm. unfortunate. What are your views on uh, the national security law that uh, China has passed for Hong Kong? There have been protests lasting for many months now, and yet China has gone and uh, there have been protests for many months now, and yet uh, China has gone ahead and brought in this law. Uh, does it again speak of China's uh, aggressive and, uh, uh, you know, muscle flexing in the region? Yes, I think it reflects some kind of uh, nervousness, uh, insecurity within China. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, when the whole world is very busy uh, with this you know, coronavirus pandemic, the virus originated in Wuhan, the city of China, which everybody knows. And I think the attention is on coronavirus. And then they quickly passed the uh, national security law uh, on Hong Kong. And they're going ahead and implementing it, right? Mm -hmm. So, which is in violation of one country, two system and the basic law, which was, you know, provided to uh, Hong Kong and promised by the Chinese government that the basic freedom of Hong Kong uh, will be respected, right? Mm -hmm. So with this national security law, uh, now there will be more uh, regression of freedom and basic human rights of people in Hong Kong. So that's a fact. And it happened in Tibet. Whenever there is some kind of national security law is passed on the issue of Tibet, that means security prevails over human rights. So this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So with what already happened in Tibet is happening in Hong Kong, which is unfortunate. Yes. Uh, now, uh, let me bring you to uh, the issue of uh, Tibet itself. You have said, you have recently suggested, in fact, that the Chinese, if they want, they can hold a referendum in Tibet to find out uh, whether Tibetans there want to be a part of China or they want to be autonomous. But given the Chinese, again, the Chinese expansionist tendencies and the oppression in Tibet, do you think that the Chinese will ever, ever carry out a referendum in the region? Well, the Chinese government says that Tibetan mm -hmm. people in Tibet are content. They're very happy. Right? Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then what we say is let's have referendum and Tibetan people in Tibet choose whether they choose to be under Chinese leaders or Tibetan people, right, or Tibetan leaders. And we are absolutely confident that Tibetans in Tibet will vote to have Tibetan leader administer the region, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, counter argument we are making. So if Chinese government is very confident, then let's have a referendum and let people in Tibet decide. Whatever they choose, we will abide by it, you know. So mm -hmm. We are, again, uh, pretty confident that the Chinese government will not hold the referendum because they will lose that referendum. Yeah. Now, given that you've been leading the Tibetan cause for so many years and given of late uh, the very aggressive posturing by China in the region, in the subcontinent, as well as in the South China Sea, are you still hopeful that your demands for the Tibetan people and for autonomy will ever be conceded to by Beijing? Absolutely. Now, mm -hmm. Number one, the solidarity of Tibetan people inside Tibet. The younger generation's sense of Tibetan identity and embracing Tibetan culture, Tibetan language, Tibetan dresses, mm -hmm. Tibetan mindset is ever growing inside Tibet. And number two, the international awareness about the reality in Tibet is also increasing. And most importantly now, 
what the Chinese government is capable of, right, and how Chinese government is misleading the world on various mm -hmm. other issues is also coming to, in, coming out in the open, right? Mm -hmm. Hence, the combination of all these three things, internally Tibetans in Tibet being strong and regionally growing awareness about these incursions and the expansionist design and awareness about Tibet and China in general at the international level, all this combined together creates an environment where Chinese government will feel the pressure and mm -hmm. Tibetan people assert their identity. Hence, mm -hmm. we do feel the you know, autonomy for Tibetan people, genuine autonomy of Tibetan people mm -hmm. and basic rights of Tibetan people will be realized. Uh, one other quest question that comes to mind in the context of Tibet is uh, it's the, the growing militarization of the area by the Chinese. They've been building a lot of infrastructure on, on the border, again, to counter India, and uh, they've been building roads, railways, and airfields. Uh, now, given all this, you have also said that Tibet should be made a zone of peace, but doesn't that seem like a wishful thinking given the Chinese mind right now? No, from our side, it's not a wishful thinking. In fact, a historical mm -hmm. reality, when Tibet was independent, when Tibet mm -hmm. was the buffer zone between India and China, it was zone of peace. It was a demilitarized zone, and the border didn't have Indian army, you know, you know not even Indian policemen were needed to guard the border. Mm -hmm. And the travel between border of Tibet and India for Indian pilgrims to go to Mansarovo and Mount Kailash was like a free flow, right? Yes. And the Tibetan mm -hmm. traders coming to India and the Indian traders and especially the, uh, you know, um, what do we call Tibetan Muslims from Kashmir area going to Tibet were all open yes. and free. So mm -hmm. for thousands of years, Tibet was zone of peace and border was demilitarized zone. Mm -hmm. So in the last only 60 plus years, it has become militarized zone and Tibet also has been made into a, uh, you know, uh, you know, heavily militarized Tibetan plateau. Yes. So what we are saying is let's go back to history. It's a win-win for India. It's a win-win also for China because you don't need this, you know, incursions and tensions from all your neighboring countries. And uh, my final question for you, uh, Dr. Sange, now that uh, Indian and Chinese troops have been involved in, in a very violent uh, physical clash in, uh, in Eastern Ladakh and uh, left uh, 20 Indian soldiers dead, where do you see India-China ties headed? You know, when it comes to countries like uh, China, all the countries in the world have relationship. And relationship mm -hmm. is part cooperation and part competition, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So far, uh, India felt there is more cooperation and less competition. But now with the border incursions attention, it's pretty clear mm -hmm. on geopolitical factor, on economic factor and ideological factor, authoritarianism and democracy, there, you know, there are more competition than cooperation. So that's how India should perceive China, that mm -hmm. there will be more competition from China on all fronts. And similarly, India should be prepared to compete with China and cooperation you know, where it's possible. On that note, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sange, for sparing time and uh, talking to Strat News Global. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. Thank you. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates.
fondest memory of Tibet? Uh, just randomly roaming in the fields with my parents and just having fun and nothing else. Okay, I was born in a semi-nomadic family, uh, meaning you know we have both. We do farming. At the same time, so we have yaks and all things. So you know, my first memory, my one of the favorite memory of Tibet is you know my spending time on mountains, you know, looking after the yaks and things. This year, the, I've been asked to give the deliver the lecture. It's about the relation between India and Tibet between 1947 and 1962. That picture has been taken in 1951 when the Dalai Lama took refuge for a few months in uh, Chumbi Valley. Uh, the Indian uh, soldiers, they give him a guard, guard of honor and they are accompanying him. So it was 70, 80 soldiers, they couldn't uh, stop the Chinese or do anything like that, but it was a symbol of Indian presence in Tibet. There was trademarks. These trademarks were dedicated to one area in Uttarkhand or one area in Ladakh or one uh, area in Machal Pradesh. So every trader's tribe, clan, they would go to a trademark, stay several months, bring goods from uh, uh, Tibet in summer, and come back. And similarly, the tra tra Tibetan traders were coming in uh, what is today Uttarakhand. So that was extensive trade which slowly disappeared with the Chinese um, invasion. That is the Chinese propaganda that they, for immemorial ages, Times they say that they, they were in Tibet, that Tibet was part of China, which is and it's not true. But today, if you read the Chinese media, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of articles on archaeology. And they are doing what I call political archaeology. They want to prove that since uh, more than 5,000 years, uh, Tibet was part, part of, of China, which is not correct. And they, uh, they have just totally forgotten the, all the exchanges between Himalayan belt and uh, in particular in the central sector of the border in Uttarakhand or in Ladakh or in uh, Himachal Pradesh, uh, but also in Sikkim and uh, in the northeast. If you take the, our history of our religion, our culture, these are really inspired and taken from India itself. We practice Buddhism, and as you know, Buddhism started from India, the Buddha himself. And so, so the culture and the, the historical ties with India you know, helped us to, you know, add, to sort of, sort of uh, uh, counter our uh, sufferings. You know. it, it, it gives us more, uh, more uh, space, you know. the Dalai Lama, our uh, spiritual leader, because of him and uh, we have created our uh, Tibetan schools where we do learn our languages, Tibetan language, and and uh, we have Tibetan communities, Tibetan settlements, as you can see here around. So we keep our culture day to day, time to time. So till now we haven't forgot anything. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to the GIST on Strat News Global. Good evening, I'm Surya Gangadharan and welcome to another edition of the GIST. This evening I have with me Dr. Gyalo, 
Uh, he's a Canada-based uh, Tibetan uh, academic uh, sociologist uh, who was uh, teaching in China for many years, in fact in Yunnan University. And um, he has uh, been active in his years in Canada to uh, push the case of uh, China's colonization of Tibet, especially its cultural policies that are trying to rob Tibetans of their own heritage. Uh, he has also been active in the UN in, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, underscoring China's uh, human rights policies in Tibet uh, that are trying to marginalize the Tibetan language, uh, marginalize Tibetans and uh, other human rights abuses. So Dr. Gallo, welcome, glad to have you. Thank you for having me on your show. Dr. Gallo, let's begin first of all with a little background from you. I've kind of summed it up here. Okay, sure. But as an um, academic based in China, mm -hmm. uh, a Tibetan academic based in China, how was it working there? Uh, could you briefly give us a sense of how it was? As an academic uh, in Tibetan academic in China, uh, recently, particularly since the second term of the Xi Jinping's era, uh, there are many policies and uh, academic uh, research uh, got uh, very restricted. Um, and also the other policy as well. For example, they uh, shut down all the diaspora Tibetan office in from the county level to the central government level. Mm -hmm. That's all those um, carried out after the 2018, which means the second term of the Xi Jinping, yeah. So you would say there's been a hardening of policy on Tibet? Um, yes, some of the of their policies are hidden. They have a two types of policy, hidden policy and the ta policies on the table. So the hidden policies are implemented over the last uh, six decades. And the policy on the table, they're playing the game. And in the policy document, when you read it, it's, it's, there's no problem. <laughs> but mm. when they implemented the document down to the ground, then they play the double game, double game. So because nobody watching it, who is, how, they implement the policy in the way uh, it's a correct or not. Nobody watching it. Yeah. So the local authority uh, implement it uh, in the way that they want. Uh, mm. That's the situation. The hidden policy like um, education and the colonial boarding school and uh, economic and the language in education policy language in government system policy and uh, the cultural activity uh, carried out by the collective of the Tibetan people. Mm -hmm. They have all kind of restrictions. The, those restrictions are in the three levels, material restrictions and the structural restrictions and the, some of them we have the section sanctional uh, restriction. Mm -hmm. So all those three types of sanctions or uh, restrictions are carried out with their policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you made an interesting uh, remark about China's colonial uh, school system in Tibet. Could you describe exactly what this is and how it works? Um, yeah. Um, before until 1995, even my people, the Tibetan people, we couldn't realize the, what is the I, China's ideological conspiracy of it. So since 2000, uh, since 1995, we realized the something wrong. The teachers are teaching, students are studying, schools are running, hmm. but our society is in a, not in the progress. Yeah. So when, then we re think about what's wrong with our s education. So we realize then the education has a problem deeply pr 
has a problem with the curriculum. We analyze the cur curriculum, we analyze the policy, and then I think it is that I'm the first person who def academically defined um, the chi China's school education in Tibet is a colonial boarding school mm -hmm. because I applied the internationally accepted the scientific framework of the seven stages of the colonization to the Tibetan society. Mm -hmm. It perfectly fits the Tibetan situation, particularly the education system. That's the first. The second is the curricula. The limited the our culture and the knowledge in the curriculum system only with from 15 to 25 percentage mm -hmm. that's those two trends allow me to identify the education is under the fall of colonization mm -hmm. so i call the colonial education system mm -hmm. yeah. so basically they're not teaching tibetan culture and language as they should, and the focus is more on learning Mandarin, Chinese ways, and Chinese thinking. Uh, yes, well, earlier years, uh, it's, they gave us a little bit of space, but the, since Xi Jinping took a position in the China's uh, central government, then those opportunity and the chance are completely removed mm -hmm. from the system of the education. Um, what they demand is one culture, one nation, one language, mm -hmm. as a China. So under that kind of a notion, we don't have any space for our cultural language being practiced. Mm -hmm. So this is a, I think, the clearly we can see this is a China's top ideology, ideology of the cons ideological conspiracy yeah. uh, that's been uh, implementing and uh, practicing over the seven decades in Tibetan society. Mm -hmm. So our kids in who were in the uh, school system almost produced as a cheap labor. Okay. So before I claim this, um, before China claimed saying we liberated Tibet as a poor people mm. and uh, uh, putting them as a master of the, their own society. My conclusion is now they use uh, weaponize the education, the school system to turn our four generation as a cheap labor. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I now want to jump to the United Nations and the Universal Periodic Review. Now just briefly for our uh, viewers, the uh, UN carries out a human rights examination of its members every four years or so. And uh, this time it's China's turn. January, China is going to come under scrutiny. The question is for the treatment of Tibetans and Uyghurs and others also. Uh, the question is um, how rigorous is this um, review of the human rights situation in China and how um, transparent is China when it comes to giving details of how Tibetans are treated. Dr. Gallo, you've been dealing with this for some time. What is your sense? Yeah, um, that's the first time for me uh, I uh, attend the, those UN Geneva Summit last year. It is very clear. Um, as a village boy born in Tibet, in the east part of Tibet, uh, all the way up to last year's Geneva Summit, I saw how and what's in what the level of the deep uh, things that China line. Um, when I got the chance to meeting with those committee members, I told them well, the reason we are ha having the such great challenges in convincing those international institutions and organizations because the China's repetitive lying became a truth in mm -hmm. with those international community uh, organization and uh, institutions. So now it's a time for us to explain the truth of the situation inside Tibet. 
For example, particularly China's delegation lies about the number of the students in the boarding, mm -hmm. number of the boarding schools. They minimize the Tibetan, only refer to Tibetan autonomous region. Mm -hmm. That clearly for us is only one, uh, one third of the Tibetan region. Mm -hmm. What we're claiming is entire Tibetan which we have uh, Wuzhang, Kham, and Amdo. Yeah. So China divides those uh, regions into their four provinces. But they exclude those numbers. I see. Okay. So they obviously they exclude two thirds of the population's mm -hmm. uh, data mm -hmm. for the education uh, report. So of course there is a gap, mm -hmm. information, statistical gap there. So. This is, I think, that China in, intentionally playing the game, same as before. Mm -hmm. I think at this time we have our own people who have a deep, almost 30 years um, experience working, who working in the education system. Yeah. So now it's a time to show the truth, to justify the truth. Mm -hmm. Does the UN system allow um, a powerful country like China to be uh, questioned? Do they insist on proof? Do they, can they second uh, fact-finding team into Tibet? Um, they, they did. They, they asked the many committee, asked the many questions to the Chinese delegation. But the number of the question, key questions are uh, not be answered uh, because they don't have answers. They don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have an answer, there's no answer, obviously. So when they answer, which is a lie, their uh, false stat uh, statistic uh, information there, and also they sometimes they exaggerated mm -hmm. the situation uh, where the reason why they put the kids in the boarding school, they say, all Tibetan family, the community are living too far from the school system. Mm -hmm. It's obvious for me. I've been personally been to those uh, schools, place. I know how far, uh, how the so far the distance between school and a fam uh, community. It, that not the reason. Mm -hmm. China have a, such economic power; they can build the school beside every village, yeah. mm -hmm. but they did not do that. You know why? They wanted to use the school as a weapon to erase the Tibetan culture completely to assimilate Tibetan young generation that mix uh, Tibetan or no, has a, no any ability cap or capacity to do the resistance in the future. That's what they got, they're doing in the school system. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can, say this time, when there is um, a general international sentiment against China, yeah. do you think you'll be more successful in trying to persuade um, UN member nations to, you know, uh, put China on the mat? Of course, I think if you don't increase the pressure on China, then they will do whatever they have, yeah. the plan they make. Right, so you letting the like uh, the free water flowing everywhere. Yeah, but if you UN and the uh, member of the UN country who in together join together very strongly to increase the pressure on China, then that will have a good uh, res uh, result, I think, because according to the Chinese pro personality and the cultural characteristic. They listen to the power and the rich. Mm -hmm. They ignore <laughs> the poor people and the weaker group. Yeah, yeah. Always. When you see the, the views of the history of the China's culture, the way it is. Mm -hmm. So I learned this. You know, when I was in, um, in my university, I, when I was teaching, I had the chance to travel to Beijing with a Chinese uh, provincial um, officer. Mm -hmm. On the train, we got this interesting argument. He says, 
If you don't know the cultural figure, Chinese figure, you will have no food to eat. But if you don't know your Tibetan cultural figure, you still can be survived. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean that? <laughs> you know, the every, every angle of the life in the daily life basis, you face this kind of um, dilemma. dilemma all the time, all the time. So China is a, such a big country. They have a power. Now they're using their education system as a weapon. And they weaponize the school system to uh, annihilating mm -hmm. the other minority culture as well. For example, when I was in Yunnan, I traveled to, to borders or the border area mm -hmm. between Thailand, Myanmar, and the Yunnan priests. There are multiple ethnic, ethnic minorities. Yeah, yeah. They're also facing the same challenges, but they give up the hope. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then again, when you take a look at the Tibet, Mongolia, and the Uyghur, those minority area, minority region, minority are not a simple minority group. Mm -hmm. For example, Tibetan, when they joined the China, we signed the 17 point agreement. Yeah. We're not just simply join them, we have a roots, long historical roots. Mm -hmm. You're, you cannot uh, simply pull it out and then stop it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the way I see now. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect will happen during this review? Um, the review needed to be able to identify everywhere, everything they lined, mm -hmm. needed to pull out. Then let them correct it and then let them change it. You think that will happen? Um, if international community stand together strongly to increase the pressure, they will do it because they have to join the international community, right? So those pressures they are very powerful. They listen to power. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, so I think uh, based on my knowledge of the China, they will listen, they will listen. Mm -hmm. I think you're being optimistic, yeah. Yeah. but uh, let me go forward. Um, assuming China's cultural colonization continues, you yeah. know, yeah. and uh, do you expect that this could deepen some of the security issues that India is facing vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah, um, it's very clear uh, what China been planning for the long term. Um, when you in Tibet, when you have a chance, opportunity to practice Tibetan language and culture, then Tibet, the border with the India is safe. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine when let's, if we let them succeed it, the colonial boarding school system yeah. in Tibet, then the China will deploy, the, don't need to deploy the Chinese people to the border <laughs> area. Yeah. And that border area, the Tibetan people, the young generation will be supporting China, yeah. became a Chinese. So then that means the real border and the real power, you're gonna face it. Yeah. So if we let them, we strongly be able to stop them or prevent their cultural assimilative uh, education system, mm -hmm. then that means Tibetan will have the chance to practice their language and the culture, then our border area will get more safer, I think. So last question, yeah. uh, where do you see India's role in this? Of course, because we been border, we been neighbor, Tibetan and India as a neighbor, uh, we have a long historical cultural connectivity. Yeah. The, the every primary legitimacy is from the society, from the ground. Yeah. But the society is informed by culture, the culture practiced by, by people. Mm -hmm. The people produced by education. So from those kind of logical relation, when we successfully be able to stop the education system, that means we let our people practice our culture and the language and our border gonna be safest in the history before. Mm -hmm. 
if we let them succeed, China succeeded, then the real challenge and the security challenge is going to come soon, I think. Mm -hmm. So you think India is being proactive enough or we're not doing enough? Um, we need to, I think, the, from my point of view, uh, we need to step forward uh, mm -hmm. more. Um, the way, for example, in the UN, we need to clearly sta make uh, statements on the China's colonial education system. Mm -hmm. Then that will increase the China's uh, sense too. Oh, if we continue this, that will increase the uh, enemy around the world, even our, with mm -hmm. our neighbor. Okay. Yeah. The China is making the, such a long-term planning, the strategic planning uh, with the China, India. When you see their railway road, the map yeah. they're doing, yeah. I saw this clearly. The mm -hmm. recently China saying on the India, they say, siege India without the fighting. What okay. does that mean? Yeah. You know, that's the big uh, question. But also, it's a big, the challenging for the India. But I think you need to have a uh, increase the solidarity with the Western country, the democratic country, and the neighbor country together strongly to increase to prevent the China, uh, the colonial boarding school and other bad policy. Then that will bring the good uh, result in the future soon. I think. Well, interesting perspective, Dr. Gyalo. Uh, let's see what India does. Um, although we appear to be more driven by our own interests and that will weigh in obviously whenever we um, project our uh, Tibet policies. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gyalo, thank you very much for your time. My and pleasure. A great perspective from you. My pleasure. That's all we have for you now on uh, The Gist. Uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on social media. Thank you very much. Good night. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Bravi and our guest today is Tibetan writer and author Tenzin Sundu. Tenzin, really appreciate you taking us uh, some time for us. Thank you for having me. Tenzin, just wanted to get an overview of the situation in Tibet, but I'm using a recentish news peg. A UN report which says that over 1 million Tibetan school children have been forcibly taken away from their families and put into Chinese boarding schools. Now, using that, can you just elucidate what the situation in terms of repression and coercion inside Tibet is? The situation inside Tibet today is at the highest level of repression, brutality and surveillance to a point people know that even one photograph of the Dalai Lama in their, in their phone is known by the Chinese government. And this is the level where about a million Tibetan children are forced into colonial school boarding, uh, boarding schools where children are given Chinese language education and their right to study, know, learn Tibetan language has been deprived to them. This has come to where China's 70 years of occupation of Tibet has brought to more than a million Tibetans losing their life and about 6,000 monasteries destroyed. And today we, we are at a situation where Tibetan nomads, farmers are losing their land all to China's mining. Those mining then go to China, make cheap made in China products and China sell it to places around the world. And this is where Tibet is having to pay the cost for China's economy and also what is called the development uh, yeah. to countries around the world. Again, if I just look at the, some new moves, I think there was a seminar where there were a lot of scholars and there's this move to try and uh, use the pinyin name for Tibet more. Uh, how, how, why would the Chinese be trying to do that? We face the same in, say, in Arunachal Pradesh where they, their name places according to uh, Chinese language. Yeah. See, uh, China's attempt to rename Tibet 
English language Tibet or from from Hindi Tibet. It's uh, disconcerting and um, inconvenient for China because China looks at Tibet today as what China calls Xizang, yeah. which actually means Western Treasure House. So they look at Tibet as a source of their natural resources from where they could take those natural resources and continue to churn out cheap made in China products. They do not respect the Tibetan people, language, culture. And they continue to say that Tibet is a, Tibetan people are a minority. But there's no minority rights. But then this was not how China looked at Tibet. Traditionally, China looked at Tibet as what is called the Trufan. Trufan actually meant, meant that China looked at Tibet as the place of wisdom. Entire China's uh, mythology uh, of the monkey and the, uh, and the pig story, just like how Ramayan Mahabharata is in India, their mythology, their entire history was there in search of going to Trufan, the place of wisdom. Now China looks at Tibet as a source of natural resources. This is where, where we have come to today. I know you have very strong views on this, but I'd like to get an overview of what you think of India's Tibet policy. India's Tibet policy, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama has again and again said, it's overcautious. And it has not changed uh, so much. Uh, it, India's uh, Tibet policy started from uh, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai 1954 Panchila Agreement, where India was one of the first to recognize Tibet as a part of China. Um, now, linguistically, there have been certain uh, changes that have come about ever since Atal Bihari Vajpayee took the helms of the administration. Uh, instead of saying Tibet blanketly, India started to say Tibet Autonomous Region is a part of China, uh, which uh, then recognizes only a part of Tibet as part of China. Um, and then we must also notice that since 2008, India has stopped giving China the free certificate, certificate that Tibet is a part of China. Uh, and I think these are slow, slow uh, developments. It's not about political parties. It's just generally India is much more assertive. It's much more confident of its own policies. And now India is a global player. Talking about being a global player now, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi Jinping had a conversation which was on uh, camera in Bali during the G20 in Indonesia in November. They've had a conversation where both sides have issued statements now at BRICS. There are two more opportunities possibly. One is the East Asia uh, conference and the ASEAN conference in Indonesia early, Japan, early uh, September. And then days later, the G20 summit in Delhi itself. Meanwhile, officials of various levels, which find a part in the statement, are looking at ways to kind of cool down temperatures. How do you view all of this? Um, these are uh, these latest uh, moves from both China and India's uh, sides. We should not look into that too much. Uh, these are more inspired or compelled because of their local policies. So uh, there, is an, there is an election happening uh, next year. Uh, Xi Jinping has a lot of uh, enemies from within the political party. He's very, very in insecure. He's actually one of the most threatened personalities in the entire China, where of course, he has himself vanished many people, <laughs> including uh, uh, Jack Mao for a brief period, period of time. Um, at the same time, he himself is a threatened person. So many of these policies may have been and uh, may be continuing to uh, come about from local uh, immediate uh, policies. But uh, overall, I see uh, that ever since Galvan, India has recognized China as enemy number one, just as how George Fernandez earlier uh, had said. Um, so I think these are uh, larger changes and India is not going to forget Galwan Valley. Uh, India uh, and uh, India's uh, aspiration and is rising to a point uh, because of its uh, uh, youthful population, uh, our level of education here um, and also global aspiration. Uh, we are continuing to uh, look at China either as a competitor um, or, uh, and mostly as an, as an enemy. Sure. I mean, this is all, of course, contingent of whether Xi Jinping goes to Indonesia and comes to Delhi as well. But how do you, view, if he does come for the G20 summit, what is that line that uh, Tibetan activists would look at in terms of, obviously, you would want to protest. You'd protest whether he comes or he doesn't uh, come. But if he comes, probably more. And dealing with the sensitivities of 
India being one, the host for the Tibetan people, yeah. and two, host for an important summit. How do you tread that? I back? think it is, it is important for all, all of us as Tibetans living in India and people like us who are born and brought up in India, that we are very sensitive to India's emotion that uh, India is having to um, host the G20 uh, summit for the first time. It is prestige of India. We are very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very aware of this. Uh, but India must also know that this is same Xi Jinping, who is a dictator in his own country, who has occupied Tibet, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, Manchuria for the past 70 years and constantly tries to threaten India. And whenever he had come in the past three times, he had always sent PLA soldiers doing incursions into Indian territory. And, uh, uh, and both of us who, uh, would not be surprised that if he did the same thing. So we have more concerns from Xi Jinping and less about Tibetan activists. Tibetan activists, we, I mean, India is such, especially New Delhi, is such a high security area. We may not be able to do too much, but I think some attempts will be made. But concerns should be about the border. Xi Jinping definitely will do something on the borders, even as he uh, comes here. And he would use that as bargaining chip against India. The hope among some is that instead of doing something on the border that is aggressive, Possibly if they return to some positions of uh, disengagement or de-escalation. But anyway, that's for the future. You talked about the border areas. If I can just break them into two parts, the, the western and the eastern part. And first, your uh, views on what has happened in Ladakh, especially in East Ladakh, post-Galwan. I think uh, uh, right after Galwan Valley, the, the tremendous pressure on Indian armed forces uh, um, because we have uh, suffered a debacle um, um, and having to um, be more assertive. At the same time, then all the um, policies of uh, de-escalation and uh, uh, calm down. Uh, these are confusing uh, moments. At the same time, I think Indian armed forces have proved that we are strong. We are not given to give up. We are, we are there. Uh, but... Uh, also, we had seen in certain places, especially in um, uh, Guyul, uh, Shushul area, uh, there are some grazing grounds uh, from India side now not being al allowed for, for Indian nomads. And this would mean a loss of grazing grounds for, for people. So these have now become the new um, no, no man's land. Um, and that's, that, that's a loss uh, from, from our side. Um, I think when it comes to border areas, uh, how much ever we say in the media, on the outside, we should practice that on ground. And if I can move now to the eastern sector where we covered extensively, especially in Arunachal Pradesh and Tawang sector, and the Chumi Gyatse, or holy waterfall, is extremely significant for Tibetan Buddhists on both sides, but now, of course, from the other side, uh, they can hardly do anything except possibly watch it. Your thoughts about Arunachal Pradesh and how China claims it as southern Tibet? See, Arunachal Pradesh, um, however we look at it, initially used to be a part of what's called the NIFA, Northeastern Frontier Agency. Uh, in, the, in the history, till 1914, uh, McMahon Line uh, Treaty Agreement, it was part of Tibet. And the uh, McMahon Treaty was signed in 1914, which was going to be part of the similar uh, agreement uh, where China did not sign. But McMahon Treaty was a bilateral treaty between Tibet, independent Tibet, and British India. And there was no China there at all. So India has... Uh, uh, legal claims, historical claims, and documented, documentational claims on this. And China has no business to talk about Arunachal Pradesh at all. Um, administratively, till February of 1951, Arunachal Pradesh had uh, uh, remained uh, administratively part of Tibet. But from, from February 1951 onwards, it had become part of India. And again, there was no China business there at all. So I don't understand why China continues, continues to say that Arunachal Pradesh is a part of uh, 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 southern Tibet. Uh, problem here is when India recognizes Tibet autonomous region as part of uh, China, then there is, there, there, it leaves space for misinterpretation by China. 
in uh, India must, just as how India says, we have Indo-Tibetan Border Police, IDBP. We must look at um, uh, Mekhmun Line Treaty uh, point and also many other uh, borders in the Himalayas as Tibet border. I think this would give clarification to our people and also to, uh, to China. And, uh, and recent, uh, this year, United States passed a resolution supporting McMahon Line uh, Treaty on the, and, uh, and the line as, uh, as India's legitimate, le legitimate border. So China has no business here at all. Sure. I mean, the government doesn't do that. But when we report, we do call it the Tibetan border and we do say it's China-occupied uh, Tibet. That's or, important. I think every Indian should say Himalayan border with Tibet is Tibet border. And But the corollary to that, the official position, whether it's uh, among uh, normal Tibetans or the government in exile, is that Arunachal Pradesh is not part of Tibet? Is that also an His Holiness the Dalai Lama had been there, I yeah. think, almost about seven, eight times. Yeah. Every time he goes there, this is a recognition that this is part of India. And China has no business about it. And whenever His Holiness goes there, almost about 40 to uh, 50, 60,000 people gather there, including people from Bhutan and Nepal and all over Arunachal Pradesh. And this is then, this becomes the biggest statement mm -hmm. that this entire people look at this uh, Arunachal Pradesh, especially the Tawang region, as part of India. It's a very clear sign. What is your information, Tenzin, about uh, Tibetans being inducted coercively or not? We don't have any information about that uh, into the PLA. And uh, also, if you could add Tibetans in the Special Frontier Forces. Well, see, uh, Special Frontier Force was first set up here towards the end of 1962 after China's invasion of India in the Ar Ar Arunachal Pradesh area. Uh, and this has been going on all this time, but secretively. Uh, on the other side, uh, China's induction or recruitment of Tibetan, uh, what is called the militia, uh, um, uh, happened after Galwan Valley. So whenever we see, if you see any of the reports, uh, Chinese reports about uh, their recruitment of Tibetans in, uh, uh, for their uh, border security, you will see that they never mention that the Tibetans they recruited are part of PLA. These are militia. These are randomly uh, uh, soldiers that are randomly picked up for their own purposes that they would decide. So, which would mean they are not a part of regular PLA, one, number one. Number two, when they talk about it, they always highlight one thing, that they, all the soldiers are getting all um, facilities and perks. These right. were more pro uh, prominently reported than their being part of any uh, important uh, uh, part of the security uh, 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 accessories. So I look at this as China's psychological war tactic against India to break down the morale of SFF soldiers. Um, because as, as if it's soldiers, uh, their situation in, in India, uh, looking at the way they are treating their own soldiers in, in the way they, they are treating. Right? We don't so, know. so we actually see that this is more of a this, uh, of a, of a uh, psychological tactic. But they may, it may also come to a point that they may use Tibetans mm -hmm. on, the, on the Himalayan borders. And finally, finally, we may see... Tibetans facing each other, or Tibetans killing each other on the Himalayas, one for China, one for India. Um, but I like to believe, and we keep messaging to our brothers and sisters inside Tibet, looking at India, facing His Holiness the Dalai Lama here, how are you going to shoot at us? I'll let that pause <laughs> speak for itself. But since you're talking about the Dalai Lama, Tenzin, what are your thoughts on succession? I mean, there's so much debate and discussion over it. The, the, the Lalama Lama himself has said, you know, <laughs> I'm going to live till 113. But uh, something has to be in place and because China obviously is looking for that option to nullify the succession. How do you see that panning out? Well, this is a regular question that uh, keeps coming to <laughs> Tibetans. Um, but I think, you know, the importance is, as far as Tibetans are concerned, his Holiness the Dalai Lama has made it very clear that there would be a point of time that, that he would leave behind a written statement. Right. And that would clarify everything for, for all of us. And for us, this, that is going to be the ultimate um, you know, call. 
and people across the Himalayas, uh, especially Indian uh, population and uh, uh, associations of monasteries, associations of high lamas and uh, gurus uh, are all across the Himalayas, they all have uh, you know, petitioned government of India to recognize the, the Dalai Lama's decision as the ultimate. For from among the Tibetan community, whether Tibetans are inside Tibet or outside everywhere, we all uh, uh, respect His Holiness Dalai Lama as the ultimate uh, call. And United States has also passed that kind of uh, resolution. Um, so as far as Tibetans are concerned, I don't see there's a, there's a problem. Um, uh, the transition, which is going to be the 15th one, this will happen. Um, but I think, uh, as His Holiness says, China is more worried about the Dalai Lama's reincarnation than the Dalai Lama himself. Um, so I think uh, this is it. But then the issue of, of, uh, of the Dalai Lama's reincarnation has now become international. It is now no longer a Tibetan uh, issue alone. United States is worried, so is India, uh, so are many other uh, stakeholders. And China will be the number one who will be worried about it. But uh, all said and done, we should still look at uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's uh, you know, regular uh, words that he's, he's been saying that he's going to uh, continue to uh, live for at least the next 15-20 years. And he had jokingly also said, let's see who lives longer, the Dalai Lama or the Chinese Communist Party. And his words, his recent words, I think it was soon after his 88th uh, birthday when he talked about some kind of feelers, whether it's official or non-official, from the Chinese state or the Communist Party, and that he was ready for talks. How do the Tibetans feel about that? Or what's your reading of that? Well, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been extremely kind. He's, uh, he's a globalist. You know, he thinks not just for Tibet and Tibetan people, he thinks about the Chinese people, he thinks of uh, world peace, he thinks uh, good for all entire uh, humanity. So I think um, just the way His Holiness the Dalai Lama looks at uh, for a resolution of the Tibet issue, um, it's, it's, it's out of the world, such a, uh, you know, Buddha's uh, concept and, and approach. Uh, while people like us, we are, we are common, ordinary people. We, we work for our country, our people, freedom of Tibet. Um, so, of course, um, you know, that kind of uh, karuna with which His Holiness the Dalai Lama approaches, not just Tibet, but uh, global issues, uh, he would be much more hopeful. Um, for, for us, our hope comes from uh, what little thing we can do and what little thing or, or support we could uh, garner around from India, from United States or many other uh, places. Uh, so I think, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama constantly looks for uh, what is called the negotiated solution, you know, having a discussion with China. But uh, for people like us, I don't see China making any attempts to, to talk to us or find a uh, resolution. And then really appreciate your time and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, more strength to you and your people. Thank you. And for our viewers, <laughs> do send us feedback on this interview. You can follow our social media handles for the latest articles that we put up on our websites or interviews like this with Tenzin Sundu on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to support us, there is also a UPI code that's flashing on your screen. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amit Avrevi. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. There was something special to this ceremony in Dharamshala late last month. An eight-year-old boy of Mongolian origin, anointed by the Dalai Lama as the reincarnation of Khalka Jetsun Thampa Rinpoche of the Zhonang Monastery in Shimla. The sect is relatively less known or prominent in Tibet's Mahayana tradition. It is responsible for the rituals associated with the Kal Chakra ceremony held every four years, and also the Dalai Lama's own personal prayer rituals. The buzz is that the Dalai Lama has set a larger game in motion to ensure that the identification, certification and installation of any future Dalai Lama would be in Tibetan hands, not China's. Lamas of the Zhonang sect could be among the panel involved in the search for the next Dalai Lama. The move is born of bitter experience at the hands of the Chinese. 
Last week, Pen Patsering, the current Sikyong or Prime Minister of the Tibetan government in exile in Dharamshala, addressed the United States Congress for the first time via video link, warning that Tibet is dying a slow death. Sering also touched on the massive surveillance system that China has put in place in Tibet to monitor public activity. The exiled Tibetans are hopeful that the United States could step in and help. In 2020, the US Congress had passed a law making it obligatory for US presidents to ensure the Chinese have no role in identifying and installing the Dalai Lama. The size of the Tibetan diaspora in the United States has been growing, with many young Tibetans moving there in hopes of a better life. They are also motivated by the fact that the Karmapa lives in the United States and this newly ordained Mongolian boy is US born, which means key spiritual leaders are already there. If this trend continues, the politics centered around the Tibetan exiled community in India may shift to the US, where access to power centers may be easier and the chance to affect some change in China's hold over Tibet, at least that's the hope. This was a special report by Strat News Global. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brevi. Our guest today is Benedict Rogers. Ben, great to see you in India. We've done a couple of uh, online chats before, but welcome. I know it's a very hectic uh, visit, but thanks so much for taking out time for us. No, it's a great pleasure. It's great to be here in person, and thank you for having me. Pleasure is all ours. Wanted to talk about your visit to Dharamsala and meeting the Dalai Lama. Uh, of course, the book that you handed over to him already has a written interview with him that you had done earlier. But what can you share with us about uh, the meeting with him? Well, obviously, it was uh, an extremely special moment. Uh, like many people, I had uh, followed uh, His Holiness for many years with, with great interest. He's been a great inspiration for me. Uh, I had done a, a little bit of work, had, had a little bit of contact in the past with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and of course, their friendship is well known, and I'd followed uh, the, the videos that they had done together and the books that they'd written together. So suddenly being in front of him in person was, was an extraordinary moment. Um, it was a brief uh, uh, encounter. It was a, an audience. There were other people also having audiences with him. Um, but I had a few mi minutes with him. And when I presented the book to him, it was very striking how uh, his face lit up when he saw the Tibetan flag on the cover. And uh, I was able to thank him for the uh, contribution he'd made to the book. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and then he uh, had no hesitation in uh, taking a photograph together with the book. So it was really a wonderful moment. Well, this is the book uh, that we're talking about, uh, uh, that Ben has written. And I, I like the tagline a lot, which is the book that Xi Jinping doesn't want you to read. Yes. Will you tell us a little bit uh, more about this book? Because it's, it's wide. It's talking about your personal experiences over 30 years in and around China, as well as each of the issues that the Chinese Communist Party is being extremely repressive or coercive about. Mm. Well, when I first started thinking about uh, doing a book on China, I initially I was a little bit hesitant because I thought there were thousands of books already on China. What, what can I possibly add that, that is new or of value? But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that uh, among the many books on China, there were very few indeed, if any, that that put together in one volume uh, all of the uh, diverse human rights challenges. Uh, so the crackdown on dissent on civil society within China itself, uh, but also the what I would say is a genocide uh, of the Uyghurs, uh, the you know, decades of, of atrocities in Tibet, uh, the crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, and then on top of all of that, the uh, increasing threats to Taiwan also the Chinese regime's complicity with uh, two dictatorships uh, on its borders, uh, Myanmar and North Korea, uh, and the threats that uh, China now poses um, to the, the free world uh, well beyond its borders. Uh, and so uh, that's what I, what I decided to do. I, I decided to um, 
weave in a lot of personal experiences. It's, it's not a personal memoir, but I do draw a lot on uh, my personal experiences to to bring colour to the to, to the story, as it were. Um, and I end the book with a chapter on what the international community should do about this uh, growing challenge to us all. So let's take the issues one by one. If you, since we're talking about the Dalai Lama and your visit here primarily was focused on that. Tibet. I remember either reading or seeing an interview of yours uh, from late last year where you were possibly lamenting the lack of focus on Tibet or the, the, the spotlight on Tibet had, had kind of fallen off the grid. What is the situation currently in Tibet according to what you know? Well, the situation in Tibet, I think, is um, uh, continued and indeed uh, intensifying re repression. Of course, Tibet uh, is the place that has suffered uh, probably longer than uh, all the other elements in, in the book because uh, it's, it's suffered repression ever since the invasion in, in 1950. Um, and it was interesting, actually, the day I met uh, the Dalai Lama was the 64th anniversary of his safe arrival in India after his escape from Tibet. But today uh, we see uh, Tibet as almost a laboratory for um, the surveillance state in, the, in, in China itself. Um, so, so the rollout of, uh, of surveillance technology, uh, the um, use of uh, boarding schools and the transfer of Tibetan children from their families to boarding schools where they're basically indoctrinated uh, and essentially, the Chinese regime has, and it has had for a long time, uh, a campaign of, of uh, signification of, of Tibet, trying to turn Tibet culturally uh, and linguistically uh, into, uh, into a Chinese uh, uh, state. Um, and uh, uh, the reason I, I, I think that it's important not to forget Tibet is there are a lot of lessons we can learn from Tibet. Uh, and of course, it's right that the Uyghurs and, and Hong Kong and the other issues receive the attention they receive, and I'm involved in those issues. Um, but I think we shouldn't forget Tibet. When you're talking about uh, Tibet, I mean, the, the, the Dalai Lama himself has said but that he's going to live up to 113, I mm -hmm. think. But the succession issue has been talked about a lot, has been uh, debated a lot, uh, especially because of the suppression and control that China uh, tries to impose on the Tibetan people. Uh, order number five, I think it was in 2007, which uh, dealt with that. Some even suggesting that the Dalai Lama uh, should give a little bit more than just guidance uh, in, in the succession plan. What's your assessment of that issue? I, I'm not in any doubt that the, the Tibetans, uh, especially the Tibetans in exile, will, will find uh, a way according to their own uh, practice of identifying uh, the Dalai Lama's successor. Uh, I'm also not in any doubt that uh, the Chinese regime will, will try to impose their, uh, their choice, which is ironic given that it's uh, a officially atheistic state, uh, and yet they, uh, they want to be in the business of, of the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. They also want to be in the business of appointing Catholic bishops in China. Um, but I think that uh, uh, the Dalai Lama and the, the Tibetan community will um, uh, will will choose will find a way to choose uh, a successor, uh, and we may have a situation where there are two, in inverted commas, Dalai Lamas. Uh, but I I hope the international community will be clear that it's uh, the Tibetans' choice that we recognise and, and not Beijing's uh, puppet choice. Well, that's something that happened with the Panchen Lama when the two of them. Right. But again, uh, it's completely fallen off the grid in the sense, does anybody know whether the or original Panchen Lama is? I, I asked about this uh, when I was in Dharamsala and the answer I got was nobody knows. Nobody even knows whether he's still alive. And one Tibetan uh, uh, said to me, you know, if he's still alive, why, why don't uh, the Chinese regime you know, produce him, sh show him to us and, and, and let, it, let us know? How he's doing, um, but all they do is from time to time make statements saying, you know, he's okay, he's he's well, but um, nobody actually has any de details either about his well-being or his whereabouts. It's interesting what happened uh, very recently uh, when the Dalai Lama introduced the reincarnation of the Kalka Jetsun Dampar in Poche of uh, Mongolia. Explain the significance of him doing that in in the larger picture of what we've been just talking about. Well, I think it's um, a, a, a timely um, signal to the world that uh, the Dalai Lama and, and the Tibetan Buddhists uh, 
have um, a a long established uh, uh, system for 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 choosing uh, key uh, figures uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, and that those those figures don't have to come from within Tibet. And and the fact that he's come from Mongolia is a sign that uh, you know the reincarnation of of key figures. Uh, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism can come from from outside uh, the borders of of modern day uh, Tibet, and I think that's an important message for us. Your sense that you've got either on this trip or in your other experiences of the Tibetan youth, the new generation, is there a problem with this patience? Uh, do they feel that they? There needs to be something more done. You think uh, they think that the the fight back should be maybe even with arms. Is there that kind of a thought a process? I I didn't encounter that that uh, particular thought. And actually, what impresses me deeply about the Tibetan uh, cause is just how uh, both reasonable and uh, non-violent and peaceful uh, it is. And uh, you know, they would have every reason. Um, after all these decades of repression, to uh, to be looking to more radical action, but uh, I I certainly didn't encounter that. Um, the, there are of course differences between uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's um, middle way approach, which um, at least in principle is a is a profoundly reasonable and moderate approach, uh, and I deeply respect it. I have um, a lot of doubts as to whether under the current regime in Beijing it's actually workable, given. What Beijing has done to Hong Kong and to Xinjiang, um, but I admire the Dalai Lama for uh, adopting such a such a reasonable approach. I did find, among other Tibetans that I talked to, that they don't share that approach. They want independence, uh, and and I respect uh, their their opinion as well. Again, looking at China and the larger picture of countries uh, that border China, and Bhutan has been in the, uh, the news a lot in India. At least the kings visited here. Uh, issues on uh, the boundary, which concerns that have been expressed, possibly not officially, but uh, in the Indian media about whether there's any change in policy with Bhutan. But your uh, assessment of how China deals with issues like this, these boundary questions on its border? I, I think it's, it's clear to me that uh, China, particularly under Xi Jinping, uh, is now an expansionist uh, state. Uh, and whether it's through uh, literally expanding their borders, uh, uh, and as they've been trying to do on India's own borders, uh, or whether it's through um, increasing their, their influence, uh, infiltration, coercion uh, in neighboring countries and beyond neighboring countries, it, it's clear that their agenda is, is, is to dominate. Um, and we see that uh, uh, in these uh, issues related to Bhutan. We've seen it clearly over recent years in Nepal, um, and then across Southeast Asia, um, uh, I think, uh, as I talk about in my book, China, China now uh, has uh, uh, extraordinary influence in Myanmar. It's, it's really probably the, uh, the, the regime that is keeping the military regime in Myanmar alive uh, economically, with arms and diplomatically. Um, and that's because of its own interests. Um, the same in Cambodia and, and across Southeast Asia. So uh, wherever it is, it's clear that uh, China um, is an expansionist state. You were talking about India's borders, and we are very familiar with what is happening. I mean, lives have been lost. I think the only uh, clash in that terms with the Chinese is the Indians who have been facing them. Uh, Galwan is one issue which is still being uh, dealt with, that is Ladakh. But we've also just come back from Arunachal Pradesh and traveled all the way to the LAC and uh, saw a lot of stuff there, including uh, the area where the latest skirmish happened in December last year in Yangtze. And it's ironic again, like when you're pointing about the issue about Tibet. Uh, here again, the holy waterfalls are considered extremely religious sig significance for the Tibetans and Buddhism. And the Chinese are trying to use that to uh, bo uh, bolster their claim uh, on Arunachal Pradesh as what they call South Tibet. Yes, I, I mean, I think it is very ironic. The Chinese regime will um, repress religion most of the time, but it will try to weaponize religion when it, when it suits it. Um, and I think uh, the the threats to India are, are um, is something that uh, not only India itself but the rest of the world should take very seriously. Xi Jinping seems to be, uh, and over the last few years, seems to have been uh, picking fights with with everybody. 
and I think the the places really for the world to to pay close attention to are the the India border, of course Taiwan and the South China Sea. And if uh, if China is allowed to gain any ground in any of those areas, uh, that will be a, a you know a major concern for the international community. Uh, like you said, you wear many hats and the Uyghur genocide and the, the situation in Turkestan. Can you bring us up to speed as to we, we've seen all the stories and the reporting that has come out from a very difficult area. But what is the situation currently? Well, the situation is that uh, uh, what the Chinese call Xinjiang, what the Uyghurs call East Turkestan, uh, is essentially a, a, a giant prison camp. I mean, it's made up of of hundreds of prison camps. Um, it's uh, believed that at least one million, but quite possibly two million uh, Uyghurs and, and other uh, Muslim minorities uh, are held in the, those prison camps. There's uh, widespread uh, religious persecution, mosques have been destroyed or, or closed, uh, and there is uh, a campaign of forced uh, abortion, forced sterilization, widespread forced labor. Um, both the previous and the current U.S. administrations have called this a genocide. Uh, several parliaments around the world have done so too. Uh, and a couple of years ago, there was a, an independent tribunal held in, in London, chaired by uh, one of the top uh, barristers in the U.K. who had been the prosecutor of Slobodan Milosevic. And they found uh, that this is a, a genocide. Uh, so I, I think it is, uh, and as well as being a genocide, it is also... Uh, there's also a lot of evidence of Uyghur slave labor, slave labor being used uh, in the supply chains of major multinational uh, brands. Hong Kong is another area of deep love for you, and mm. you were associated with that for a long time. But is Hong Kong completely lost to the CCP as of as of now? And what are the lessons for Taiwan that can be learned from mm. Hong Kong? I think in the short term, it is hard to see Hong Kong uh, returning to what it was. Uh, pretty much every pro-democracy politician and, and activist in Hong Kong is either in prison, in exile, or has been silenced uh, and is keeping their heads down. Uh, the press has been totally uh, destroyed. Uh, there's no press freedom now in Hong Kong. Uh, there's basically no freedom of assembly. Uh, even freedom of religion is, is now coming under uh, some, some pressure. Uh, so uh, Hong Kong has gone from being one of Asia's most open uh, and free cities to uh, one of its police states. And that's epitomized by the fact that the current chief executive, who was Beijing's uh, appointee, uh, spent his entire working life uh, in uh, policing, either as a frontline police officer or a secretary for security. So Hong Kong is now a police state. I think the... Uh, I, I, I don't say it's totally lost because um, I, one must always keep hope but I think change will only come to Hong Kong when change comes to China. Um, the lessons for Taiwan are clearly that, first of all, Beijing uh, can't be trusted. It, it doesn't keep its promises. Uh, and, and secondly, that the model of one country, two systems, which Deng Xiaoping originally designed for Taiwan and applied to Hong Kong in the hope that Taiwan would then uh, be inspired by it. Clearly, Taiwan is not going to be uh, at attracted to that model on the basis of, of the broken promises in Hong Kong. IPAC, again, is something that you're closely associated with. And I think on this visit, you are meeting or have met uh, a couple of Indian uh, politicians. One, I think, from Arunachal Pradesh, the area we've just come back from, a uh, current MLA or legislative uh, assembly member, ex-MP he was in Delhi and an ex-minister. India's involvement in IPAC, because I remember when originally IPAC uh, came out and we did a chat with you, you had expressed the hope that countries like India would also join with uh, a lot of exuberance and fervor for, for the cause. Yes, I mean, IPAC is an extraordinary uh, uh, organization. It's the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, um, and it brings together something like uh, 30 countries around the world, uh, more than 200 parliamentarians, always on a cross-party basis, so bringing together people who may not agree on many other things, but they agree on uh, the challenge of China. Um, and I, it, I think what's important about IPAC is that it shouldn't just be Western democracies. Uh, it should be the free world as a whole, democracies around the world uh, that recognize the challenge of China. And that's why having the participation of 
uh, countries in this region, Japan, Korea, uh, other democracies, and most especially India, uh, given both uh, the size of India as a democracy and the, the really crucial uh, situation that India has with China at the moment, um, is, is really important. And uh, I hope uh, I'm looking forward to meeting the uh, Indian IPAC uh, members uh, 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 on this visit. And um, I hope India's participation will, will, will grow further. And Rogers, absolutely appreciate your time and sharing all your experiences and expertise with us on Strat News Global and, of course, our audience. Thank you very much. Pleasure has been ours. And for all our viewers, if you like this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button on YouTube. You can follow all our social media handles. There's a Telegram channel you can join where you'll get updates as to when we put up articles on our website or interviews like this with Benedict Rogers on our YouTube channel. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Buddha ka mark, bhavishya ka mark hai. Sustainability ka mark hai. The first ever summit on Buddhism, hosted by India and New Delhi, saw keynote addresses by Prime Minister Narendra Modi and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Tustan <laughs> आधुनिक विश्व की ऐसी कोई समस्या नहीं है जिसका समाधान सैकड़ों वर्ष पहले बुद्ध के उपदेशों में हमें प्राप्त न हुआ। But they spoke separately, Modi on the inaugural day and the Tibetan spiritual leader speaking on the second day. They did not meet. In fact, they have not met since Modi took office in 2014. Although they have spoken. But India sent some other signals too. Arunachal Pradesh Chief Minister Pema Kandu was on stage with the Tibetan leader at the Buddhist summit. 
to remind the Chinese that Arunachal is a part of India and the Dalai Lama's presence in India tells the world that China's occupation of Tibet is illegal. The Buddhist summit was an opportunity to challenge China's narrative that Buddhism is of Chinese origin. India is a land of uh, Buddhism. So, I think we expect Indian Buddhism should be revival and lead world Buddhism. The summit, attended by 300 delegates and scholars, discussed climate change and the environment, a not-so-subtle message to China that its activities in Tibet have seriously damaged the environment and displaced the local population. Delegates also reflected on the Ukraine war and its damaging consequences to the world. All Buddhist community of global response to this most dangerous challenge of today, I think we should provide the possible hope of the wisdom to make this war to be dissolved and a new vision of global nonviolent peace to be initiated. Hopefully, India will use the momentum generated by this summit to stake its claim to its Buddhist heritage. Such summits are also good for political messaging at a time when relationships with neighboring countries like China are fraught and uncertain. With Sanchit Prasdan, this is Ramanandas and Gupta for Strat News Global. For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amita Brevi on our flagship weekly show, The Talking Point. Today, our guest from Taipei is uh, Sana Hashmi and from New Delhi, Antara Ghoshal Singh. A warm welcome to all our viewers who are picking up this live stream and a welcome to those viewers who will pick the stream later on our YouTube channel. From Taipei, as you said, we're welcoming Dr. Sana Hashmi. She's been a guest on Strat News Global before. Thanks for your time so late in the evening there, Sana. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. And in Delhi, for the first time on Strat News Global, we have uh, Antara Ghoshal Singh. Antara, pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me here today. So I was just looking at uh, developments in and around you, there have been a lot of developments both within Taiwan and around Taiwan. And Taiwan has been bolstering its defenses for quite some time now, especially post recent developments. And would you say in preparation for what uh, is most likely going to be Xi Jinping's third and more terms? I think Taiwan has always been prepared for it, specifically since 2016, since the suspension of the Crossway Dialogue and uh, how China has become more assertive and aggressive towards Taiwan. And this has happened primarily during uh, Xi's tenure. And this has been happening since uh, 2014. Uh, of course, Ma Ying-Chiu was there. Ma ying was considered a little pro-China. But with the coming of Tsai Ing-wen, what we have seen is that China has just suspended all the dialogue. So I believe that Taiwan has been preparing for that. that there's not much talk about uh, Xi Jinping uh, coming, uh, going for the third term. Uh, now there is local election in Taiwan in November. So that is something that's been occupying uh, the news, all the media platforms in Taiwan. But of course, this is something that's been watched everywhere, be it Taiwan, be it US, globally. And I think there will only be a divine intervention if Xi Jinping doesn't secure the third term. So I believe that uh, this is how it's very important for Taiwan as well. But I believe when it comes to China's policy towards Taiwan, it's not going to change much. 
China has been aggressive towards Taiwan, and after Xi Jinping secures the third term, what we're going to see is that uh, there will be this similar kind of tough stance on Taiwan, and Taiwan will, of course, be on the top priority list for uh, China even after the 20th Party Congress. And I think this is one of the reasons how the new normal was established after Pelosi's visit. So the so-called new normal will be continued even after the third term as well. Sure. Antara, uh, what are the expectations from the 20th Party Congress uh, on Tibet with respect to the evolution of uh, the CCP policy? Uh, yeah, uh, what I gather from the Chinese media is that, you know, promoting high quality development of Tibet, developing advantages and characteristics of a plateau economy. Uh, these are, uh, you know, projected as the uh, major goals that uh, will be uh, discussed during the uh, meeting. And the focus will be A, on promoting strength and avoiding weaknesses, B, on um, adjusting measures to local conditions, uh, C, on uh, deepening reform and uh, opening up, um, D, uh, you know, uh, speeding up the construction of uh, infrastructure, uh, railways, highways, and other uh, major infrastructure projects. Um, and uh, next is uh, developing characteristic industries in Tibet. And uh, last but not the least is to uh, coordinate development with security. Hmm. Some you were saying that uh, Taiwan has been preparing all through the decades and especially with this new normal that you're talking about post uh, Pelosi's visit. But in your mind, what will it take both domestically in Taiwan and internationally to deter Xi Jinping's attempt at uh, attempts at forced reunification? Uh, I don't think, uh, first, I think we really need to establish if there's going to be uh, invasion or forceful reunification. I think it's not going to happen anytime soon. Of course, we have the next timeline that is uh, 2027. Uh, the PLA modernization has to happen by 2027. That is what the agenda. Uh, but I believe that China is not, uh, is not going to really invade Taiwan by then as well. And we have the example of Ukraine. Uh, so I believe that China is further dissuaded from invading Taiwan. And of course, there's a lot of support for Taiwan at the global level. For Ukraine, there were a lot of countries that didn't see it coming. US was the only one who was talking about it. But for Taiwan, uh, especially since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a uh, humongous support for Taiwan. And I believe the question that you asked me about how to deter China's invasion of Taiwan. And I, of course, Taiwan is preparing uh, for a, a, a not so imminent invasion. But apart from that, what I believe is that uh, countries need to talk about Taiwan more. If there are more and more countries that are talking about Taiwan and if there is greater support for Taiwan, for example, if India starts talking about Taiwan tomorrow, that will also act as deterrence. So, and in fact, why China has become so aggressive uh, with respect to Taiwan is primarily because it has got the support of larger international community. It wants countries to stop talking about Taiwan and I think this is what is going to dissuade uh, China to invade Taiwan. You're on mute. I was just uh, talking about Andhra's uh, paper in the ORF uh, on Tibet. Very interesting paper. Andhra, if you'd like to simply explain for our viewers uh, the crux of your argument, which is explaining Chinese thinking on Tibet in terms of an economic corridor that goes beyond uh, what you call the security dimension or Chinese propaganda. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for reading my paper. And um, just to give you any sense of what I have written in the paper, I've actually argued that currently, you know, there exist two sets of contradiction in Tibet. If you look at various, uh, you know, official documents uh, released by the Chinese government, as well as uh, what is being discussed by China's uh, strategic community, you will see that China's uh, sorry, Tibet's uh, main and primary contradiction is about unbalanced and uh, inadequate e economic development. Yeah. And the religious ethnic tension, the issue of Dalai Lama is actually its secondary or a special contradiction. But this complete picture about Tibet is, uh, you know, mostly kept under wraps. China's, uh, you know, sophisticated propaganda machinery uh, strategically overemphasizes Tibet's 
special contradiction and it somehow downplays its uh, main contradiction of unbalanced and insufficient development. Um, so if you go by China's propaganda narrative, Tibet under the party state uh, is shown as like, you know, something which has emerged as an epitome of development, uh, like a mm -hmm. land of abundance and plenty. And, uh, you know, where there are, uh, it, it's thriving with vitality and jobs and riches and all. However, it, it uh, continues to face serious national security threats and different uh, anti-China forces, including uh, India, uh, Tibetans in, exiles, in exile and um, hostile uh, Western powers are colluding with each other to, to threaten China's um, sovereignty and territorial integrity in Tibet. And to fight these forces, China is prioritizing Tibet's uh, security. But this securitized narrative is actually missing in China's internal uh, debates and discussions on Tibet. Uh, and here the focus is clearly on the development challenge that you know, the region has been facing. There is enormous uh, concern among Chinese strategists over the fact that even after 70 years of Chinese rule and despite various high level interventions by the Chinese leaders, Tibet continues to be the least developed region in uh, China. Its per capita, in, uh, per capita GDP, uh, local fiscal revenue, uh, everything is lagging behind every other uh, region in China. Um, it is also one of the uh, provinces where uh, the urban rural income gap is also among the highest and, and still growing. So there are there are various concerns within Chinese strategic community about how China of how Tibet's uh, problematic economic model has turned it into an unsustainable low efficiency economy or a dependency economy with very uh, weak self development capacity. Um, and in recent years, you know, with Tibet's uh, economic development dwindling, like the, uh, China has for long, uh, you know, talked about Tibet's uh, double digit economic development. But now that number is dwindling and there is, uh, you know, the limitations of the investment led or the infrastructure led economic development is becoming more and more prominent. So the agenda of uh, prioritizing um, Tibet's development is uh, once again get, gaining currency within the uh, Chinese um, in the Chinese side. And the interesting part is that how do they want to reverse China uh, Tibet's uh, economic uh, challenge? It is by constructing an economic corridor, uh, you know, which connects Tibet to the densely populated and bustling markets in uh, northern India. Uh, the idea is that it will help Tibet uh, to make full use of India's resources and markets to create new opportunities for Tibet's development, to, uh, to, which will help it to uh, you know, develop uh, pillar industries like in, uh, in tourism, in energy trade, um, in, in several uh, related fields, you know, keeping India as the, um, as the primary market. Um, and in, in fact, many Chinese experts, uh, they believe that in addition to developing Tibet, this corridor economy through India uh, is going to, you know, is, is going to become the backbone of Northwest China's regional economy, integrating the entire region and exposing the entire region uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the global economy. Um, uh, the other thing is that uh, domestically, you know, the Chinese leaders uh, frequent reference to prioritizing national security or consolidating border defense in Tibet is, is uh, understood in a very different manner. They are primarily seen from the background that China advances with Tibet's opening up. It integrates the area with South Asian economic or, uh, uh, South Asian economic circuit. It constructs, uh, you know, cross-border economic zones, encourages free movement between people, and the possible risk that, um, you know, emerges from China's own activities rather than, you know, some uh, evil design from some other, uh, you know, neighboring countries. So it is a very different way how uh, they interpret the entire, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the entire um, strategy on Tibet. We'll ask you to elaborate a little bit more, more on that. But Sana, uh, since you talked about one way of deterring China or Xi Jinping in terms of uh, Taiwan was for countries to talk about Taiwan more, deal with Taiwan more. Uh, just looking at India's policy now, India's not officially reaffirmed its one uh, China policy since 2010, since, of course, China doesn't reciprocate in terms of an one India policy. 
your analysis of that and if you want to speak on uh, the recent statement uh, that India made on the militarization of the Taiwan Strait. No, definitely I would uh, personally also as I advocate for India-Taiwan relationship, I would want India to be more vocal on Taiwan, but generally as well. Taiwan under China's control is not in the interest of India and other major stakeholders in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but I believe when we talk about India's Taiwan policy and um, also China's intensified aggression towards Taiwan, I see a policy change in India. Of, and I feel that this policy change has not been really appreciated by the global media and also by our own domestic media. Uh, India talking about uh, militarization in the Taiwan Strait and calling out China for its unilateral action to uh, that is changing the status quo in the region in the Taiwan Strait. I believe it's a huge policy change that has not been India's policy. It has not been India's policy to talk about Taiwan at all. So I believe there's a huge policy change. Of course, there is still a lot of room for India to talk about Taiwan and to talk about China's aggression. But uh, I also understand why. Uh, there are slow steps towards Taiwan because any major policy change by India will be irreversible. And uh, being uh, very close to China and dealing with this more than 70 years uh, old protracted boundary dispute, it's not very easy for a country like India to just uh, be like the US or Japan and accuse China directly and call out China directly. But uh, it's it, even if you look at our China policy, is it really helping us? Is China's attitude towards India is changing. The border dispute is still intact. And after the 20th Party Congress, we are also going to see more and more border standoff. Border standoffs have been happening since 1962. It hasn't stopped. And even after 20th Party Congress, what we are going to see is that the new normal has been established with respect to India-China boundary dispute. That is the violent clashes. So are we really going to back pre-April 2020 status quo? China has already said that we don't accept that. So that means what we are going to see is more and more clashes between India and China. Of course, we have diplomatic channels. We are talking to China. Uh, Dr. Jashankar has already said that that's my job to talk to China. This is what the basic tenets of diplomacy. But it's not really helping us. Are we really able to dissuade China to be more uh, accommodative on the border front? I don't see it happening. So I believe it's very important to talk about other issues uh, other conflicts uh, that are going to destabilize the Indo-Pacific and Taiwan, I think, should remain at the top of uh, that for countries like India. Uh, one of our regular viewers, Matara, agrees with you completely. Uh, Sanaj says border aggressions will not stop. Agree with the panelists. Uh, Antara, just coming back to you in terms of what you were talking about, uh, the Chinese discourse, which everyone outside probably doesn't pay attention to, which is this gateway that they're looking at from Tibet to India and then I presume further on into South Asia and Southeast Asia. How realistic is that? I mean, in the sense, like Sana is saying, things post Galwan, uh, India's response we have seen, India's Tibet policy. Why would India allow uh, China uh, to make Tibet a gateway of sorts uh, to India and then further on? Yeah, yes, Amitabh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very important question. Why should India agree to such a proposal, you know, uh, which is meant to facilitate Tibet's development, development of Western China, and in a way enabling, uh, you know, sustained rise of China or helping helping form a, a, a Chinese uh, century of sort? Um, of course, uh, we won't agree to such a proposal. China knows India won't agree to such a proposal. Uh, it knows that there will be demand for reciprocal concession from China, be it on the issue of disputed border or South Asia or accession to international organizations and so on and so forth. And even after facing, uh, I mean, uh, even after, you know, um, meeting these demands, many Chinese strategists feared that uh, they might not be able to win over um, India. So the Chinese strategy is to militarily, economically intimidate India into submission, to uh, apply various pressure tactics, um, 
like uh, you know using various south asian uh, nations as decade to enter the indian market uh, taking various strategic detours uh, reroutings building different high profile demonstration projects uh, in in uh, india's neighboring countries um, it also uh, you know resorts to uh, power projection at the lse uh, as well as in the, uh, uh, at the indian ocean from time to time uh, the intention is to exert pressure on india to adjust its china policy to convince that confrontation with china uh, is not going to help india uh, india has little choice but to give in to chinese demands unconditionally you know so that is how uh, china is strategizing on this issue sure uh, sana i mean now so as to speak that the dust has settled post the pelosi visit your assessment of the us china dynamic and the so called uh, american strategic ambiguity with president biden making so many statements uh, that needed clarifications later you know, i i think um, it's uh, as in he has said it several times now and white house also later said that the us policy has not changed Uh, but i believe that those are not really gaps if you look at biden uh, administration uh, policy towards taiwan i would say that uh, uh, even uh, if we may also talk about pelosi's visit that was a part of the larger uh, us taiwan policy that uh, you taiwan has got the bipartisan support from the us and intimidation and bullying is not going to work so i think this is what has happened at least since the pelosi's visit and uh, even if we look at the statement by biden that's it actually consolidation of the us commitment and i believe that the policy overall hasn't really changed the us isn't really moving towards strategic clarity strategic ambiguity still remains but uh, and i think the policy is not going to change until and unless there's an official pronouncement or a written uh, statement that's going to come out from the us side but if you look at it i believe that there's a lot of uh, evidences that point us toward us uh, larger commitment towards taiwan and uh, i think this is what we have to read when we talk about biden administration but i feel it's very worrisome for the us as well as just not about the question of taiwan for xi jinping it's also a legacy issue and it's also a part of the wider us china rivalry uh, everyone knows be it india be it taiwan or be it us china rivalry or the belt and road initiative what xi jinping is trying to do is to get away from the policies policies of his predecessors uh tongs hide your strength by your capabilities which were diligently followed by his predecessor hu chintao and chiang zemin xi jinping is not following that at all since the very beginning and what he's trying to do is to form a new image for china that is strong and bold and i believe taiwan us china rivalry and aggression towards india are part of of that larger uh china's changing image and what xi jinping and china are trying to project Uh, I don't know whether you want to take this. Andhra has a question from Matara. Uh, I want to know why India did not vote against China regarding human rights violations in Xinjiang in the UNHRC. Uh, we are sending mixed signals to China and the world. It's problematic. You know, our stated position is that we don't allow country-specific uh, resolutions to come up. But uh, in your assessment, how does that uh, sit? Yeah, it's just my assessment. You know. so i don't know um, what actually indian government is thinking but what how i uh, see it is like you know the entire concept of human rights is um, i mean uh, how it is defined by various countries uh, you know um, i i don't think uh, india's definition or understanding of human rights is same as uh, you know um, countries uh, which has actually uh, taken up this issue uh, in china you know their uh, definition of human rights um, matches with india's definition of human rights and i think that is one of the important reasons why india would not like to you know uh, bring up the uh, human rights issue anywhere for that matter not just in china but um, in other uh, you know uh, other countries as well at the at the uh, un uh, platform so i think uh, so, that is one of the big mm, reasons why that has not many would say happened. that you don't want kashmir or other issues to come up in uh, areas like that as well i, I know sana you have uh, touched upon this issue but jaydeep gadaw is asking can we expect the aggression over taiwan to increase or decrease after the party congress uh, i think it's going to be the same at least in times to come and uh, in fact in the recent time it has just been intensified we are not really seeing uh, china mellowing down on taiwan as i said that it's a part of china's larger scheme of things it's a uh, 
it's an important subcomponent of us china rivalry if the us china rivalry is going to be intensified that also means that china's aggression and assertive posture through the taiwan is also going to uh, be intensified um, and also with taiwan what china is really trying to establish is that that countries that do not really play by the rules that are prescribed by the ccb will have to face the consequences and these consequences depend on the kind of relationship that china has with these countries and what kind of red lines uh, they are going to cross so i believe that it's all uh, going to depend on that uh, and if we are going to see more parliamentarian visit from countries such as india or uh, for example australia i think china is going to be more aggressive and assertive but at the same time as i've said that we need to normalize such visits it's a part of the uh, the existing scope of cooperation between taiwan and other countries and i believe in the long term this is definitely going to dissuade taiwan but of course in the shorter term what china is going to say is that you know if you send your parliamentarians to taiwan we are really going to uh, you will also have to face us militarily so i think this is the short term response but we have to look at the long term response that is this uh, china going to be dissuaded and not going to invade taiwan uh antara matara thanks you for your last uh, answer i just put up uh, put that up on your screen but in terms of normalization which uh, sana was talking about uh, that the chinese want could you explain to us uh, what your assessment is of the border villages that uh, china is developing and how uh, what is india doing uh you know a lot of people would say that it's like a um uh fair to comply sort of situation that is being created uh it um, i would argue that it depends upon how you are seeing it you know uh, if you ask me is it a land grab i'd say yes it's land grab but is the chinese objective in tibet only about you know grabbing land i would say no its real objective is to develop tibet its real objective is to resolve uh, tibet's development challenge to resolve the entire western china's development channel uh, challenge uh, to to sustain uh, china's economic rise and such objectives cannot really be achieved without active cooperation from india uh, in my paper you know i have tried to describe the ground situation in these border villages the life of uh, people living in these areas uh, i have quoted various uh, chinese researches um, which has been conducted in these villages uh, which talk about the severe uh, you know economic challenge that uh, these regions are facing um how you know nobody uh, in china wants to live in uh, wants to live in uh, this kind of uh, model villages uh, the natives are migrating in large numbers to bigger cities for uh, both economic and non economic reasons the uh, relocated people they also prefer to stay there as uh, uh, what they say like uh, migratory birds uh, during peak uh, tourist seasons and then they want to go back to their uh, you know uh, to all the places where they actually come from uh, even the grassroots uh, party cadres uh, you know they 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 just uh, dread living there and working in these border villages uh, because of the extreme uh, you know um, uh, the extremely challenging uh, working condition that they face here uh so unless these border villages have access to indian market either directly or indirectly through other south asian nations china's purpose of making these villages uh, will remain unfulfilled you know i must mute myself uh, in terms of what you were talking about uh, sana dr hashmi in other countries especially india uh, developing or there being an evolution in india's taiwan policy we've had what our first mp in 6 years i think or 4 years 6 years 6 years deals with foxconn other business opportunities you look down south from tamil nadu karnataka telangana even in chandigarh i've, I've read about it is progressing Uh, no definitely i i would say that there's definitely progress from india side the, the way india is looking at taiwan is as definitely is definitely changing uh, there are slow but steady steps towards taiwan that i would say and you talked about state government approaching taiwan state governments have more autonomy to approach taiwan and to attract investment from taiwan recently we had uh, the delegation from telangana government and more and more state government they have been reaching out to me and trying to understand and trying to god how's the situation and how can they really reach out to taiwanese and taiwanese companies so i believe the if we look at the current existing 
uh, scope of the relationship there's a lot that uh, within that scope india and taiwan they could do together and uh, since 2020 i've been saying it that we talk about security cooperation between india and taiwan we talk about military exchanges but what about the basics of india taiwan relationship we have been talking about strengthening relationship even in india there is consensus and the public perception has been towards strengthening ties with taiwan but despite such kind of support we haven't really seen real progress we haven't really seen substance in india taiwan relationship and that's because that we are not even focusing on the existing scope of cooperation and that's of course culture education connectivity and also uh, of course economic and if you look at the indian office efforts as well they have been really trying to attract taiwanese investment to india bilateral investment treaty was the updated bilateral investment treaty was signed in 2018 uh, there has been an uh, increase in the investment from Taiwani side, but if you look at the uh, figure, the investment figure for Taiwan, given the status of Taiwan, the economic status of Taiwan, it's abysmally low. So there's a lot of scope within the existing uh, scope of cooperation between India and Taiwan. And also you talked about the visit of uh, Indian MP in six years. So that's the first time in six years that we are receiving Indian MP and uh, the Indian Taiwan parliamentary uh, Friendship Association was established in 2016 and it was revived in 2020. We have Taiwanese participants, but we really don't have any Indian participant apart from uh, Mr. Sujit Kumar, who has been very vocal on uh, India's uh, proactive stand towards Taiwan. But apart from him, I don't really see any interest from other member of parliamentarians from any other party. So I believe this is something that we could really rectify and we could really motivate and encourage our MPs to talk about Taiwan, to talk about China more and how uh, we, there is no doubt that China is uh, the largest security threat for India and it's going to be remain the largest security threat in times to come. So how do we address this issue? We have to talk about Taiwan and I feel that we need to have more parliamentary exchanges between India and Taiwan. Um, Antara, your last answer on border villages, Matara again says, uh, your words were music to her ears. <laughs> We're just going on to Tibet. You mentioned it uh, slightly in terms of uh, Chinese propaganda, but what is your assessment of the Chinese military presence in Tibet and how India has to respond to that? Uh, you know, for um, I'm, I have consulted a lot of Chinese scholars uh, writing on this issue, and uh, what I find is like you know the issue of construction of economic corridors through South Asia through India is. Uh, uh, is actually not uh, a, a pure economic uh, project, you know. Um, uh, what they say, I mean, I'm quoting, uh, you know, uh, these are China's economic lifeline during peacetime and security lifeline during uh, wartime. So since uh, the days of Hu Jintao, you know, they, uh, the Chinese side has prioritized coordinated development of economic construction and national defense uh, construction. Under Xi Jinping, the focus has been on uh, deep civil military fusion. Uh, the more China tries to open up Tibet, or integrated with the Indian economic circuit, uh, the more uh, you know, the more vigorously will uh, China strive to militarize uh, Tibet. Um, you know, because um, uh, as I say, that most of the ch Chinese strategists uh, they look at Tibet as uh, as the key supply uh, supply center or the security guarantor for China's access to uh, Indian markets and um, uh, access to the to its interest in the Indian uh, Ocean region. So uh, their way of having an Asian uh, century uh, between China and India is actually, uh, you know, uh, as I have written in my uh, paper that Asian century under gunpoint. So uh, that is how they want to uh, achieve it. Uh, Wait, sorry, I think you were talking about India, Taiwan relations, Dr. Hashmi, not moving fast enough, even though they have been moving. Ambassador Bambave has written a piece uh, today where he outlines uh, at least seven areas where India should uh, learn to tango with the uh, Taiwan. Uh, could you elaborate on on the steps that you think India needs to take? Uh, and is an FTA like far fetched? I think you're muted. Uh, are you muted? Yeah, you're muted. 
yeah. sorry so i think it was a fine piece and uh, i think we need more articles like that when we are talking about what indian government should do and without really compromising with the stand on one china policy even though india doesn't talk about one china policy but uh, this still there uh, when we talk about fta i don't think fta is in the pipeline right now i mean we should not be fixated on the fta right now but of course taiwani side has a very different perspective about going to india what they want is uh, they want an agreement which safeguards their interest when they go to india this lack of familiarity but what we need to do is we need to talk to taiwanese investors and businesses and we need to have policies and i think this is what uh, ambassador bambavle also mentioned that we have to have easy and smooth policies to attract taiwanese businesses to india so i believe it uh, fta will follow but what we need to focus in is to have policies that are friendly towards taiwanese investors uh, and apart from that we need to have more think tank exchanges we need to have uh, more uh, student exchanges and uh, uh, in fact ambassador bambavle and antara and a few other were in taiwan uh, just last week and we had the inaugural india taiwan dialogue when we talk about think tank exchanges it's very basic it's very common for countries to have think tank exchanges uh but for taiwan i think it's doubly important because when we do not have a diplomatic relationship and in the absence of diplomatic relationships such channels play an important role and i think uh, uh, it's very important to talk to people to talk to civil society to engage civil society i think this is going to persuade the government to take a proactive stance towards taiwan and um, i think for india also it's very important that we have to have some kind of government exchanges some kind of government uh, policies that are more proactive towards taiwan because if we are really shying away from engaging taiwan because of china we know that relations are not going to be normal we know that it's not going to be business as usual in fact after the 20th party congress it's just going to go down hall uh, downhill once she secures the third term uh, what china wants is to contain india's rise and we are sure about it i think there's no doubt about it within our leadership so we need to brave ourselves for more problems with china in times to come and we really need to see taiwan on uh, its own merit i'm not saying that we have to engage taiwan because we have issues with china but we can't really overlook engagement with taiwan because of china because we really have to call out china for what it is doing and we have to have firmer china policy you, you were talking about uh, official diplomats we don't officially have uh, diplomats there but uh... i have to mention this for my viewers the ministry of foreign affairs in taiwan calling you india's second ambassador am i correct <laughs> that was a uh, very kind of minister joseph to say uh antara just coming to you in terms of you mentioned it earlier also uh, in terms of the dalai lama's succession and the issues over that how do the chinese really see it is it a uh, fate accompli in terms of them choosing a successor um yeah yes this is a very important issue uh, but uh, you know the interesting thing is i really find this being discussed so much within chinese strategic community um particularly in uh, recent years you know you can see one of articles commentaries in party newspapers or chinese foreign uh, foreign ministry spokesperson talking about mm -hmm. china's position regarding the uh, you know uh, the political nature of the reincarnation process uh, or about you know the importance of uh, drawing lots from golden own uh, approval from central government and so on and so forth however debates debates and uh, uh, discussions on tibet within chinese strategic community uh, is mostly focused on the economic challenges currently facing uh, the uh, tibet autonomous region uh, one explanation could be that many in china strongly believe uh, that economic development alone can you know resolve a lot of other issues like uh, ethnic and religious tension between communities and uh, and similar um, uh, problems uh and hence probably you know when it comes to tibet almost the entire focus of the chinese strategic community is how to uh develop uh, tibet how to make it uh, how, how to develop its uh, self development capacity how to make tibet um uh, you know uh, uh, a propeller for china's uh, overall de uh, development so the entire focus is on uh, the development aspect rather than on the uh, religious um, uh, or ethnic uh, issues you know um, so uh, I, i would like to argue that you know our uh, single minded focus on religious ethnic issues in tibet uh, probably needs to be uh, relooked at uh, because 
if we really want to use Tibet as an effective deterrent against uh, the Chinese side, we really have to be on the same page with China on Tibet, you know. Uh, of course, uh, just highlighting the religious aspect or the ethnic aspect, it serves the Chinese interest. It even serves the uh, Western interest, Western countries' interest. But it uh, doesn't really do much to our interest, you know. So we need to talk about uh, India's central role in uh, China's Western development strategy. We need to talk about how important India is to uh, China's, um, uh, you know, uh, China's interest in developing Tibet and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, Western provinces, and thereby, you know, uh, thereby uh, sustaining its uh, rise or, or, you know, ushering in something like a Chinese century. So we need to talk about the importance of India to China and then probably look at uh, a better bargain or a better, you know, uh, negotiation with the uh, Chinese side. That is uh, how I would like to look at it. Antara Goshal Singh, absolutely appreciate your time and your experience that you shared with us on Strat News Global, both for us and for our viewers. Thank you so much. And Dr. Hashmi, as usual, uh, thanks for giving us the time so late in the evening for you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank Just you. a reminder to all our viewers, uh, you can, of course, uh, log on to our so social media handles to get the latest, including a telegram channel that will help you uh, know when we put up both articles and uh, new videos like this one. You can also help support us. There's a QR code um, that's flashing on your screens currently, and there's a description, there's a link in the YouTube descriptor as well. This is the talking point on Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi. You're watching Talking Point on Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Revi. Glad to be joined from near Puducherry by Cloud RP. He's one of the foremost China and uh, Tibet specialists. He's also an author of uh, India-Tibet relations from 1947 to 1962, four volumes. Claude, thank you for appearing on Strat News Global again. Thank you to you for inviting me. It's our pleasure. Also from Dharamshala, we are joined by Dorjit Seten. He's a member of the Tibetan Parliament in Exile and also the Executive Director of the Students for a Free Tibet. Dorji, thanks for coming on Strat News. Glad that you got the time. Thank you. Thank you for calling me. We're just looking at uh, March 10th, uh, which is the day when the Tibet uprising from 1959 is marked. It's 62 years, the anniversary, which was marked uh, just a couple of days back. Just looking at overall Tibet policy, we want to look at uh, what the US is doing. The Biden administration, Secretary of State Blinken, in his congressional testimony, has uh, spoken about the first face to face meeting that will take place between senior officials of the Biden administration and of the Chinese Communist Party, both the Wang Yi, the foreign minister and the counselor, as well as senior leader Ji Chi will be meeting the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense Austin in Alaska. When he was asked about uh, what would be on the agenda, this is what Mr. Blinken said. Uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, will come out there as well. And we plan to meet with Director Yang Zhichur uh, and uh, State Counselor Wang Yi uh, from China uh, following, uh, following that trip. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, this is an important opportunity for us to lay out in very frank terms uh, the many concerns that we have with Beijing's actions uh, and behavior that are challenging the security, uh, the prosperity, and the values of the United States and our partners and allies. Uh, so we intend to raise and we, we will raise uh, the host of issues, some of which have already been touched on today, uh, that concern us. Um, we'll also explore uh, whether there are avenues for uh, cooperation. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, the competition uh, that we have in China, with China, to make sure that uh, the United States has a level playing field and that our companies and workers uh, benefit from that. Um, this is not a strategic dialogue. Uh, there's uh, no intent at this point uh, for a series of follow-on engagements. Uh, those engagements, if they are to follow, uh, really have to be based on the proposition uh, that we're seeing tangible progress and tangible outcomes 
on the issues of concern to us uh, with China. Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to put on the table. Claude, uh, just uh, to get your uh, views on U.S. policy and how you see that developing while we also play out a, a timeline of high points and low points in uh, recent Tibetan uh, history. Uh, the, the U.S., the Biden administration has specifically talked about Xinjiang, about uh, the Uyghurs, about uh, possible genocide there. Uh, they've talked about uh, Hong Kong as well. Tibet has not specifically uh, got a mention apart from uh, uh, Press, uh, uh, the, the State Department spokesperson. How do you see Tibet in the U.S. Uh, Biden administration policy, Claude? Um, I think it's very good what America do, does, and uh, it's really uh, progress. And I hope that the Secretary of State will take the uh, Tibetan issue. Uh, I see more from the Indian point of view, which is very different because. India and China today have a border of 4,056 uh, kilometers. So, yeah. uh, and out of it, 3,450 are the LAC with China. And we know that since uh, May, it has been very hot. And 50,000 uh, Indian officers and Javan were facing, Indian were facing the PLA with uh, about the same number, 200 tanks in some places like the Spango Gap. So, India has a very different um, uh, problems than the U.S. Though I fully support and I'm very happy that uh, uh, U.S. has passed the legislation, the Secretary of State will take with uh, Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi the issues like Xinjiang or Tibet or Hong Kong or even Taiwan. Uh, it doesn't solve the uh, prob problem of the border with India. And uh, that is what concerns me. Though I have to say that the border the, where the confrontation took place for nine months is not part of Tibet because Tibet just uh, touched the uh, Demchok area, the Hutok area, and uh, up to Lanakla. The entire um, border issue since nine months in uh, Depsang or in uh, Pangong or in Hot Spring or uh, in Galwan are more with uh, Xinjiang than, than with Tibet. But uh, the border for India is uh, and it's, uh, one entity. So uh, whatever happened one side also has consequences on the other side. So I'm more concerned uh, uh, about that. And I think that's why I think the policy of the government of India should shift. I would not change fully. I would not go for go straight away for one China policy, but some small shift which will send a message to Beijing that Tibet is a friend of India. Tibet for thousands of years has been in relation with uh, India and we, we, have, we will not forget that. And that's why I spent four or five years of my life researching this, uh, this uh, period between 47 and 62, which are very, very crucial. And it's when Tibet lost its independence and India lost the border. So we are seeing the implications uh, today. Well, well put, Claude. Uh, Tibet lost its independence. India lost its border with the uh, Tibet, a buffer between uh, China. Dorji, your uh, position, uh, both individually and as a member of parliament, in terms of what India's policy vis-a-vis -vis Tibet uh, should be? Should there be a minor shift or a major shift considering what's been happening between India and China? Yeah, so for centuries, uh, the independent Tibet and India enjoy peace and friendship and share friendly neighborhood, a border trade, culture bond. However, once China occupied Tibet, uh, the whole peaceful development has disrupted by China's illegal and unfriendly manner. Uh, China has never shared, as we uh, said here, border with India until Tibet was occupied. So it is high time India to recognize Tibet as an independent and occupied country, uh, which uh, you know, even in the recent uh, Tibet Policy and Support Act uh, passed in US has also recognized Tibet as an occupied country. So history has taught us uh, that China cannot be trust. Uh, be friendly with China, thereby ignoring Tibet issue has been the biggest mistake of India in the past. 
and it would be unwise strategy for India's national security in the future. And we know that China's greed uh, stretches far beyond uh, Tibet, what we have witnessed in Galwan. It's a, it's a China's expansionist policy uh, towards controlling whole Himalayan region and world at large as part of aggressive like you know policy. Therefore, India, uh, it's an incredible duty uh, uh, as a strategic as well as moral responsibility to engage China with strength and uh, and, and support Tibet uh, through supporting Tibetan resistance uh, movement across the world and in India. I'm just taking some of our viewer comments as well. Vijay Chitnis who says India should recognize Tibet, Taiwan, Xinjiang and Hong Kong. China does not re recognize the territorial integrity of India, hence we should uh, reciprocate. Meanwhile, uh, Tanuj Abekhana, a regular viewer, says for successive Indian governments, uh, which do don't even name China openly, a review of the one China policy is too big an ask. It won't even happen in a grouping like the Quad uh, or Broad, that's Quad plus one too uh, scared to lose uh, trade. The Quad uh, Summit is uh, currently on as well. I uh, just wanted to play out uh, something that the Dalai Lama himself, uh, Strategies Global Founder and Editor-in-Chief Jan in January 2020. This is uh, when he was asked about the next generation of uh, uh, Tibetans and how they were viewing the whole situation. Generation of Tibetans. Uh, taking forward the uh, struggle for more autonomy, more... Oh. Uh, Tibetan determination, mm -hmm. uh, very firm. Mm -hmm. Generation since 50s, generation past, but new generation, uh, their determination as strong as the previous generation, very strong. Uh, so physical level, Chinese occupied, mm -hmm. but Tibetan spirit or mental level, they never control. So, so it's a Tibetan uh, spirit, combination with Buddhism, mm -hmm. Buddha Dharma, Northern tradition, right. very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, the China mm. invader, they themselves, uh, more and more, or say they, the number follow Tibetan tradition, <laughs> Tibetan Buddhism. Mm. So the Chinese control Tibet by weapon. We influence their mind. <laughs> so long run, mm. the see, our sort of influence is more stronger than their weapon. That's true. Quite clear. Yeah. Claude, uh, in terms of uh, the, the change in attitude over the years, I mean, some would criticize uh, the marking of the uprising day as just another day. Every year it's marked, but there's no change in it. Do you see a change in uh, Tibetan generations as they fight for their cause? I don't know the, exactly. It's very difficult to know what's happening in Tibet itself. I mean, you yeah. can see the, the generation in Dharamsala or elsewhere in, in India. Um, His Holiness mentioned that determination which is there. I think it is the most important today because uh, it, Tibet as a nation cannot fight militarily uh, China. China is too, too, powerf too powerful. We have seen in uh, Pangong in the uh, last few months. But uh, I think that determination is very important. And I believe His Holiness that uh, the people in Tibet are really determined, but they cannot express themselves because the monitoring has become so uh, pervasive everywhere. So that's, that's absolutely impossible. But at the same time, uh, the Chinese propaganda is extremely powerful and uh, well-oiled and uh, like Yesterday, uh, there was, it was the last day of the National People's Congress and the Panchem Lama gave an interview and he said that the Tibetan Buddhism is, has come from China. 
Everyone knows, and everyone in the world knows that it has come from Nalanda and from India. And Guru Padma Samba and all the great uh, Indian gurus from Nalanda um, brought the Tibet, Pandit Atisha and others. So he is, they, are brain, uh, they are brainwashing their own people. And the Panchem, the Chinese Panchem Lama, the one uh, which is uh, the puppet, has said that the most important first is the party. Second is our country, China, and third is the people of China, and the fourth is the religion. So it's a very serious issue. And of, obviously, the Tibetans do not believe and will not uh, follow that. So now how it translates into uh, Tibet policy for India is another uh, point that we will discuss uh, later. Sure. Uh, Dorothy, uh, thanks for those pictures that you provided, which you just played out there. That's marking March 10th in Dharamsala, marked all over the world. Tell us a little bit more from uh, maybe your family, your friends who are in Tibet, of what exactly the situation inside is. And maybe we could play out uh, some pictures of uh, the uh, Chinese propaganda that uh, Claude was talking about, of uh, the uprising and the subsequent events as well. Dorji. Yes, uh, as Cloud mentioned, uh, it is very difficult to get information from Tibet. Uh, but with whatever limited information we are getting, uh, we can see the resistance is strong inside Tibet. Uh, as we mark the 26th uh, second uprising, Tibet national uprising uh, on March 10, uh, globally, there are repression and lockdown inside Tibet. Uh, as as Cloud mentioned uh, recently, especially under Xi Jinping's uh, regime, the sinicization and repression has increased uh, inside Tibet. Uh, what we are witnessing right now inside uh, Tibet is an outright assault against Tibetan people by Chinese government as a fundamental aim for eradicating Tibetan people, our identity, and in our own land. Chinese government carried out this action because they see Tibetan uh, national identity as a threat. Uh, why after over 60, uh, six decades of uh, the occupation, Chinese government is still uh, uh, sensitive about it. We are seeing this propaganda uh, that Chinese government has intensified, especially targeting new generation Tibetans uh, inside Tibet is, uh, is, is showing that after six decades of occupation, uh, Tibetans have not lost their uh, hope for freedom. In fact, the new generation Tibetans are participating in movement in different ways. Uh, one example I can give uh, uh, was recently in January this year, a 19 year Tibetan monk uh, called Tinzi Nyima from Kanzi, uh, Eastern Tibet. He died uh, sustaining severe injuries uh, from Chinese police detention. And uh, it was because he uh, was arrested because in 2019, he joined a group of uh, teenagers holding peaceful demonstration outside the Chinese local police. And because of that, the group was ar arrested. Uh, Tezi Nima was part of it. Uh, and similarly, in the recent time, the cases of young people and Tibetans who are being arrested in detention dying has increased, uh, which shows that uh, Tibetan youth are are, are even despite they are born and brought up under this uh, propaganda, but they are realizing the discrimination uh, policy that China is implementing. And we know that uh, that since 2009, over 156 Tibetans have set themselves on fire, literally putting themselves on fire uh, to show uh, that the, the repression of Chinese government is unbearable and calling for help outside uh, uh, from the Chinese human rights violation and calling for freedom and end of the occupation. And this kind of protest that I'm mentioning is happening everywhere. I am from, uh, my family is from Eastern Tibet, uh, Nangchen. My, my parents escaped uh, Tibet. Uh, and what we are seeing right now in my hometown are similar kind of protests and uh, repression continuously happening. I have like relatives uh, 
uh, who, whom I cannot contact uh, because I cannot risk them. Uh, so, so that is the total control that is being carried out inside Tibet. But despite this mounting challenge, as I said, both Tibetan people inside and outside continuously resist China's uh, occupation. And uh, as we can see in the recent March 10 Tibetan uprising, uh, after generation after generation, now younger generation Tibetans are participating uh, not only in the Dharamsala, but around the world, Tibetans are joining the, the movement resistance and calling for freedom inside Tibet. So this is a, a sign which His Holiness Dalai Lama rightly mentioned that new generations are taking the movement both inside and outside Tibet. Uh, Claude, you mentioned uh, the Chinese appointed Panchen Lama and what he had said. Uh, now, what China is looking forward uh, in terms of its policy and the US and everyone else is also aware of that. I just want to <coughs> excuse me, play out what the US uh, State Department spokesman Ned Price had to say when he was asked about <clears throat> the succession plans for the Dalai Lama and uh, the other Lamas in uh, Tibet. This is what uh, Ned Price uh, had to say about that. Uh, that the Chinese government should have no role uh, in the uh, succession process of the Dalai Lama. Uh, Beijing's interference in the succession of the Panchen Lama uh, more than 25 years ago, including by quote unquote disappearing uh, the Panchen Lama as a child and attempting to replace him uh, with a PRC government chosen successor, uh, it remains an outrageous abuse of religious freedom. We are also asked, of course, uh, the Dalai Lama the same question about uh, the future, and he was kind enough to give this answer to Nitin Gokhale in uh, January 2020. Say that we will choose the next Dalai Lama. What is your reaction to that? That is, you see, uh, look, now Pension Lama. Uh, I recognize one, uh, one boy mm -hmm. through traditional way investigation right and then chinese officially he said recognize uh, another so pension lama, pension lama mm -hmm. now for officially there's pension lama mm. but the chinese among chinese uh, among chinese also they usually describe a fault pension lama cha pension lama kare false way false for false or fake for, uh, uh, fake, fake, fake pension. Pension. among Chinese themselves mm. <laughs> and Tibet, among Tibetan, you see, uh, not much of a faith. That's right. So, if uh, in case the Dalai institution is supposed to remain and the next 15 Dalai Lama, you see, uh, decided by Chinese, then Tibetan, I think, I do not believe that. Exactly. They'll not accept uh, uh, yes. the Chinese huh? uh, uh, choice. Claude, uh, you want to uh, tell us about how China, in fact, uh, do you see it uh, working in the future when it comes to succession and how that could impact uh, uh, Tibet? China is uh, playing its own game. They will follow, they will try to find uh, their own 15 Lama like they found the 11th Panchen Lama. Achim. But uh, I think from the government of India side, there is, uh, first of all, India is a secular state. It's mentioned in the constitution, but at the same time, India can really do something in giving a statement from the Ministry of External Affairs, from the Foreign Secretary, or from the Minister, from or the uh, Joint uh, Secretary um, XP uh, spokesperson, saying that whatever the His Holiness the 14 Dalai Lama decide, India, the government of India will go go for it. Whether Dalai Lama decide for an emanation or a reincarnation, the 15 Dalai Lama will be like the 14 Dalai Lama, uh, an honored guest in this country. And we will provide everything that has been provided to the 14 Dalai Lama to the, four, uh, to the 15 Dalai Lama. I think that is the minimum that the government of India should do. And uh, there is no harm to do it. It doesn't even change uh, one China policy. It's just that we stand by him. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to say a few words because you show some pictures of these villages. Sure. Sure. And uh, th uh, that's a big issue for India, for the security of India. Now, uh, Xi Jinping for five years has worked on the alleviation of poverty. Uh, irrig irrig uh, to take out... Uh, uh, completely. 
common. So they built this village called Xiaohang village, which means moderately, moderately well off village. Out of the 600 village, 100 are on the border, and it's, they are the pictures that you shown. Now, the um, a part that the Tibetanness of this, the uh, original traditional uh, houses has been totally destroyed and they are just blocks like that. Yeah. But uh, hundreds of these villages are on the uh, in Indian border and they are not for the local people. The first village which has been uh, adopted by uh, President Xi Jinping called Yume, which is north of Upper Sabansari uh, district of Arunachal Pradesh, at two habitants five, six years ago. When uh, Xi Jinping adopted that village by writing to two ladies, shepherds from that, uh, that area, uh, in 2017 it was, uh, there was uh, 32 inhabitants. Today there's two, 300 inhabitants. It means that China is bringing Han migrant to these villages. And now half of these villages, including the one which is in Indian territory in Longju, also in Upper Subansari, which has come in the news recently, are will be inhabited by Chinese Han. So basically, you're changing the demography of the border. It has very serious implication, and India has to look into it very, very, very seriously. And um, if you allow me one more uh, transgression about the March 10, mm -hmm. the history of the March 10 has been changed by China. They say it was uh, emancipation of the Serbs, that the, the yeah. Tibetan aristocracy and the Tibetan clergy were uh, holding all the land and uh, all the rest of the uh, Tibet, uh, Tibetan population were Serbs. Now, it's not true. If uh, I was happy when I did my research to find the original report from the Indian Consul General in Lhasa, uh, Major Chiba, and he said it was the masses the entire population of Lhasa, there was 30,000 inhabitants in Lhasa at that time. These people revolted against the Chinese, Chinese occupation. So it had nothing to do with uh, the uh, people wanting to emancipate. And yep. uh, Major Chiber gave a lot of details of the massacres, the machine gunning of uh, Tibetan people, innocent people, they just few thousand people died between March 10 and uh, March 28, when the uh, government of Tibet, the Kashak, who had ruled Tibet for a century, was dissolved. So China will always try to change the, the history, mm. like they have done in Garwan. They say that India attacked China, like they have done in 62, that India attacked in, uh, in Kenzimane or in uh, Tawang, north of Tawang. Uh, India attacked China. But we should uh, work and you should propagate that the real side of the history. So uh, let me get uh, Dorji in on that on China trying to change history both through its propaganda and uh, through demography as uh, Claude is pointing, pointing out and if Claude if you have uh, any uh, future uh, after Dorji answers there's a question from Mahatara who says are there any concrete figures about the demographic change in Tibet but Dorji uh, go ahead. Yes, China's uh, changing of narrative uh, is not a, a new thing. China's uh, invasion, so they call as the peaceful liberation, uh, which is completely fabricated. Uh, in fact, uh, the so-called the 99 peace point, 17 point agreement was forced on uh, on Tibetan people to sign. And uh, the Tibetan people during the uprising rose up uh, because uh, they felt the life of His Holiness Dalai Lama was threatened. And uh, they took this stand uh, despite the mounting challenge in terms of uh, facing Chinese uh, military. Uh, Tibetan took to the street uh, and protest and call for the, uh, for the independence of Tibet. There was like three main a call during the uprising was China to uh, end the occupation and long life His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, so, so uh, as of now, like you know, after uh, sixty years of occupation, uh, what we are seeing uh, here is 
uh, is China's expansion and China's influence now has not limited to Tibet. And what we are now witnessing globally with China's, uh, the mishandling of coronavirus, uh, which has now uh, built such a uh, uh, disasters to the whole world, uh, that international community is finally uh, the uh, recognizing the true face of China. As we struggle for our freedom, as we fight against China, it is international community, uh, including United States, to be blamed uh, from the very beginning in terms of appeasement policy that they have developed over the years. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the international community is now recognizing the failed policy in terms of uh, dealing with China, and we are seeing stronger voices coming uh, from a global community. Uh, so this is a time to to really deal China, not just for the Tibetans, Uyghurs, or Hong Kongers who are suffering under the occupation, but for our own democracy and uh, rule of law uh, and, and freedom and justice that is, is a threat uh, happening because of China. Look at what is happening in Myanmar right now. The military coup happening, how China is backing it in the United Nations. There are like voices in Burma right now protesting Chinese uh, in interference in the in the, in the, in the Burmese uh, uh, democracy. So what, what China actually wanted is a, a dictatorship, military rule uh, control, not only in China, but globally, which can be an ally for China. So it is, it is, it is, a, it is, a, uh, it is a, a testing time for the global community to stand and protect uh, our democracy and freedom and stand with Tibetans and other we, uh, people who are being oppressed by China. It is one thing to um, stand up at least verbally or even like the US does uh, impose sanctions against specific entities or individuals, but does that change any policy? So I just I know how difficult it is for you to even get uh, your four volumes out when you're talking about uh, MEA archives, but this question that uh, Matara raises, uh, are there any concrete figures about demographic change in uh, Tibet? Do you have anything on that? And I also wanted to you to go on uh, to talk about uh, the dangers, not just from the border villages that we saw pictures of, but uh, the announcements that have come out from the National People's Congress of um, in investment of up to 29 billion in Tibet on infrastructure projects, on uh, on dams, which are uh, next to Arunachal as well. If you want to take those two, Claude. About the infrastructure project, also it's a major, major concern uh, for the government of India and for the people of India. Not only the dam, which has been confirmed now, this is, it will be three times the size of the capacity of the Three Gorges Dam. The, can you imagine three times the Three Gorges Dam, which was the um, biggest uh, dam? And it's very close because the terminal of that uh, hydropower project has come a few kilometers from Bishing. Bishing is the last post uh, in the uh, Upper Siang district of uh, um, Arunachal Pradesh. So that's one thing. The other thing is the, the train which will link uh, Sichuan to Tibet. That uh, first part will be finished in July between Yintri and uh, Lhasa. But now they have said that in the uh, 15 uh, five year plan, that the uh, other two sections, Ningchi, uh, uh, Yan, and Yan, Chengdu, will also be taken. Moreover, that China is planning a new road between Xinjiang and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Tibet. Uh, we have all heard about the Aksashin Road that in, uh, China built uh, without uh, asking India, and India didn't took too many years to react with the tragedy that we are living today. Is direct consequences of that Aksashin Road, but they are doing another one, which will uh, link Xinjiang. Um, uh, it will be located more uh, west, and it will uh, the the county of Gerze in Tibet and it will go eventually to Kerong, which is the border with Nepal, starting from the, uh, the Xinjiang, from the 318. So uh, further, they are also mining in Aksachin. Now, Aksachin is an Indian territory. 
and copper, it will be the, the last the the largest uh, zinc mine in oh, in oh. Uh, in china so that's a very serious issue that in india has to worry about india has many many things to to worry about and i was reading uh, today morning that um, in chinese press that uh, china has been recruiting 3800 tibetan they uh, passed all the tests i don't know how many out of these 3,800, including 750 ladies, how many uh, will uh, be taken in the PLA? But it's a very, very serious issue because if uh, one day we have Tibetan fighting on China side against the uh, Tibetan who are in the Tibetan army, the Special Frontier Force, yeah. who yeah. did so good for India because on 29th of August, without the Tibetans, uh, it was really the turning point in the Ladakh confrontation and India could uh, bargain uh, some sort of uh, beginning of a solution for the, at least for the fingers area. So uh, India should be grateful to this Tibetan full fort, but I hope that one day we will not have Tibetan fighting again, against Tibetan. China is doing a lot of propaganda to uh, coerce the Tibetan to join the PLA and giving them a lot of incentive. So that's a very, also a very worrying uh, Ex Extremely worrying for the future. I, I, I get to the SFF, but uh, do you have any answer in terms of broad uh, figures of how much there has been a demographic change in China? I mean, are those even estimatable? If I can use that a word that I can call Don't you like and can give maybe better than me, no? Dorji, uh, any idea in terms of the demographic change that uh, the Chinese Communist Party has over the years uh, changed in uh, Tibet? No, I mean, it's a, it's a very, very uh, difficult to get a uh, number on that. Uh, but certainly, uh, in terms of the gravity of situation, in terms of larger democratic uh, number, uh, there was a recent report uh, in September 2019, uh, which was authored by Adrian Zen, uh, titled Xinjiang's Militarized Vocational Training System Comes into Tibet, uh, which was mm -hmm. co-authored by Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on China. So this report uh, described about forced labor in Tibet. Over half a million Tibetans are being subjugated to a coercive labor with a forced indoctrination and military style enforcement and harsh punishment. So you can see in terms of the number of the, 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 the forced labor being implemented over half a million. Uh, so those are something that are being, uh, that recently found, but in terms of overall democracy, we, we don't have as, uh, as a Tibetan traditionally, we, uh, we consider Tibet ha has a six million Tibetan population. Right. We'll also try and play out some of uh, the tweets which uh, indicate uh, the recognition that finally India officially gave to the SFS, uh, the, the frontier for special uh, frontier force in which Tibetans who live in India are in the Indian army and uh, Claude was talking about. But Claude, you wanted to say something else. No, I just want to tell you my personal experience. I went only once to Tibet in 93, 93, this long, 20, 27 years ago. At that time, there was 15,000 uh, uh, Chinese shop in Lhasa and uh, about 300 uh, Tibetan shop. So you imagine in 27 years. And what is more, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the worried for India is uh, the situation on the border where Han will come and occupy, whether it's uh, opposite Denshok in Ladakh or uh, opposite Uttarkhand, Barauti and other places, Sumdo in, uh, in uh, Kinor or in uh, Kibutu in Lohit or in Tsona. In, in Tsona, north of Tawang, mm -hmm. where the first clash took place in 62, I found, I could find the name of nine of these villages. So these villages have come out of nowhere, including Lepo village, which is two, three kilometers north of Ken Kenzimane, the, the, the border with, uh, with India. So that's uh, very, very worrying. And um, I agree with certain uh, when he said that, that 
it, it has changed the awareness of Tibet, especially mm -hmm. in the last yeah. year, mainly due to the uh, Wuhan virus, which opened the eyes of many in the West and in India. Yesterday, the government of India decided to ban most of the Chinese uh, uh, firm doing uh, 5G and others. Uh, but also, it, uh, all over the world, it has changed. It has changed because of the, uh, the COVID, but also because of the Ladakh, which was on call for the attack on, uh, on the um, points which were agreed. Like if you take Galhan, you take Pangong, and you take uh, the hot spring uh, Gogan, Gotha. It was uh, if the Chin Chinese map of 1962 given by Chuan Lai shows exactly this position. So there was no doubt about where well, LSE was. And they transgressed this, they changed, they wanted to change one or two kilometers just for the uh, own sake of uh, having a, a better position or like that. This is not acceptable. And the government of India for the first time has been firm, has refused. So that's uh, where we are now. Uh, I think for the first time, China has got a message that India will be firm on this thing. Claude RP, you talk about India giving China a message. Uh, Georgie, you wanted to a uh, closing comment before I end the show? Yeah, yes. So as uh, Claude has uh, raised uh, concern in terms of China's propaganda recently with uh, Galwan incident uh, as uh, the, the military uh, confrontation heated, China has uh, again uh, produced many propaganda in terms of Tibetans joining PLA. Uh, and of course, China has been always pushing on that. But what I can say based on my experience, my communication with Tibetan people inside Tibet who are, you know, seeking refugee in India and across the world, uh, Tibetan people inside Tibet after 60 years of occupation has, uh, has uh, continued to look up to uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama and Tibetan exile government uh, in terms of their loyalty. Uh, why China's uh, sinicization has in incentivized recently, especially focusing new generation Tibetans in school and monastery is because they are fearful and a lot of these uh, resistance and uprisings are happening in monasteries by the Tibetan new generation. One example we can see, uh, learn from the recent uprising in 2008, which happened 12 years ago. Uh, before that uprising, there was a doubt in the international community what is happening in Tibet, uh, what are Tibetan people are thinking as China spread the propaganda that Tibetan people has lost trust on His Holiness Dalai Lama and they are loyal to the Chinese government and Chinese so-called the development and whatever they want to show outside. But the 2008 uprising has changed the landmark, historical landmark and changed the the resistance inside uh, Tibet and globally, the way we look at uh, thousands and thousands of Tibetans from hundreds of cities and town villages across Tibet rose up against the Chinese occupation. They brought up his holiness picture. They really showed the desire of Tibetan people. Right now, Tibetan people are inside Tibet silence because of under gun. Every household, every monasteries, like, you know, has Chinese agents, uh, Chinese civilians, and even with a simple statement or holding His Holiness Dalai Lama picture will lead you to prison. So what China is trying to project at, at, as, as Tibetans loyalty towards Chinese government is completely false. And, uh, and Tibetans continually ask for the global support. And uh, for the last 60 years of occupation, we have been continuously uh, fighting and that's what we have been telling to the international community to india to united states uh, but it was unfortunate because how the international community has rejected our voice over the year and worked on this failed uh, appeasement policy uh, with china which which we are now paying the cost in terms of the coronavirus for example the china's mishandling is paying 
caused by everybody around the world with the death of their own people and the suffering. And this is a cause of what we are paying on a state uh, dictatorship, total, totalitarian regime, which oppress innocent voice, which suppress the voice of their own citizen, of doctors, of scientists who had warned about this uh, pandemic. And uh, we are not yet there. The, it is time now, it is a wake up call, uh, not only Tibetans, you can see now in East Turkestan, over 3 million people are behind the concentration camp. There's a genocide happening right now in 21st century. If we don't wake up right now, when we will? And it is no longer an issue of Tibet. It is no longer an issue of Hong Kong and East Turkestan. It is something that is now in, on your door, uh, on your security, your family, your rights, your freedom. If we cherish democracy, if rule of law that we practice in free and democracy here, we have to stand. And how we do that, we stand with people who have been resisting all this time for our freedom. No matter what, Tibetans continuously fight. We are fighting for our freedom. And we know that one day we will win freedom because dictatorship, the military rule doesn't last long. Right now, even though Xi Jinping trying to show that he is powerful, deep down he's insecure. He is using this violence to show that he will continuously rule. But at the end, people resistance is much more bigger than that. That's why you are seeing resistance across China, everywhere, and Tibet. Dorji Tsetin, uh, taking your words there, it's a wake-up call, not just for Tibet, but for the world. China, an aggressive China, is at your door. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, Dorji. And Claude RP, thank you for sharing years and years and decades of your experience and expertise as well with us on Strat News Global. Thank you. Thank you so much. All our viewers as well and those of you who have um, given us uh, some comments on this show, do keep them coming. Send us your feedback. You can help us support our kind of journalism by going onto our website as well. Do follow our social media handles for the latest news and analysis of foreign policy and strategic affairs from an Indian perspective on uh, Facebook or Instagram and Twitter handles. You've been watching Talking Point on Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abredi. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global and welcome to The GIST, our signature show on foreign affairs and security. I'm Surya Gangadharan and uh, tonight our focus is on Tibet. Now, why is that so? Um, first of all, let me introduce my guest. Uh, he is Tenzin Lakshay, uh, Director of the, Central, of the Tibet Policy Institute of the Central Tibetan Administration in Dharamshala. Welcome, sir. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Syria. And now let me tell you why we are focusing on Tibet. Now, a few days ago, China issued a white paper on Tibet. It's not a new development. They've been issuing white papers since the 1990s. And I am told that this is the 15th white paper they've issued. So um, what is the provocation this time? For that, we need to understand just what was in the white paper. So let me quickly go through a small graphics that we prepared for you. Uh, the white paper says that um, <clears throat> there have been historic changes in Tibet since the uh, country was liberated in 1951. Liberation is their term for occupation. As you're aware, China invaded and occupied Tibet in 1951. Uh, they've talked about uh, the complete victory over poverty. They say that traditional culture has been protected and further developed. Uh, they also say there's been remarkable progress, these are their words, remarkable progress in ethnic and religious work. And finally, they say Tibet is embarking on a new journey in the new era. So let's try and understand what they are trying to say here. So Tenzin, let me get back to my guest. Um, what is the provocation for this latest uh, white paper? Oh, uh, Surya, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, forum. So uh, let me first uh, tell you that 
uh, this white paper, in fact, uh, they call it 70 years and liberation development inside Tibet. Whatever they call it, right, uh, uh, it's not a liberation as such, as you rightly pointed out, it's an occupation, it's a brutal occupation in 1950, uh, since from 1951, right, uh, the, the whole agreement was set up, set up in a way that the Tibetan delegation was, uh, was forced to sign it. So it was not, uh, not a legitimate one. And uh, even though they call it a liberation, right, they use so much of forces, Chinese PLA armies coming into Tibet and then uh, kill thousands of Tibetans and then uh, destroy Tibetan monasteries. We, we used to say that there are more than 6,000 monasteries destroyed. So is it called a liberation? So uh, therefore, it's really difficult to say uh, that whatever China projects in the white paper, so-called white paper for the last so many years, but this isn't a white paper, it's a black paper, right? That, uh, that gives a, a, a wrong narration of the Tibetan history, right? That uh, shows uh, a wrong narration of what exactly happens inside Tibet as of now under the Chinese occupation. So therefore, uh, we simply reject what China says in, uh, in the Council of Tibet. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that there were uh, 15 odd uh, white papers they were issued. So where is the need to constantly come out with white papers? Does it, in a sense, reflect insecurity about uh, their hold over Tibet, about public attitudes towards their control over Tibet? Uh, yes, Surya, uh, to, to uh, give you this, uh, the straight answer, uh, there's a fear uh, growing inside the mindset of the Chinese hardliners, leaders. Uh, even though they call it since 70 years of liberation, but still there is a grooming fear within the Chinese leader thinking that they, uh, there isn't any stabilities, but uh, thinking that the Tibetan aspirations is going far away from the wishes, the political wishes of the Chinese government. So therefore, I believe that uh, uh, if you, if China, right, uh, is really, right, is really going to what they want to say, then first thing they need to do is they need to look into the aspirations of the Tibetan people inside Tibet. Mm -hmm. right. uh, they cannot do it on their own will, right, for their own goods, for their own safety, for their own stability. So uh, to the, uh, if you look at past 70 years, whatever they have done, the number one priority is to fulfill their political need. Right? It is not to, to, uh, to uh, accommodate the aspirations of Tibetan people. That was not there. So therefore, there is a grievances. Right? And so far, if you look at the international community, there is a growing number of sentiments. There is a growing number of solidarities for the Tibet. So they mm -hmm. want the China uh, for consistently publishing the white paper on Tibet means that they want to impress upon the outside world that whatever they did inside Tibet is good for Tibetan people. So in fact, it is not. It contradicts, right? Whatever they say, it contradicts with whatever they are doing inside Tibet. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I find increasingly the Chinese are interested in this whole issue of the uh, succession to the Dalai Lama. And, um, um, you know, there's something odd about an officially atheist state uh, showing interest in reincarnation, the golden urn and all that, you know. So, <laughs> what what is going on? See, uh, if you look at the His Holiness statement of 2011, right, His Holiness has categorically mentioned about how the reincarnation has to be taken place. What are the traditions of the Tibetan reincarnation system? So therefore, uh, if you look at China, right, since 1950s, right, the Mao Zedong and all the Chinese leaders, they whispers, right, by saying that religion is poison. Mm, religion yeah. is opening, right. So therefore, an ethics government, right, and now they believe that, right, being his, his holiness is of a stature where everybody, right, both inside and outside Tibetan, listen to, have a faith, right, and everybody listen to him, right. So therefore, uh, they believe that the 
the whole 70 years of Tibetan occupation still didn't work out very well because his holiness mm -hmm. is in India. So the, the tactic which they uh, play around is if they have the authority for the next Dalai Lama, that means that they believe that everybody will go in the Chinese stand. Direction. Mm -hmm. Right, direction. So therefore, but they do it only for the political reason. Not because of their, not because having a sentiments for the religious belief, not because of their uh, uh, willful desire to right, propagate the Tibetan religious sentiments. But inside Tibet, if you look at Tibet right now, right, the religious senti sentiments are being crushed. Mm -hmm. Right. In reality, right, they want to wipe away the Tibetan aspirations, they want to wipe away the Tibetan cultures, traditions, everything, but they want to own the legitimacy of this, uh, this incarnation thing, which is historically not deserving for China. So therefore, uh, uh, the religious sentiments or reincarnation thing, I think China, whatever they do, will, will doom to fail. It's going to do to fail because uh, what happens is they strictly do not look through the spiritual angle, spiritual mm -hmm. traditions. And uh, moreover, now, whatever they do is uh, they want to uh, create a kind of legacy by saying that the Tibetan tradition, the Buddhist tradition, is a Chinese characterization. Never before they used to say the Tibetan tradition as a Chinese characterization. Even in the white paper also, they, they say that, right? To make Tibetan Buddhism as a China's characterization. So this, they try to rewrite the history. They try to rewrite the Tibetan Buddhist traditions. But in actual terms, they are doing not a favor, not to the Tibetan, not to the Chinese, right? So it's a lie, let him lie. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, explain it to me. Uh, the Dalai Lama, the uh, whole issue of reincarnation starts only after the Dalai Lama passes away. Um, so, uh, has the Dalai Lama given any indication as to uh, who his successor is or where the successor will come from? Any indication at all? Uh, yes, uh, His Holiness, over a number of times, His Holiness says that if the present situation in Tibet remains the same, he will no longer be born in Tibet. He will not be born in Tibet. Uh -huh. Right. So, so the situation inside Tibet is still very critical. Right. If you look at the religious side, if you look at the spiritual, if you look at culture, it's still not in favor of the Tibetan people. Right. Mm -hmm. It is still dark. So, unless until the Tibetan issue resolves, right, his holiness will not be born in in uh, in Tibet under the Chinese occupation, but uh, but his holiness categorically mentioned that that uh, in if you look at 2011 remarks statement by his holiness, he also says mm. uh, when his holiness becomes 90 years old, then he, his holiness will be much more clear in giving instructions about what should be done. Right. Okay. So therefore, uh, we uh, it's a purely a special matter. And we are talking about His Holiness reincarnation. So it, uh, it matters only with His Holiness. His mm -hmm. Holiness alone has the legitimate right to tell where he should be born right, and when he should be born. Right? So mm -hmm. therefore, it is not up to the Chinese government, it's not up to us by saying that His Holiness won't be here, here, here. So it's a matter of His Holiness, right? Uh, uh, alone and his holiness office right so the legitimate right for reincarnation of his holiness goes to uh, goes only to his holiness mm -hmm. so what if china tomorrow a point says this child is the reincarnation of the dalai lama and they the chinese government recognizes him what happens then <laughs> so uh, uh, this is not the first time they, they've been doing that they did with penchen lama right uh, Penjin yeah. Lama, when the tenth one passed away mysteriously, mm -hmm. right, there were lots of theories about it. Uh, but still, when he passed away, the, the new one, right, when His Holiness recognized that one, soon after that, 
the Belgian Lama disappeared in yeah. 1995. Right. Now, he's an adult. Right. Since when he was six years old, he disappeared with his right, parents. Nobody knows. Yeah. Even the UN. Right. Even the world communities, even though we have we put so much efforts in finding whether he's alive or not, but he's not still now we couldn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. So therefore, now they have appointed their own pension lama. Right. And uh, occasionally he visits Tibet when yeah. China needs him to visit Tibet. Yeah. To show to the world that everything is fine, beautiful, good happening inside Tibet. But Look at the sentiments of the Tibetan. Whether the majority of the Tibetans believe in him or not, it's very difficult to say. Yeah. Still, if you look at inside Tibet, still you will not find even a portrait of the Chinese appointed Panchen Lama. Mm -hmm. Right. If the Tibetan people inside Tibet have a full faith on the Chinese appointed Panchen Lama, right, they could have easily put the portrait of the, him yeah, as a mark yeah. of respect to the spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. But nowhere you'll find that one. So that means that people do not believe in what the Chinese government has done. So same thing in the future, right? Even though uh, right, China play a trait in appointing their own Dalai Lama, but the faith of the people will not be there. So if there is, a, there is, there is an absence of faith among the Tibetan people, Will it serve their purpose, a political purpose? Mm -hmm. no, it's not. Mm -hmm. Good point, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, because what happens is the whole purpose is not about the uh, sentiments, religious sentiments, it's about the political objectivity, yeah. right? So they, if they want to appoint somebody, it need to fulfill the objective, right? Political objective. But mm -hmm. in the future, if they don't believe in what his father says, they don't go in the line what his father says, they criticized him. At one time, he, they, he, he was being labeled as a demon, right? But now they are so eager to recognize him. So it's very contradictory of their behavior, but they need to do it for their own political right, uh, things. So uh, if China appoints his holiness in the future, I, I don't think the majority of the Tibetan people, not just Tibetan, but all Buddhist uh, communities who believe in the Tibetan Buddhism will not accept it. Mm -hmm. And that will hinder their own political objectivity. Rather, no. I would suggest, rather yeah. I would suggest that if the Chinese leaders are wise enough, they need to listen to what his son says. Yeah. They need to compliment. <laughs> they need to compliment what his son says. That will give a much more leverage for China. But yeah. They are opposite to that. Right. So now, uh, yeah, I'd like to come to the issue of, um, you know, the uh, Tibetan uh, diaspora. Now, we know the largest uh, number of Tibetans are still in India. For how long? I don't know. But currently, the largest number of Tibetans to be found anywhere in the world is in India. Yes. Now, uh, as the population, Tibetan population in other parts of the world increases, I presume due to uh, you know people migrating from here to other parts of the world, could we see a shift in um, uh, how uh, Tibet is viewed? Could there be less of that ambiguity which characterizes India's dealing with Tibet? See uh, what what we believe as a Tibetan, right? Because see, uh, first thing is. Normally, I jokingly say that Tibetan, Tibetans are nomadic people. They go for greener pastures. Wherever they, so, but in a way, uh, Tibetan people, when they are scattered to different countries, more than 30 different countries, right? And it uh, gives a kind of, a, I think, uh, more power for the Tibetans to right, raise the Tibetan issue in the international forum, first day, right? And uh, Tibet issue is not an issue of Tibet alone. It's an international issue. It's the longest surviving issue right, yeah. in the world. It's a struggle. Longest, it's been more than 60 years. But in front of our eyes, we see new nations coming up. But we struggle still now. We are still striving. 
we are still resilient. So therefore, even though the Tibetans are scattered over the world, but they became a representative of the Tibetans in their own respective host countries. Right. Our voice will must be connected to all of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, they are, but I would remind that still India has the largest Tibetan community. Right. So uh, normally I used to say that uh, we need to look from the different perspectives because after the Chinese, after the Chinese occupation of Tibet, India, right, as the uh, India uh, faced a problem, direct problems, direct consequences. So therefore, mm -hmm. it's our common objective. It's our common cause. So therefore, uh, we need to understand, we need to uh, galvanate our solidarities on the cause of Tibet, not by thinking that it is just for the sympathy's sake. But it, it should we have a, a, a action oriented right, uh, support in India, not just for the sake of Tibetan, but for India's own goodwill, India's own security issues. But you see that very well over the last couple of years, how India faced different problems on the borders. So the there are of, the, uh, the, yes, the younger lot of Tibetans uh, tends in younger Tibetan, uh, Tibetan young people, uh, do they share the uh, Dalai Lama's thing about middle way, peaceful and all that stuff? Or are they in favor of more militant forms of uh, uh, opposition to China's rule? See, Surya, uh, since we are brought up in a democratic system, right, we have a, a liberty of, uh, of having a freedom of uh, expressions, thoughts, so uh, even among the young Tibetans, right, uh, they are different. Some of them, they align to the uh, uh, CTA's policy of middle way. And some, mm -hmm. they are uh, uh, more towards the independence. Because uh, what we feel is that historically, Tibet was independent, right? Whatever China says in the white paper, right, is a kind of rewriting the history of Tibet for yeah. their own favor. But in fact, right, Tibet was independent, right? And it's a well-known fact. So therefore, uh, there are young people who are somewhat desperate, right? Because it's a long struggle, right? And China was not willful enough. They don't have a uh, political will to resolve the issue. So they yeah. want to impress upon by saying that we can earn what we deserve, that is the freedom, that is the independence. Right. So as uh, uh, we used to say in the Indian freedom struggle, Savraj is my birthright, I shall have it. <laughs> right. So therefore, even among the Tibetan, young Tibetans, there is a right uh, narration, there is a perception of longing for independent Tibet. But somehow the CTA's policy is a middleweight policy. Right. Uh, as his always rightly says, we live in a global heart. We are all interdependent, right? So we can, although rather than being an independent, forget about the past. Past, we are independent, but in the future, right? In the future, we can be, a, a, I would say, uh, that uh, productive. Uh, even among the India-China relations, we can be a bridge. We can remain, not just as a buffer, but as a bridge, because we have the, the traditions, the Buddhist traditions, which are very much preserved, right? So therefore, uh, it can help, right? Both China, Tibet, the global communities, right? If we try to make a dialogue with China on the middle way policy, it's a win-win solution. But somehow, China's Chinese government lack the political will to resolve the issue. They mm -hmm. still put the hardline policies on Tibet, and they only knows how to repress mm -hmm. and oppress. Mm -hmm. That's the so, problem. La okay. Last question, uh, Tenzin. Uh, I would like you to spell out exactly what uh, changes you would like in India's policy towards Tibet. What is it that you would like this government to do? You know, uh, can you spell it out, please? Exactly what you would like us to do. Uh, see, Surya, uh, there are many things which uh, we uh, wish us for. But somehow we are very grateful to the Indian government and the public uh, for, uh, for supporting us. 
right uh, human uh, through humanitarian works or but somehow i feel that uh, india or indian government need to look from the different perspectives by thinking that this is not about the uh, sympathy or emotions this is about the reality this is about the rational way of helping tibet to help india right it's not just just about helping tibet right but is about helping india so they need to look from the different perspective of how to support tibet and also i believe that the international uh, the indian leaders the politicians right then and uh, of course the masses right they need to be aware of what's happening in such tibet yeah right though there is a growing sympathy among tibetan but they don't exactly know what is tibet to going on, what's going on in such tibet and uh, I, I, I would understand about the Mars, but even among the strategic communities, there's a lack of understanding on Tibet. Mm-hmm. Right. And therefore, what I felt is uh, there should be more Tibetan studies program in the Indian universities. Mm. One thing, right? And there should be more vocal about right, helping the Tibetan issues, right, for the sake of India's need also. So there are many practical ways to help Tibet, right? In a more kind of a, uh, I would say that if even if it's uh, very difficult for Indian government to challenge China, but we are not asking India to confront China. Yeah, yeah. Right. The whole middle way is not about confronting. It's about yeah. dialogue. It's about right accommodations. So therefore, it'll be very easy for India to look into, right, those goals and build upon their own. Right, solidarities mm-hmm. for the Tibetan issue. So, um, Tenzin Lakshay, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Clearly, um, there are no um, uh, easy way forward, uh, given the manner in which China continues to preserve its um, uh, prize, its uh, repressive hold over Tibet, and um, their um, constant meddling in matters of religion when Mao himself has said that uh, religion is poison. So clearly there are many contradictions there. Uh, India's policy too needs to be uh, finessed even more, uh, possibly with something far more um, uh, proactive in terms of doing something for Tibet and the Tibetans here in this country. Uh, Tenzin Lakshya, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, clearly this is not the first conversation we'll have on this. There'll be many more uh, inst- instances and issues coming up. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Surya. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Pleasure meeting. So that's all we have for you now on the gist. Uh, continue to track us on Instagram, on other social media. Uh, bring us your comments, observations. We'd be glad to answer them whenever we can. And uh, keep following us on our website, uh, statnewsglobal.com. Looking forward to meeting you guys again. Keep watching. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Parul Chandra and with me today is Tibetan leader Dolma Gyari. Ms. Gyari has been a four-time member of parliament of the Tibetan government in exile, formerly known as the Central Tibetan Administration. She's also been home minister of the CTA and now she's uh, thrown her hat in the ring to contest for the post of the Sikyong or the prime minister of the Tibetan government in exile. She's here to talk to us today about her expectations from the international community as well as the Indian government on the issue of Tibet. Welcome to Strat News Global, uh, Dolma. Pleasure having you with us. Uh, let me begin by asking you, what are your views on the current standoff between Indian and Chinese troops in Eastern Ladakh? Especially because you have in the past said that it's about time that India recognized the India-Tibet border. Absolutely. Parul, first of all, thank you so much for having me uh, today uh, with you. And uh, I am uh, happy that, uh, you know, uh, we are speaking about Tibet. Uh, And uh, now coming to your question, I would say what we are seeing today is nothing new. 
It is just a repetition of what happened in 1962 and a year or two before 1962. I, I, I believe it is just a repetition of that. And yes, it is a sign of uh, uh, China's expansionist uh, policies. And more than that, I also believe that it is uh, uh, China's uh, way of uh, pushing itself as the big brother in this part of uh, the world. Uh, but uh, uh, I think China has got in with a huge shock or a surprise <laughs> this time, I think. And uh, yes, uh, uh, the time now, I believe, has come where India, uh, with uh, such a strong government today uh, here, and the mood of the whole nation, I think, is ready for it, that India is taking a very strong position and not, uh, you know, uh, taking any nonsense of the, uh, the communist leadership of China, making its uh, position very clear. And also, I think India has come out very strongly in the uh, world today as being a nation who cares for its people and cares for the army who's risking its life for the sovereignty and integrity and the territorial uh, jurisdiction of the nation. So it values human life. It has stood with this uh, Jawans, you know, the kind of honor that this government has given to the sacrifice of our Jawans. I think it's absolutely a great time. And in, now I think there is a hope for Tibet. Uh, what kind of hope is there for Tibet? Uh, are your expectations... Uh from uh, the Indian government now greater? Absolutely, absolutely. I believe for the security of India, it's paramount that the Tibetan matter has to be looked into by the government of India. And also it gives me personally and many, many Tibetans across the globe hope uh, because we believe that India now is in a position to stand on dharma, on truth. The truth of the fact that the Sino-India border is a myth. The reality is Bharat Tibbat Sima. So once we come to recognize the border as such, then I think India will find a long-lasting solution to the problems that are being faced and also make way for the Tibetans to be able to return back to their country under the leadership of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I believe so. Uh, but don't you see a kind of dichotomy in India's approach on Tibet? You see where uh, on occasions we've taken a strong stand, but uh, at other times we've been far more cautious. And uh, in fact, uh, you have been quoted as saying that it's about time that India shed its cautious approach on Tibet. What exactly do you mean uh, yes. when you said that? Yes. But I will say, uh, I uh, meant every word what I uh, speak. And I today also I would like to re repeat myself here that India really now has been too overcautious with uh, China. And uh, China knows that the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Tibetan government in exile or the Central Tibetan administration in exile being in India, they know that India has a great card to play. Though the government of India has been very, very humanly, I would say, is very nice and have never been taking care of the Tibetans on humanitarian uh, grounds and have never really uh, looked at using the Tibetan card. In fact, has been more cautious, you know, and not, uh, not only not using the Tibetan card, if I may use the word, but even making sure that it is seen to the, conveying to the Chinese that, see, we are not using it. But that's not helping. You want India to abandon its cautious approach on Tibet. Uh, what exactly do you want India to do? Do you want India to start speaking up on behalf of Tibet? Uh, do you want India to, as you have said in the past, say that Tibet is an occupied territory? I think the first step should be to recognize the truth. 
the truth of the fact that India and Tibet are neighbors and today India must really come out and speak the truth that they know the fact that Tibet and China are two different nations and today Tibet is an occupied nation under the illegal occupation of People's Republic of China. But are you not being uh, a bit too uh, hopeful that India will actually abandon its cautious approach in China and say something like this uh, in public? Well, I think not just in public, but that should become the policy of the government of India, I believe. If I was in the South Bloc, this is the first thing I'll do because, see, uh, India has spent the last uh, over 60 years trying to deal with the Chinese over the border matter and you, we all know where we stand today. And even if, believe me Parul, even if today you are able to get the Chinese to come on a table, sign with you, whatever you want, they will not stand by it. The trust is not there. Even after signing such things, India will still have to be continue to be careful and watchful. So why, why do you want to give this to your next generations that are to come up? And why spend and waste so much money, your time, energy, everything there? So therefore, one solution is the border has been demarcated. The border has been always clear, and that was between Tibet and. India. And for that, you have to recognize the fact that Tibet was a independent nation at the time of the Simla Convention or any agreement that may have come between our two nations. Yeah, but for so that India, makes me hopeful because that's the only lasting solution for India. But this would mean uh, for India to abandon its stated policy of uh, one China. Uh, it's not going to be easy for India and uh, what you are suggesting is something rather radical. Not really, I think. If we look at a larger picture, because, uh, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, His, His Holiness's proposal and which is the official line of the Tibetan administration today is to find a way to live with the People's Republic of China. We're not asking for a separation. In fact, uh, uh, the Tibetan administration has expressed uh, in a written memorandum to the People's Republic of China that we are ready to live within the framework of the Chinese uh, constitution, meaning thereby that the sovereignty of the PRC is not threatened. So here I think is a win-win situation for all three countries. First, to solve the border issue, we have to acknowledge except that Tibet is an occupied nation. Once Tibet is declared as an occupied nation, India's boundary goes back to what it shared with uh, Tibet. And then to come to that, Tibet has to be also made a party to a discussion. His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the legitimate Tibetan representative administration has to be also made a party. So we come up from where we left in, uh, in Simla. So here, we are also, China is fine because uh, we are not asking for separation. We are ready to talk. I feel that India can play a very big role if India adopts this fact officially that Tibet today is an occupied nation. But it is again not going against this one China policy in some ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway, the one China policy, I think, is a whole huge bogus. But still, Tibet, the leadership today, is ready to accept through negotiation what we call the middle way approach. Okay, but uh, isn't there some kind of contradiction in what you say? You, you say that you believe in the middle way approach, yes. which is, of course, autonomy for Tibet within the Chinese framework. Absolutely. At the same time, you want India to recognize Tibet as an occupied territory. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also suggesting that India should be a part of the talks that the Tibetan leadership will have with the Chinese leadership on autonomy for Tibet. Absolutely. This is how I see. 
you know we uh, see uh, tibet lost her independence actually mm-hmm. i would say uh, the ultimate was when we were forced to sign an agreement called the 17 point agreement with the people's republic of china which the international commission of jurists has also opined is not valid or binding any longer so tibet returns back to its pre 1951 or meaning pre uh, pre legal status of tibet as before the arrival of the people's republic of china on the tibetan soil so now i'll just come directly to your uh, thing you know see uh, for india what is important is the historical fact the historical fact because where does india get the legitimacy or uh, I, i would say legitimacy uh, as regard the borders is what you have demarcated come to an agreement with your neighbor and who was your neighbor tibet was your neighbor in this context india has a moral and also bound by international law to actually respect and the 1914 agreement is binding on uh, india india should and also appeal request the government mm-hmm. of uh, india Uh, for to have a, a re look reconsideration do we want a lasting peaceful solution is war the solution no if we want a lasting solution it has to be through dialogue and see when we ever we talk about the lsc we talk about 1993 lsc god knows where that lsc 1993 is because i know many cases where first hand uh, places where 93 wala lsc is not there on the ground we all know that i have been to all those areas that we talk about today to chushul i've been there I've been to pohong lake and because i wanted to always know my uh, country from a closer look to have a peep there so what i would say is if we really want to have a lasting solution the tibet has to be taken into consideration and this is the only way out i feel uh, the war is not the uh, solution and also for the tibetans you no know, the middle way approach is the best approach but i do not believe in passive uh, uh, middle way middle way doesn't mean that we just wait we make a proposal and wait till china uh, comes to us because china is very 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 mischievous very mischievous just now when they're trying to engage you in talks mm-hmm. whenever uh, their prime minister somebody is coming or even when the defense minister was meeting their defense minister here they didn't stop they kept on in fact doing whatever best they could similarly in the case of tibet also when we had uh, a dialogue time with china from 2001 to around 2010 or uh, 11 we did we were also engaged in a dialogue with uh, yes, people's with republic what China. happened to the dialogue it just uh, it's fizzled out and last uh, one decade there has been no dialogue with the chinese yes and are we, you going to resume it if you if you if you going if you become secure absolutely dialogue is the way out middle way approach is the way out but i believe that a negotiation a lasting solution can only happen when there's a political will from both side and also there must be reason enough for both sides to want to have a so uh, a lasting solution so therefore i i believe that the tibetans also we lost a lot as much as we i talk to you uh, how i feel that india is losing out i feel that even in our case you know with uh, my due respect to all our leaderships i would say that we lost also my own brother uh, mr lodi gary he was in fact leading the tibetan side of the uh, Talk delegation with talks with mr kelsang gelsen but what happened i think is while we were engaged with the chinese very sincerely our then uh, you know kalin chipa the head of the tibetan cabinet uh, one of the best leader that we have had so far he in fact was very sincere 
in his approach to middle way that we he even uh, you know even appealed to the tibetan people uh, to uh, maintain a conducive atmosphere for the dialogues now what i see now is that during the time when we tibetans were very sincere in our commitment to find a solution through dialogue and trying to be as much as possible good boy good girls china was very notoriously doing whatever best they could to put their influence further inside the tibetan areas and came out with the worst law anybody could ever imagine a communist country coming out was a law of recognizing living buddhas and they did that in 2007 while we were in dialogue with them and people inside tibet if we were not in dialogue would have died in protest against this but they managed to get that out because we were being the good boy good girls and it was in 2008 finally people thought inside tibet no we cannot take it any longer they sort of lost trust on the chinese dialogue process and then we had this huge uh, demonstration then once the dialogue stopped then the self emulation inside tibet started in 2009 was uh, uh, the uh, first self emulation inside tibet by tap in Ta by tape a monk of kirti monastery it happened in 2009 so when we were the good boys good girls they came up with all these things what they, they would not have ordinarily been able to do so therefore even if we engaged of course i welcome dialogue absolutely i believe that a non violence and dialogue is the only way out but that doesn't mean being passive that doesn't mean being submissive if you are to get the best deal for your people we have to be alert and so we also have learned i mean it's not just uh, Uh, the government of india that i would say you wasted so much time i think it's time for all of us for india tibet both to relook together and for tibet yes international support is important america what the americans are saying doing is important what europe is saying doing is important similarly africa asian countries but most crucial is india so I would think that we have to start from our base that is India and then expand it to the rest of the world where we must really understand what is one china policy actually not many of us know actually what they mean and mm -hmm. uh, I, i i always remember uh, our um, a, a very dear uh, i would not say friend but uh, somebody i knew very closely respected sushma sawrad ji she was no longer with us but uh, like if china wants india to recognize or acknowledge their one china policy what about uh, china then you know that china should also respect uh, uh, one india uh, policy has it is it doing it what about arunachal ladakh sikkim huh? yes, yes. so therefore i think really i believe uh, we are entering and we have rather entered the uh, such a time in our history such a time will not a opportunity will not come for india again for another long time if you this time give in mm -hmm. then for another 50 years reputation from 62 till now on that note thank you so much dolma for being on stat news global and sharing your insights on tibet with us Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Shad News Global and Surya Gangadharan. In Books Corner, I have with me Claude Arpi, who has written a seminal work, the fourth volume of his Tibet series, and we're going to talk to him not only in the context of uh, Tibet, but also in the context of what's going on in Eastern Ladakh in the past few months. Uh, Mr. R. P. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you to you. Mr. 
RP. This is the fourth volume of your series on Tibet. And um, where did you get onto a research of this kind? You see, I'm following what's happening in China, and I see that China is so good at propaganda that they just change the history. And I wanted, I spent four or five years of my life, the last four or five years, doing this research in National Archive, in the Nehru Memorial Library, and other places, because I wanted to put on record that the, what the Chinese propaganda says about Tibet today, it is not true, and it, will, it has not always been like that. And uh, Tibet and India had a very deep relation since centuries, actually. And the entire Himalayan belt had this relation. So I wanted to put this on record. And not on, you see, very often you find books um, written by uh, Americans about the CIA uh, role in Tibet and like that. But you never find anything written about the relation between India. One of the reasons is that uh, the archives are closed and it's very difficult of access. But I, it's what I wanted to put. Uh, so I did that so that it keeps on record the close relation, art relation between Tibet and India. You mentioned uh, that parts of the archives are closed to your research. Was there any reason why the MEA gave you that, um, I mean, MEA shuts those uh, doors? Uh, that's a very complicated issue, but basically uh, the MEA should have a historical division. Till the 1990s, there was a historical division. Every yeah. uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or External Affairs in the world has a historical division. When you have an issue in Debsan or in Galwan, you know, uh, the person who is uh, responsible for the relation with China, he will not know the historical background. So he has to refer to that historical division. Now, for some reason, because people say that some of the officers, they believe they know everything, which is not always the case, you have to refer to some professional which are outside the ministry, but uh, part of the ministry as a division. Now, uh, that's uh, the basic thing. And the second problem is also that the uh, Ministry of uh, External Affairs do not transfer the files to the uh, National Archive of India. By law, they have to, after 25 years, it's compulsory to transfer this file. It's not done because mainly they don't have the personnel. Uh, people are, they would have to take outside people to do that job of historian. It's basically a job of historian, and they are diplomats. It's two different jobs. So as a result, I didn't get all the file that I wanted, mainly between 1960 and 62, were two very special years because it's just before the, the war, uh, the border war with China. So I tried to reconstitute as much as, as I could but maybe I have not done fully what I was uh, wanting to do. Now, I've gone through your book. The um, impression one gets is that uh, India perhaps did not put up the kind of uh, diplomatic fight, perhaps, the political <coughs> fight, perhaps, for to retain its uh, position in Tibet. Uh, is, would you agree with this? Is this what you're trying to say? I 200% agree with this. I mean, you, we are all aware of that letter uh, of Sadar Patel on the November 7, 1950, just one month after the in invasion of East, Eastern Tibet. And in that letter, Sadar Patel, in four pages, detailed the implication for India. It was not only the implication for uh, the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan people, the Tibet as a nation, but the implication for the frontiers of India. And what we see today in Eastern Ladakh is just a, a consequence. Though the operation in Western, Western Eastern Ladakh are more with Xinjiang than Tibet, but it's a consequence of that, that, that policy. And uh, it's very unfortunate. And in 1954, again, there was a four months discussion, negotiation for the Panchil, and India gave away all the advantages and all the, the India had a consulate general, India had a three, uh, three uh, in, Indian trade uh, agency, ITS, one in uh, Yatong in Chombi Valley, very close to Sikkim, one in Gyeongse in central Tibet, and one in Gartok, which was very important, which is in uh, western Tibet, in Nari uh, province of, of uh, Tibet, and which was dealing and monitoring all the trade 
between the Himalayan region and Tibet. And that trade uh, provided uh, lay, lay wood to the entire uh, what is Garhwal, um, uh, what is Uttarakhand today, uh, Kinor, Spiti, Ladakh, everyone would live uh, of this trade. And suddenly, once the 1954 agreement was signed, China progressively started closing down this border and cutting the livelihood of the people of the, this Himalayan region, which is a tragedy. Realistically, what is it that India could have done? You know, we were a newborn country, militarily no position to take on China. Perhaps that was a realization with Nehru. Do you think that was the reason? You see, uh, the British, they were uh, good strategists. Uh, you, you, to build an empire, you have to be good strategists. Just before they left, a few months before, they prepared a note uh, how uh, to defend Tibet. They drew a line, Chamdo, Lhasa, and Western Tibet. And they said, either if the Russians or the Chinese cross that line, we will have to intervene militarily. So there was a lot of discussion, mainly in the um, air headquarters, how many uh, squadron you would require. Some people said three squadron will be enough to defend Tibet, some seven. Now, India became independent and became pacifist, idealist, romantic, and said that uh, uh, we should be friends with everybody, and uh, China and uh, India had the same history of colonialism, so we should be, be friends. So it's totally change of, of uh, main, mindset. But at the same time, some of the officers, post Indian officers posted in Tibet, like Mr. Sumul Sina, who was the, uh, the head of the mission till 1950, till 52, sorry, and uh, Arishwar Dayal, who was the political officer in Sikkim, suggested that if the uh, Chinese invade Tibet, let's take Chumbi Valley and force them to uh, negotiate. So that was one possibility. Of course, it was rejected absolutely. Uh, by the the government of that time, and um, but it, it was certainly one of the possibility. And uh, another one that I should mention that uh, General Natu Singh, who was Army Commander, Eastern Command, who was very bright and very and who would speak very frankly, including to the Prime Minister, said, wrote, "Give me a brigade." I will, I will defend, I will uh, defend Tibet, and I will stop their advance. But it was a political choice, yeah. and uh, it happened now. You, you, it's very difficult to undo the political choice which has been done in, in the past. Tell me about Kalash Mansarovar. Um, given the historic and traditional links with Ladakh, is there a case for saying that um, uh, Kalash Mansarovar actually belongs to us? I mean, is that tenable? No, there was a small village called Minsar, which belonged uh, to Ladakh, to uh, the Maharaja of uh, GNK. And uh, still today on paper, that village, is, uh, that small enclave, uh, the use of this enclave was to uh, collect uh, revenue to pay for the butter lamps and all the offerings in, uh, for the pilgrims going to Kailash Mansarova. But um, you see, uh, the again, uh, the government of India at that time said, we are not colonialists. We don't want any uh, foreign uh, enclave in other countries. So once they had accepted that uh, Tibet was no more an uh, independent country, suddenly they said, we don't want to, uh, to interfere with Minsar because they, uh, it could be... Uh, compared to uh, Goa, for example, which was a Portuguese enclave, or Pondicherry, a, a French enclave. So at that time, they thought, let's drop Minsar. And I want to mention also that the Bhutanese had 18 enclaves in Tibet around the, the Kailash. And one, Darchen, is a very important town. It was the, the base camp for the Kailash uh, Perikrama. And uh, still, it's uh, on paper. And I think the Bhutanese once or twice asked the Chinese diplomats about it, but they don't want to hear about it. But it's uh, still on paper. It belongs to Bhutan or Minsar to India. So uh, can it be used as some kind of uh, diplomatic leverage against China? Or we have foreclosed that option? 
I think it can be used, but the issue is uh, how you will uh, manage this place, which is very far away. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have, uh, you see, uh, today, uh, the, it's very difficult to go to Tibet. In ex Apart from the three uh, trade ports in uh, Lipur, Klek, Chipkila, and Natula, uh, which are open with, uh, only for the local uh, population and for a restricted uh, amount of time. And when they go to Tibet, they stay a few hours and come back. Otherwise, uh, the, a normal Indian citizen cannot go to Tibet. You have to remember that before the 1954 uh, Panchil, so-called Panchil Agreement, uh, <clears throat> Indian could travel to Kailash Mansarovar without a visa, without any papers. And it's what India lost when in, in, in uh, 1950, when India did not intervene and uh, put its foot down to the invasion of Tibet. India lost so many things like that. Any Indian could go. Now you have a very complicated uh, Kailash uh, Yatra, which is organized by MEA. I mean, Complicated in the sense that only a few hundred people can, can go every year. Uh, this year it's cancelled again. In 2017, during Doklam, it was cancelled. So uh, India has lost this and has lost the entire trade. China is speaking about uh, Silk Roads, is speaking about uh, CPEC, the China Pakistan Economic Co uh, Corridor. But what about the hundreds of corridors? between the Himalayan region and Tibet. Demchok is closed. Uh, from Demchok in the west to uh, Kibutu in the east, everything is closed. Once in a while you have this BPM, this border uh, post meeting, but it's just for uh, India's independence or China's uh, Republic Day on uh, October 1st. But there is no more uh, man, people to people um, contact. So it's what in, in India lost. So when China speak about having um, silk roads, what about these, which are the original silk roads? This is gone. So what would you say uh, is missing in India's Tibet policy? What is that big gap that you see? I think so many things are missing. And um, what was wrong in 2018 when the government asked each and every uh, office, official from the government, including the army, yeah. including the corps, which is based in Yol, they were not allowed to meet the Dalai Lama. That yeah. is wrong. Because since 1959, the uh, Dalai Lama was not allowed to uh, do politics, but he was allowed to meet anybody he, he wants. That, that, that was wrong. What is missing today is coordination. You know, I think India needs a coordinator for Tibet affairs and for Himalayan affairs. And this coordination should come only from the PMO. Because if you have uh, only the Home Ministry, you will de deal only with visa restriction and all this. If you have someone from the MEA, he will deal only with the diplomatic, he will be even more uh, shy to take a uh, bold decision. So, um, same thing if you take from MOD, that that person will see only from uh, MO point of view for military operation. You need someone who can coordinate with Dharamsala the policy, and Dharamsala also has to uh, speak out what what's our policy vis-à-vis -vis, uh, India and vis-à-vis -vis the borders. Now the um, the middle pass approach of the Central Tibetan administration. Unfortunately, do not take into account the borders of India because in that uh, middle pass approach, the foreign affairs and, um, uh, the, and defense are with China. China will not agree, but suppose they, they would agree, uh, it doesn't solve the, uh, India's problem on the border. Because the defense and foreign affairs, the border comes on the, on the defense and foreign affairs. So that would not solve. So I think uh, India should have uh, discussion with the Tibetan. Very soon there will be a new president in, in Dharamsala. What uh, Tibet wants, what the Tibetan wants. But you have to uh, realize that whatever happens in India, people in Tibet will know. 
when uh, these uh, um, operations south of Pangong Lake took place, I think the entire population in Tibet w uh, got to know what has happened and what role the Tibetan. And they can see that the Tibetans are genuinely with India by our, by culture, by civilization. Even the, if you take the Tibetan scripts, it's derived from a Gupta script. Yeah. So the, uh, their religion <laughs> derived from the Nalanda tradition. So Tibetan are much closer to India than to China. And what happen, whatever happened in India, it has consequences. That's why Mr. Xi Jinping is so nervous that last month he conveyed that uh, big seven uh, Tibet uh, work forum and there was 250 or 300 uh, officials, the top official, including the member of the Central Military Commission, the member of the Politburo, all the top uh, provincial leaders and uh, very few Tibetans, no Lama. But they are nervous of what's happening on the border. They are speaking of a stabilization of the border. Every two words, they speak about stabilization of the border. So I think it's one thing that India should look into. Because their, their border is not stable because of the Tibetan factor. I don't call it card. Card is not a nice name. But there is a Tibetan factor. And there is a closeness between India and Tibet. How do you say we've used this Tibet? Factor, as you put it, have we used it at all? I think they, in a confused manner, in different. I think India the government should think, and at the highest level, I'm thinking, I'm saying, to have a Tibet policy, a coherent and coordinated Tibet policy. Coordination is the key. Otherwise, one one ministry will do one thing and another ministry will will do another thing so i think it has to come from the top and uh, from the pmo and it should be closely linked with the himalayan regions also which are some of these regions like ladakh is a buddhist region and uh, also tawang and some other area in uh, in arunachal in Upper Subansari or Upper Siang, uh, Spiti, Kinor in, uh, in Imachal. So the policy should be coordinated. They should not be just ad hoc and just and, uh, doing something because something else happened. No? There's never been a coordination. Yeah. I mean, the question here is would that violate the uh, agreement India has made that Tibet is a part of China? You know, I mean, uh, does it in any way uh, shake that? Since we are so rule bound, so legally bound. Yeah, in one way it will be, it will shake a little bit the one uh, one uh, China policy, but uh, China is checking whatever they want from from India. I mean, when they enter things that they have, uh, they of course, officially they never given their maps. In 2003, they showed the maps for 20 minutes. They withdrew the map, but uh, it was more or less an agreement that the LAC is there or in some places there's two perceptions so there's a gap in between and this gap will be uh, patrolled by, by both parties. But they go back to their agreement. That That's the uh, main issue. Vis-a-vis -vis Tibet, they've gone back on the 1951 agreement, the 17 points agreement. They had told the Dayama, you keep, uh, nothing will change for uh, the internal the autonomy of Tibet, we will just look after the, your defense. Uh, they, di uh, they didn't uh, follow what they promised. Same thing in 1954. In 1958, they had an agreement with Baraoti. You know what is strange? That, uh, it's not strange, but it's a Chinese way of doing things. They signed in um, April 29, 1954, the Panchil Agreement. One and a half months later, they enter into Baraoti. And if you look at uh, border issues, the border is uh, defined by a watershed. Now, yeah. the watershed is absolutely clear in that area of Paraguay. It's Tunjumla. The pass is called Tunjumla. South of Tunjumla is India, north, uh, north is Tibet. But two months, uh, less than two months after the uh, 54 agreement, they start entering and say this is our territory. Not acknowledging that the fact to the define the border is the is the watershed. 
what do you do? So in 58, again, there was a long negotiation uh, for the Baraoti, and they had agreed that both parties had agreed uh, India wanted to do a gesture because it was the first time that uh, the border was negotiated. They said uh, both part, you can patrol without arms. Yeah. And next year they they bring uh, weapons. Yeah. You do. So it's a long history of uh, breaking promises, breaking agreement. I'm not speaking about more recent 93, 96, 2005. They, they agree uh, the guidelines to solve the border issue. They said the inhabited uh, area will not be changed. So uh, India understood very clearly that uh, they will not claim Tawang. Two, three months later, they start again claiming Tawang. So yeah. it's difficult to deal with. Uh, and we know about the five round of talks uh, at the core commander level. They say something. And that's a difficult uh, issue. I don't know what is the solution to no, but, what does it tell you about India, the way we negotiate, perhaps our inability to gauge what the Chinese are thinking or doing or plan to do, that we don't read the Chinese properly? I think in India in, in the past, I think it's much better. Uh, I think, uh, for example, the minister, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, and, and, uh, can read better. In, in the 50s and 60s, nobody could read. Uh, they would read China with their own mindset. Yeah. There is that story when uh, Mr. E.P. Vankateshwaran was the ambassador in China in the early 80s. Uh, the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party was very fond of having movies. So uh, the Indian ambassy, uh, embassy was lending movies to them. <laughs> so one day they give Gandhi, the movie on Gandhi. Yeah. And they return it after one week. And um, Vankateshwaran asked the person, the official who returned it, how did the Politburo like it? It's very nice. They said, but what is this non-violence? <laughs> See, you speak two languages. I think now among the youngsters, I think especially in the army, many people, many officers are interested by China. There's not enough who are learning China, but unless you understand China, uh, to learn the language and uh, something I've not done, but and you uh, can't understand who you're, you're facing, yeah. and it ends up badly. So, last question in the current standoff in Eastern Ladakh, does that tell you that India is now prepared to make that uh, jump from you know a rather passive and uh, very um, subdued kind of uh, uh, attitude towards China to something a little more assertive? I think so. I think it has opened many, many things are going to change. It will take some time, but the, you see the, the way the people think, it takes time to change. But something, for example, very clear, for example, the negotiation have been held at the three levels. Against when uh, Dr. Deshankar met Wang Yi in Moscow, they, this, in the five point they mentioned, the main negotiation um, uh, held by the army, by the corps commander and his uh, counterpart, with only a major general. Um, it's held at, uh, at the um, SR level, the special representative, NSA, uh, Mr. Dobal, and his counterpart, Rongi again, and uh, also at the Joint Secretary level, the Joint Secretary uh, East Asia. So that is a change. If you look at the 50s, 60s, uh, the Ministry of External Affairs would have a, a monopoly on, on this type of negotiation. There's no, what is wrong in this that the Ministry of External Affairs cannot have the, um, the knowledge of the border that the uh, army commander has. Yeah. The present uh, corps commander has been a DGMO, DGMI, Director General of Military Operation and uh, Military Intelligence. You know each and every corner. They know the strategic that if you change 100 meters the LAC or the perception of the LAC, it will have a, a huge implication for uh, in infrastructure you make. So this knowledge has not been in uh, with the Ministry of External Affairs because it's not their role. So in 1954, the big blender 
was that they did not involve at all anybody uh, from uh, the defense uh, side or even from the security side. So today, that's a huge progress already. So the, and India started also to retaliating in different ways. Okay, you do this to us on the border, uh, TikTok finish, and hopefully uh, 5G and all will, will follow. So they, they will slowly understand. It's on, unfortunately, I don't know what's, uh, why China is like that, but they understand only this type of language. And uh, nobody wants a war, but you have to, if India remains firm, I think Mr. Xi Jinping will have a lot of problems within his own party, and he will be questioned. Now, next month, the fifth plenary will take place. They are supposed to discuss economic issues, but I'm sure they will ask him, why did you go in that uh, thing, what, what you were uh, planning to get? What, we, uh, what are we benefiting? Even if they are hiding to their own people the truth that he will be asked in, in the party. So I think India should hold very firm, uh, even if it takes time. It will take time. It will not be a, a lot of resource, a lot of energy. We'll have to go into it, but India should hold firm. And Tibet, if it's not a card, at least it's, it's a very important factor. So this, uh, with a better coordination with Dharamsala and uh, Something could uh, change. So anything else planned on Tibet, uh, Mr. Any other Plan books? I've written four, so I don't know. <laughs> and now I'm concentrating. I'm working on the border issue and the history of the border because no, yeah. not much has, uh, has been written, and uh, I've written too much on, on Tibet. And uh, no, but yeah. I was very gratified to have been able to put it on record that uh, very close relation between Tibet and India. Because now we call it uh, China-India border, but it has been for uh, centuries and centuries uh, Tibet-India border. And they didn't, you didn't need to have uh, one division in, uh, or, uh, in Demchok or one battalion even. Uh, people were crossing the border. Yeah. People knew where was the border. Is not the, there was no question of LAC. LAC is a new, another invention of, of China also, which yeah. doesn't help India. So yeah. um, people were crossing the village of Demchok, they were in Ladakh, or going to Chak Tashigang in Tibet, they were in Tibet. And who cares for the ridge on the right or the ridge on the, on the left? Yeah. But now each every ridge has to be uh, fought for. Otherwise, it's taken by the other side. Yeah. So something, uh, India lost uh, so much. And I think that letter from Sadar Patel, which was drafted by uh, Sir Gerja Shankar Bashpai, who was the uh, Secretary General of the Ministry of External Affairs, and who was distributed to all, the, to Rajaji, to uh, President Rajatan Prasad, to KM Munchi, to all the leaders. And uh, that was an important letter because it shows that uh, some of many of the top leaders in India realized that India was losing a frontier, a peaceful frontier. So by losing Tibet, of course, Dalai Lama has lost this country. Tibetan are refugees now in India, but India lost so much also. It yeah. lost border. Yeah. And a border which was not uh, by and it was all the monks from Ladakh in 1962 when my book and uh, there was 400 monks from Ladakh. Yeah. And they managed to uh, take them out just before the war. But, uh, and they, they were free, they had no passport, no paper, no identity. They were just going because it was uh, for, like that for centuries. Same thing with yeah. town. What to do? So looking forward to your next book, uh, Ms. RP. And, um, Thank uh, thank you for this interview. Uh, looking forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Strat News Global. I'm Parul Chandra and with me today is Tenzin Dawa. 
Tenzin is a researcher with the Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy, which is based in Dharamsala in the state of Himachal Pradesh. Tenzin has been looking at uh, uh, the, the human rights violations in Tibet during her research with the center, and uh, she's here to talk about it with us on Strat News Global. Welcome to Strat News Global, Tenzin. Thank you. Thank you, Parul, for having me on your show. Uh, let me begin by asking you first, can you give us a brief overview of human rights violations by the Chinese authorities in Tibet? Right. So uh, ever since the invasion of Tibet by the Chinese government in 1959, you know, there have been the Chinese government have been actively implementing numerous uh, assimilationist and repressive policies in Tibet. And under these, you know, policies, Tibetans are specifically targeted for their very identity and culture. And thereby, it makes it very difficult for the Tibetan inside Tibet to live a life of dignity. And uh, over the past, you know, more than six decades, under the oppression of the Chinese government, you know, there is persistent political repression, uh, marginalization of economic, cultural assimilation, uh, environmental destruction, and social discriminations in Tibet. Now, you spoke about the culture and identity of Tibetans, which is under attack or which is being persecuted, persecuted by the Chinese in the, in, in the Tibet uh, autonomous region. Uh, how, how are they going about repressing Tibetans in this area? You know, uh, you know for many years, uh, the Chinese government has been, you know, uh, implementing these various uh, aggressive policies of, for example, you know, I give an example of the bilingual education policy in Tibet. So under this policy, what the Chinese government is basically doing is to uh, aggressively promote Mandarin language as the main medium of instruction in Tibetan schools. And in, uh, you know, that ma marginalizes the Tibetan language at the same time. So in 2019 alone, you know, we saw that uh, Chinese government has issued local directives in many uh, rural townships in the Tibet Autonomous Region, asking them to, uh, you know, switch to using Mandarin as the main medium of instructions. Now, this is, uh, we see this as a systematic approach from the side of the Chinese government to, you know, uh, forcibly estrange Tibetan children and Tibetan uh, Tibetans in the future to, you know, forcibly estrange them from the very survival of Tibetan culture and language. In the many years to come so and also at the same time you know nowadays we're seeing this trend of this uh, chinese government you know issuing a lot of local directives that, mm -hmm. that involves uh directing tibetan parents of children to you know uh hold them responsible for uh sending uh responsible res responsible for sending them to uh, attend religious festivals during the school children's uh, children's you know school uh, holidays, so as to uh, sort of uh, separate them from the Tibetan really identity and culture, which is deeply also uh, uh, you know and rooted in the Tibetan religion. You know, so mm -hmm. seeing the systematic approaches by the Chinese government uh, in many Tibetan areas. You mentioned uh, how they're trying to put curbs on uh, the observance of, say, Tibetan festivals, religious festivals. Uh, now, there are also reports of how the Chinese are trying to curtail um, uh, Tibet, the Tibetan religion mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the region. And in fact, there are reports of the sinicization of Tibetan Buddhism. Now, how are they going about this? Can you shed some light on this? Sure. So uh, this the sinicization of Tibetan Buddhism was, you know, this plan was formally approved at the 19th Standing Committee meeting of the Buddhist Association of China in July last year in Beijing. So under this plan, you know, it requires all Tibetan Buddhist practitioners to prioritize the uh, promotion and implementation of party policies on uh, religion in order to, you know, make religions Chinese. And so the sinicization of this Tibetan Buddhism is basically an effort from the side of the Chinese government to shape Tibetan Buddhism to uh, parties' dictates. So whatever the government says, Tibetan Buddhists, you know, have to obey to that. And uh, you know, this, uh, you know, is uh, the sinicization of this Buddhist 
uh, Buddhism includes uh, stricter control over monastic uh, recruitment uh, and setting up uh, patriotic education classes in Buddhist colleges and other institutions. And also, you know, this uh, sinicization not only targets the trappings of religious practice, but it, also, uh, it is also an intrusion of, into, you know, people's inner lives by a repressive government. So, uh, so at the same time, you know, uh, uh, these are uh, at the same time, you know, uh, under this campaign, they are sending a lot of uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist practitioners into political indoctrination campaigns. And these campaigns have intensified, especially under Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. and, uh, these campaigns are, you know, religiously blasphemous in nature and uh, inherently co uh, you know, coercive you know, where monks and nuns are punished for exercising their beliefs and for following their conscience, basically. And they have left no option but to denounce their spiritual leader, uh, including the Dalai Lama and other revered Tibetan Buddhist Lamas. So monks and nuns, I many Tibetans, uh, during these indoctrination campaigns have to, you know, denounce their uh, religious leaders. And uh, they are made to sing, you know, patriotic songs, you know, which basically states love the motherland and the party states and things like that. So these indoctrination campaigns are, you know, are carried out and conducted on a, you know, very mass scale in every village in Tibet. If I may ask a follow-up question to this, uh, these, uh, these are indoctrination campaigns, you said, right? Uh, now, are these on the lines of, say, the re-education re camps or the vocational training centers that the Chinese have in the Xinjiang province? And uh, uh, because they seem to be very coercive in nature, uh, you can ask, uh, say, the Tibetan monks and nuns to repeat the Communist Party slogans, etc. But what after that? I mean, do they really adhere to these kinds of this kind of brainwashing by the Chinese? Well, not really. They are, you know, basically imposed and coerced to send uh, to be into this indoctrination campaigns but if you really look into the uh, people of ethnic minorities specifically the tibetans and the Uyghurs, you know you see that it's impossible to you know quite impossible to change their beliefs and especially if you look into this uh, uh ethnic auto, uh, ethnic unity law that was passed yes. in, this year in may yes. this year, you know it's quite evident that chinese government has you know over the last uh, six, more than six decades, their occupation uh, during the occupation of Tibet, they have quite failed to, you know, win the hearts and minds of the Tibetan people, and hence, you know, they're having to implement these uh, regulations so as to, you know, really impose these sort of uh, regulations on the Tibetans and other ethnic minorities. So I don't think uh, they are really able to win, really win the hearts and minds of Tibetans, but. Uh, they are the Chinese government are you know trying their best uh, for many years uh, to sort of uh, coerce them into denouncing their religious and cultural beliefs. Uh, now, can you share with us some some thoughts on what are they doing to the monasteries in Tibet? So basically, uh, in the last many years, you know, we're seeing a complete uh, desecration of Tibetan monasteries in Tibet. You know. Specifically, if you look in the year 2016, the Chinese government had, you know, started demolishing one of the largest Buddhist institutes in Tibet, which is the Larungar, uh, where, you know, many Tibetan Buddhist practitioners and Buddhist practitioners across the world come there to practice religion and study Buddhist, Buddhism there. So in 2016, we see this whole demolition of all these monasteries and uh, monastic institutions at the institute. And, uh, you know, they, you know, the Chinese government, they claim that they are trying to better manage this institution. But at the same time, what they're doing is they're destroying the very root of, very root of the Tibetan uh, Buddhism center there. And, you know, they, thereby sending all these monks and nuns who are studying there to political indoctrination campaigns again, to denounce, mm -hmm. sort of denounce their beliefs, political beliefs and religious beliefs and all, all of that in, the, in this campaign. So, uh, you mentioned this uh, ethnic unity law that the Chinese have brought in this year and they started implementing it uh, from May 1st this year, in fact. Uh, what are they trying to do with this law? I've also read reports that they are also encouraging uh, Tibetans to marry the Han Chinese. Uh, are these such reports correct? 
Well, uh, this is not explicitly said in the law, but that's mm -hmm. one of the intentions, you know. So basically, uh, in, uh, and this is a really concerning issue for us because this regulation uh, gives the Chinese authority, the complete, uh, you know, Chinese government, the complete authority to enforce uh, a Chinese-centric way of life for Tibetans. And this will, you know, further exacerbate the already discriminatory treatment of Tibetans inside Tibet. Because, you know, under this regulation, you know, it requires equal participation of all non-Tibetan ethnic uh, groups at all levels, including at government levels, at school levels, at private companies, or even at religious centers, you know. So, at, uh, and, and many, and, uh, you know, under this regulation, many, as you said, you know, Han Chinese are being migrated to Tibet. Yes. And this will, you know, further decimate already uh, grim state of local culture there. So, yes. and if you really look at it, it's it's strange because you can't really force someone to adopt a culture. I mean, it's a way of life, right? So, yes. and Tibetans must be able to practice their own culture and identity on their own. So, yeah. Do you have any estimate of uh, the migration that is going on by the Han Chinese into TAR? Uh, I know it's very difficult to get any kind of information from uh, uh, Tibet, but do you have any kind of estimates, any numbers on 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 these on these migrations? Well, uh, you know, we don't really have statistics because. Yes. As First of all, information, getting information nowadays is very difficult and very challenging mm -hmm. as, as researchers, you know, specifically with all these bans on uh, communication apps like WeChat and all. So it's very difficult for us to ascertain this uh, reliable information and numbers from Tibet. And also at the same time, our government statistics are nothing to, nothing at all, are not at all, you know, reliable. So we don't really refer to these statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, now. Let me take you on to another topic and which is about arbitrary arrests and detentions of Tibetans, Tibetan activists, again, Tibetan monks and nuns. And uh, uh, when I heard you speak recently, you also mentioned the fact that uh, these, the people who are detained really have no access to any kind of legal help. And even if they do, the Chinese lawyers who take the risk of defending them in turn face, uh, uh, they, they, they in turn are targeted by the Chinese authorities. So can you share your thoughts on this with us? Sure. So, you know, uh, Tibetans inside Tibet are routinely persecuted to, you know, lengthy prison terms or for simply uh, keeping contacts with outsiders. Mm -hmm. It could be Tibetan living outside in exile, right? And, uh, and also sharing information on, on Tibet to outsiders. So they are persecuted uh, and convicted on, you know, very vague and overbroad charges of inciting separatism or leaking state secrets or endangering state uh, stability. So all of these very broad charges, you know, mm -hmm. Chinese government have no clear definition of what really constitutes as uh, something as illegal or something as separatist. So, you know, under these charges, once, you know, their Tibetans are arrested, uh, they are, you know, subjected to very long periods of detention, of incommunicado detention, for instance, because Tibetan, 75 percent of Tibetan detainees inside Tibet are their family members are not informed of their whereabouts, you know, and their incommunicado detention gets uh, expanded broadly because there is a lack of complete lack of institutional oversight in China, and uh, as you said, as I as you as you mentioned before, you know. Uh, it's very difficult to ensure a fair trial in uh, China, for instance, because Chinese, mm -hmm. China doesn't have an independent judiciary. The trials are just a formality and all the verdicts have already been decided. And Tibetan detainees, you know, they do not get a right to hire legal defense of their choice. And even mm -hmm. if they manage to find one, uh, the, the lawyers themselves are subjected to harassment, intimidations and threats, and even revocation of the lawyer's license. And, you know, uh, We've done interviews with several Chinese lawyers who have an experience of defending Tibetan cases. And they, you know, shared with us the challenges, the kind of challenges they face, you know, when dealing with Tibetan political detainees. They say that uh, de uh, dealing with the case of Tibetan political prisoners are usually looked at as a very sensitive uh, and are often politicized. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to ensure a fair trial. Tibetan detainees in the Chinese judiciary. 
Tenzin, uh, one question uh, again pertaining to the intense surveillance that Tibetans are put under in in Tibet. And this is about the grid system that the Chinese have enforced. What exactly is it? So, you know, the, uh, the Chinese authorities are using very uh, targeted surveillance tactics to violate the rights of freedom of expression and privacy of ordinary Tibetans or even journalists or bloggers inside Tibet or even human, right, human rights defenders in Tibet, you know. So there is a widespread use of surveillance tactics aimed at, you know, crushing down on any forms of dissent and silencing human rights informants in Tibet, both online and offline. So offline, like you mentioned, you know, we have the systematic obedience system campaigns like the grid management systems and mm -hmm. the village-based cargo systems. So under these systems, what, they, the, what the Chinese government is basically doing is that they're dividing Tibetan towns into, you know, grids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are, they've installed, they've stationed, you know, police checkpoints on all these neighborhoods. And the Chinese government have, you know, stationed, at the same time, they have stationed thousands of cadre members in these Tibetan areas to act as informants, you know, to act as informants, to monitor Tibetan life. And uh, thereby, you know, it leaves very difficult for Tibetans to freely express in such environment. And at the same time, you know, we, we, have, we have heard from many Tibetans inside Tibet that they're now losing trust upon each other, even in the neighborhoods. And therefore, they ha they're having to self-censor themselves. You know, so because if they speak something today, tomorrow, you know, someone might uh, inform the government authorities and they, then they get persecuted for just expressing that. So under all these systems, you know, Tibetans are living in a very uh, precarious situation inside Tibet. Now, you have said that uh, the international community should hold China to account on these laws and uh, ensure that it adheres to it. But how can the international community do this? Uh, so, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you know, China is a state party to numerous international human rights treaties and governance. Yes. You know, and they cannot just do whatever they wish on, uh, based on whatever and however they wish, you know. So, for instance, China has signed and ratified six core uh, international human rights treaties, including uh, the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Violence. We have the Convention Against Torture, mm -hmm. Convention Against the Child, and Enforced Disciplinary. So all these major conventions they have signed and ratified. And now, since they are a party to these conventions, you know, they have a, a legal obligation to uh, respect, protect, and fulfill these provisions under these treaties in good faith. So mm -hmm. therefore, you know, states as a member of the international community, you know, can look into international mechanisms that oversee the functioning of these conventions, including the committees of uh, elimination, committee on elimination of uh, racial discrimination, or committee on CEDAW, or committee on ACT, uh, uh, on CATS. So all these committees, you know, the states can look into it and make formal complaints of the Chinese disobeyance of these uh, conventions, right? So at the same time, you know, states can also adopt uh, consequential rights related sanctions like the US global mechanism uh, style sanctions, you know, which are specifically uh, designed to impose consequences uh, for rights violations, including visa bans and freeze of assets uh, for, you know, perpetrators of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So adopt similar uh, sanctions like this in their legislation. And at the same time, you know, states can also cumulatively exert pressure on China to allow, you know, independent fact-finding missions like Tibet. Because uh, for, um, for many decades, China has not allowed individual experts yes. of civil and political rights to visit Tibet and, you know, report information on the ground. You know, over the past years, Chinese, Chinese government have allowed economic experts, but not mm -hmm. civil and political experts. So states can, you know, uh, cumulatively exert pressure on China to allow these experts to to see the real situation there, you know, so as to and to debunk all these propaganda and government narratives as they always came to, you know, that Tibet is a happy life. There is economic development in place. So it's, whether it's really there or not, it's I think it's uh, it's incumbent upon all the states to you know pressure China. And lastly, you know, uh, states, you know. Uh, uh, states can also ensure that the uh, uh, that the you know that the uh, uh, sort of the operations, economic operations, are uh, are not in complicit with 
the uh, the human rights violations that the Chinese government is uh, carrying out in uh, Tibet and other ethnic minority areas. So all of these measures, you know, states as a member of international community can take and you know pressure China. You mentioned the international uh, treaties and obligations. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, you have the UN Human Rights Council, which mm -hmm. takes note of uh, human rights violations by various states, countries. Do you feel that the UNHRC has let the Tibetan people down? Um, you know, uh, over the last many years, you know, mm -hmm. there are various mechanisms under Human Rights Council that uh, sort of uh, brings forward specific cases of human rights violations, such as the independent experts and the special rapporteurs and the working yes. groups that uh, work under this Human Rights Council, right? So. Uh, as Tibetan human rights defendant, you know, we regularly submit uh, cases of Tibetan political prisoners, you know, deteriorating situation of human rights inside Tibet. They, uh, they are, you know, they are actually trying their best to exert pressure and communicate with China on these uh, human rights violations. But we see that, you know, the Chinese government since it enjoys a, you know, really uh, large economic clout in the UN itself. Yes, they are sort of trying to silence all of these voices in mm -hmm. the itself. So there's these challenges there, but we yeah. see the individual experts and the independent experts. They're trying their best to, you know, communicate with the Chinese government. Mm. On that note, uh, Tenzin, thank you so much for sharing uh, your views on uh, human rights violations in Tibet. It was a pleasure having you.